Understanding Financial Prosperity by David O. Oyedepo. Introduction. Let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Psalm 35 verse 27. This is good news. There is a source to which I want to introduce you to in this book. When you hit that source, you will stay refreshed the remaining days of your life. I am also going to show you the way to that source. The moment you can appreciate and apply yourself to that way, life will deliver to you its maximum benefits. Most killer diseases reside inside the body of their victims for a long time before they are discovered. Medical science tells us that cancer, for instance, can be inside of man for eight years without any symptoms. Suddenly, when it has gained absolute dominion inside the victim, it begins to afflict him. Friend, there is no stagnation without a reason. Whatever has been tying you down from enjoying the beauties of God in life, God is going to reveal it to you in in this book, your story must change this time around. Every tied down issue of your life, your family, your career, your business must be released by this encounter. Oh, I thank God for blessings. For God's ultimate is to make you a blessing. God wants to see you prosper. It gives him great pleasure. God is excited when you prosper. What an encounter this will be for you. One day, by such an encounter, God picked me out of my poverty and threw me into the realms of prosperity. This will be that one day for you. God will usher you into strange realms of kingdom prosperity, sorrow-free. Come with me as I take you into the secret house of wealth. Until you are able to lay hold on his commandments, you never become a commander. I make bold to say that I am a commander in the realm of wealth. I don't beg. I don't pray for money. I don't borrow. I only line up myself with his commandments and it just keeps flowing. Oh, it's so sweet. I want you to come to that point where you come online for heaven supplies in all areas of life so you can be a blessing to your generation. The encounter you're going to have in this book will bring you amazing testimonies too, such as I have. I want to provoke you to practical living. I'm not out to expound theories to you. John the Beloved said in the opening of his epistles, And our hands have handled of the word of life. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 1 verse 1 3 Friend, the things I have handled and touched, they are the things I will be sharing with you in this book. You have a very great future, an enviable one at that. All you need is to turn loose for Jesus. You are not down because things are down. You are down because you don't have the light you need to be up. They marveled at Jesus. Jesus, from whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Mark 6 verse 2. Mighty works answer to this wisdom. When you locate God's word on prosperity and you act on it, you're operating this wisdom in the realm of prosperity and mighty works of prosperity will be the result. It's not luck. It's not connection. It's not fortune. Isaiah 60 verse 1 says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come. Until your light comes, you can work and work and still won't shine. Job said, As I was in the days of my youth, when the secrets of God was upon my tabernacle, when the 
Almighty was yet with me when my children were about me, when I washed my steps with butter and the rock poured me out rivers of oil. Job 29 verse 4 to 6. The secrets of God is the maker of the saints. Job was saying here, the secrets of God made me. My understanding of the secrets of God is the reason for the way I'm shining. The secrets of God will make any man. I see God making you by his secrets that you will encounter in this book. The end time church is programmed to prosper exceedingly. But then we need the blessings of God to make the promise a reality. In Haggai 2 verse 6 to 8, God said, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while and i will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and i will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come and i will fill this house with glory say yet the lord of hosts the silver is mine and the gold is mine say yet the lord of hosts and in zechariah 1 verse 17 he makes us understand that my cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad God wants to prosper his kingdom through the prosperity of his people. In Matthew 24 verse 14, Jesus said, This gospel must be preached in all the nations and then shall the end come. So, if we're the generation that will preach the gospel to all nations, then we are the prosperous generation I'm talking about. Please understand that we are out on a celebration lane. God said, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. 3 John 2 Friend, Jesus is out looking for who to pick may he find you worthy the end time church is a prosperous church so it's important for you to understand how to prosper in the kingdom and how to enjoy true prosperity it's not god just give me something to eat and to drink no, he wants to make you a blessing and all the people of the earth shall see it. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body and in the fruit of thy cattle and in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers to give thee. Deuteronomy 28 verse 11. Aren't you excited about that? Now, I like this. Deuteronomy 28 verse 12 to 13. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thy hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. So God's commandments make you a commander. God is going to raise commanders of such terrific wealth in the body of Christ. They are people who will change the destinies of multitudes. All you need to do is to position yourself by laying hold on the covenant secrets he will be unveiling to you in this book and things will begin to blossom in your life. Plenty is our heritage. I'd like your heart to be open. I will be teaching you the fear of God, the things I've heard, the things I've seen, Thin, and the things that my hands have handled of the word of life. God takes pleasure in your plenty. No father is happy to see his children in lack. Why then do you think that your lack excites God? 
Which father is excited to see his children begging all around? Have you ever heard somebody give a testimony saying, I thank God two of my sons are beggars? Your children's children will never beg. I want you to know that the prosperity God has planned for you has nothing to do with your profession, career, or your family background. No, it says, If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, whether you are a carpenter, a firewood seller, water seller, a medical doctor, lawyer or engineer is irrelevant your covenant alignment is the issue i have no business set up anywhere in this world i'm not selling anything but i can't be poor i announced 22 years ago i cannot be poor because i encountered the truth that liberates from poverty this is your chance too I would like you to understand this. God's word is your access into the world of wealth. An encounter with the word is what makes you a commander in the realm of wealth. I curse every hold of poverty on your life. In the precious name of Jesus, there is no shortcut. It is the entrance of the word that gives light and gives understanding to the simple. Psalm 119 verse 130. There is nothing called luck or fortune in the kingdom. Light is what makes the difference between the winning Christian and the losing one, between the poor Christian and the wealthy one. The difference is light. Otherwise, we have a common destiny. Romans 8 verse 29 to 30. You will encounter that light light in this book. I have since entered into the realm of tens of millions in my giving to the kingdom by reason of heaven's downpour. It's not luck, it's light. I want the same heavens to open for you. All you need to do is come and take what he has given me so you can see what I am seeing. I have not traded in any other thing since he called me and I have never begged never appealed to anywhere or anyone for aid and yet have never been helpless at any time this is your hour it's not luck don't sit down in your corner and be wondering i wish i were as lucky psalm 111 verse 10 says the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom a good understanding have all they that do his commandments his praise endureth forever can you see that a good understanding the word of god tells us that good understanding giveth favor but the way of transgressors is hard proverbs 13 verse 15 friend good understanding commands blessings Every blessing of God is transmitted through sound understanding. When you grasp it, it becomes yours. God said to Abraham, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest. To thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever genesis 13 verse 14 to 15 the word of god also talks about the eyes of your understanding being enlightened in ephesians 1 verse 18 so the more you understand the better you live it is your level of understanding that determines your level of possession. I see God giving you a very unique encounter in this book. May I say this, friend? I am not a preacher of prosperity. I am a prophet. God spoke specifically to me while I was away in America for a meeting. Get down home and make my people rich. 
That is why the things I teach are not the regular prosperity preacher's syllabus. They are divine impartations to make you a celebrity on the earth. Why? I am sent. Prosperity is one of the 12 pillar messages of this commission. So I would like your heart to be open and get set to line up yourself with the things I will be sharing in this book. This is the time you will have have your own lifetime encounter as I had it 22 years ago reading a book like this. I have seen God in the realm of prosperity since then. That's why he has sent me to go and turn the destinies of men around. I am sent not only to teach it but to effect it so that when you hear what God is saying through me and you apply yourself to it, there is no way you won't be free because by our prophet the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt and by our prophet was he preserved. God is set to see your destiny preserved. Now listen to me. Between being the lender and being the borrower, which do you want? Between begging and giving, which do you want? The Bible says your heavenly father knows that you need these things. Matthew 6 verse 32. So for you to say or pretend you don't need what God says you need is to be a hypocrite. Our opening scripture says, let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yeah, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which have pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Psalm 35 verse 26. Joshua 1 verse 8 establishes the fact that each man's prosperity is made by him. It says, you shall make your way prosperous and you shall have good success. Say with me, teach me Lord how to make it this time around. It is my prayer that God will, by this book, give you a lifetime encounter with his word of prosperity. The word of God is a covenant platform for prosperity. God will take you to the very fundamentals of his plan and purpose for your life and for the church in general. Two years ago, John Austin was led by the Spirit of God and he started a teaching session on prosperity in his church and poverty was swallowed up in victory in that assembly. God's people flourished the kingdom of God progressed and amazing things happened. The same will happen for you too. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for your sakes he became poor that ye through his poverty might be rich. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 I am redeemed to be enriched so I will be an abuse to redeem redemption if I don't actualize that dimension of my redemption. Jesus came down to lift me up. When he came down, we were raised up, not pressed down. We were raised up together with him and made to sit together with him in heavenly places. High flyers, that's what redemption makes of saints. That should enter your spirit man. I'd like you to say and believe this. I am saved to display his wealth. I am on the right side. I am not a goat. So wealth is my heritage. Abundance is my birthright. Friend, you are saved to display his wealth on the earth. To clothe the naked, feed the hungry, and attend to the sick. That's what you're sent to do. Matthew 25 verse 34 to 40. It's time you knew you're not here on earth as a beggar. It's time you know 
that God can't tell you to feed the hungry if he hasn't ensured that there's food in your house. He won't tell you to clothe the naked. If you're naked, you are sent to minister to the needy. You're not a needy. Poverty mentality is satanic slavery. Be free from it. Prosperity does not create enmity with God. Abraham was a super prosperous man, yet the Bible described him as the friend of God. James 2 verse 23. It is the secrets of God that make stars in the kingdom. May God provide you a supernatural access into his secrets concerning kingdom prosperity in Jesus name. Prosperity is our identity. If you don't demonstrate it, then you are a misfit in the kingdom. Prosperity is not the availability of cash, but encounter with the light. From now on, money will respect you. Get set as we take an adventure into the realms of plenty. I am going to be taking you through a fourth part teaching on prosperity. The foundation for prosperity why God prospers, a covenant platform for prosperity, and how God prospers. When you have a grasp of the word of prosperity, you just prosper. You live in a state of no lack. A state of no lack is what is called prosperity. It is not a state of cash. It's a state of light. When money is in your hand and it is not enough, it is because the light in you is not enough. May you encounter that light in Jesus name. It's time to get on the line with God. You're not in a game. You are in a covenant. An understanding of that covenant makes the difference. This day will mark the breaking forth of heaven's light and favor in your life. May you experience the touch of God in a new way. Supernatural supplies is a reality. I'd like you to appreciate this fact. The Bible is full of proofs establishing this. Prosperity is not just having money. It's a state of well-being which you enter into through the covenant of abundance. You will find it. God will give you a supernatural escape from every discomfort of life life in Jesus name. So come with me as I take you through this outstanding teaching packaged and delivered for your flourishing. I have enough proofs to make you listen to me. This is the hour of your prosperity. Your struggle must end this day. This is going to be the most explosive and most fulfilling time of your life. God sent me to enrich his people, not by tricks, but by truth. I'd like you to make this confession. This is my hour of prosperity. The way to it is the word of God. I am set for the word of God. I am set for encounters in the word of God. I am not going to live my life as a beggar. I am going to be a blessing to my generation. I am not going to be an abuse to creation. Lord, I'm ready. I'm not looking anywhere anywhere else, not even to myself. I'm looking off to you. Help me, Lord, in Jesus' name. I see the mighty hand of God picking and making a mighty man or woman out of you. It shall be so for you in the precious name of Jesus. Part 1 Foundation for Prosperity Chapter 1 Covenant Dimension of Prosperity But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get well, that he may establish his covenant which he swore unto thy fathers as it is this day. Deuteronomy 8 verse 18 Prosperity in the kingdom doesn't answer to fasting, nor does it answer to prayer or prayer of agreement. It only 
only answers to your understanding and practice of covenant details. What you are selling or the business you're involved in is not what determines your prosperity. No, it is the light under which you are operating that determines the results you get. Let's stop wishing. Let's step out and walk in the light. It is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant. The power for wealth is released on the platform of the covenant. When you step into the covenant, you encounter the power to get wealth. That was one thing I saw that brought me out of poverty into the abundance that I now enjoy in God. Prosperity is not a promise you claim in prayers or with fastings and confessions. No, it is a covenant you practice. That means God has set a stake. Understand your part of it and then the power to realize the promise will be delivered to you. Now, if you look at Hebrews 9, the Bible talks about the holiest of all where we have the tables of the covenant. Among the tables of the covenant is the covenant of prosperity, the one that brings you into an encounter with the power to get wealth. A covenant, as it were, is like a contract, so it involves two or more people. In this case, it involves just you and God. God is the covenantor, and you are the covenantee. You are the beneficiary of the deal. All you need then is a good understanding of what the covenant entails, and you will be up in abundance. Look at Psalm 89 verse 34. That will help you to establish your confidence in the covenant. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. God is a covenant keeper. His side of every covenant is forever secured. It is our side that is variable. But when we lay hold on the terms that relate to us and apply ourselves to them, God is committed. Once you locate the covenant and you enter into it, your struggles all come to an end. Since that day in March 1981, when I saw the covenant of prosperity, I entered into my rest. You don't pray or fast for a covenant. You just enter into it. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. And the Lord gave them rest round about. Second Chronicles 15 verse 12, 15. They didn't cry into the covenant. They entered into it. People enter into it. You sign in for it. You don't confess it. If you care to sign in for the covenant, your Christianity will take on brighter colors because the power to get wealth is released on the platform of the covenant of prosperity. You need this understanding. Let me tell you what triggered off in my spirit and brought me to the point where I shouted. I found it! It's Jeremiah 33 verse 20 to 21. Thus saith the Lord, If ye break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. Friend, God's covenant with us is as eternal as the day and the night. Until you can stop the day and the night, you can't stop the covenant. God is saying, therefore, that as long as human life exists on this earth, his covenant with us is intact. Also, verses 25 to 26 tells us, Thus saith the Lord, If my covenant be not with the day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth. Then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will cause their captivity to return and have mercy on them. God is committed to cause our prosperity to return and to have mercy on us by the immutability of 
his covenant. Let's get set, therefore, and discover what that covenant is. And when we enter into it, our case is settled. His covenant, which he swore unto thy fathers. What did God say to Noah? While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, and summer and the winter, and day and night shall not cease. Genesis 8 verse 22. It is also important to know this. His covenant, which he swore unto thy fathers, as it is this day. Deuteronomy 8 verse 18. It is a present tense covenant. It works for every generation. So it is working presently in our generation now. It will work for you. People have spent so much time in prayer and fasting for increase. No, it doesn't answer to all that. Can you imagine somebody who has a farm and he goes there and lifts up his hand and prays prevailing prayers after which he goes home to announce to his wife we have the heaviest yam harvest coming this harvest season that's a loser's mentality because yam won't come out of that ground until it has gone into the earth harvest only answers to seed time the covenant will always prevail when god told abraham get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that i will show thee and i will make of thee a great nation and i will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing genesis 12 verse 1 2 he moved as he was commanded yet he met famine there and abram journeyed going on till toward the south and there was a famine in the land and abram went down into egypt to sojourn there for the famine was grievous in the land genesis 12 verse 9 to 10 but in spite of that famine abraham prevailed and abraham was very rich in cattle in silver and in gold genesis 13 verse 2 the bible also records that isaac prevailed in famine and there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of abraham and isaac went unto abimelech king of the philistines unto gera then isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold and the lord blessed him genesis 26 verse 1 12 friend the covenant is stronger than any climate in spite of the famine god blessed isaac and the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great for he had possession of locks and possession of herds and great star of servants and the philistines envied him genesis 12 verse 13 to 14 there is no economic dirt or crisis that can break the efficacy of the covenant Abraham prevailed. Isaac prevailed because in all labor there is profit. Whether in famine or in the absence of famine, in season or out of season, every giver provokes divine blessings. When he works, he takes delivery of those blessings. In Jacob's time also, and the famine was saw in the land. Genesis 43 verse 1. But in spite of this, Jacob still had more than enough in verse 12 he told his sons and take double money in your hand in verse 11 he sent presents with his sons to the man from whom they bought food take of the best fruits in the land in your vessels and carry down the man a present a little balm and a little honey spices and myrrh nuts and almonds all this was in the midst of saw famine jacob still had access to double money and could afford to import food from a foreign country so famine is not your problem ignorance of the covenant is your problem god said in hosea 4 verse 6 my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge not for famine nor for economic crisis or money failure he said because thou has rejected knowledge i will also reject thee if famine could not 
stop our covenant fathers famine can't stop us the economy of your nation has no bearing on your covenant work they are two separate laws the law of the spirit of life under which we operate is always able to cheaply handle the law of sin and death romans 8 verse 2 natural laws are subject to spiritual laws for whatever is from above is above all so when we walk after the spirit we dominate the law of sin and death it is not law it is light and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world john 1 verse 5 9 so when men shall say there is a casting down because you are walking in the light then you shall say there is a lifting up job 22 verse 29 many christians are in the natural environment where they find themselves because they lack the required light to dominate that environment isaiah 60 verse 1 to 3 says arise shine for thy light is come and the glory of the lord is risen upon thee for behold the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people but the law shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee and the gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising it goes on all the way to verse 20 to paint a picture of the efficacy of light the dominion of light over darkness so you're not down because things are down you are down because you don't have the light to be up the covenant will produce anywhere, anytime, any day. God's word says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Acts 10 verse 34 there is no place on earth for instance where there are no lenders and borrowers yet they all live in the same environment now where did the lenders get his excess from from the same land that the borrower can't see they all live in the same place yet one is up and the other is down who is to blame you will never be down in your life stop looking at the shadows there is no substance in it the Bible Bible says God controls all things by the word of his power, not by the edicts or policies of the governments of your nation. You will never lose control anymore in your life. Look at Psalm 37 verse 18. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. Because they are doing things right, in the days of famine they shall be satisfied for the upright right things never go wrong if you will be upright in the covenant things will keep on being right for you no matter what's going on where you are for it is the blessings of god that make it rich and adds no sorrow with it proverbs 10 verse 22 my hope is not in the budget of my country my hope is not in the national economy nor in the global economy my hope is built on nothing else for jesus christ and his precious blood for to him that is joined to all the living there is hope for a living dog is better than a dead lion ecclesiastes 9 verse 4 friend look up i will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help psalm 121 verse 1 look up stop looking around at the physical give us help from trouble for vain is the help of man psalm 60 verse 11 look up every environment is conducive for the covenant please understand this fact those who look around don't go far those who look up are the ones that go up i see help coming down for you now i want you to know that there is no condition that can make the covenant of no effect that should reinforce your confidence you can stake your life
life on the covenant. As long as day and night are exchanging positions, the covenant is still in force. God said, And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Isaiah 60 verse 3. The world has had its turn. It's now our turn. Government has changed hands. It's now our turn. The covenant is taking over. No matter how wicked the wicked are, there's a very clear line of demarcation recorded in the Bible that will excite you. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. And when money filled in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For money filleth. Genesis 47 verse 13, 15. Every time money fills, the covenant prevails. When that year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. My Lord also has a herd of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our lands. Genesis 47 verse 18. It was a national crisis. Yet in the midst of all that, see verse 27. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein, and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Oh, what a paradox. The covenant is simply powerful. Some fellows were offering themselves for sale, and in the same land, some others were multiplying exceedingly. Friend, the covenant provides the strongest covering in the midst of crisis. That's why covenant keepers are great winners. While the famine prevailed over the Egyptians, the covenant prevailed for the covenant people. I have been announcing for a long time now that, that there is coming a conversion of the wealth of the Gentiles to the covenant keeping saints of God. It's on already. The smartness of the Egyptians could not handle the famine, but the covenant was able to handle it without sweat. Let me say this to you. Not everyone is suffering. I'm not. Not everyone is giving bribe. I have never given any. Not everyone is using connections. I have only one connection and it's upward. Upward only. Covenant. That's what makes cheap stars in the world. Just stay under it. It may be slow, but it's sure. I would rather go for what is slow and sure than for what is fast and has no future. Oh yes. Say with me, Lord, help me to stand strong under your covenant covering all the days of my life. Hear this, Africans, Europeans, Americans, or whoever may be offering themselves for sale, but under the covenant, I will always prevail. Every condition is conducive for the covenant. I am saying this so you can possess a tireless spirit and a tireless approach to what the Lord is is taking us into. Oh, it's amazing. Many have escaped to Europe or America because things are hard at home, only to become slaves there just for money. There is no nation on the earth where there is no poverty, and there is no nation on the earth where there is no wealth. There is no nation on the earth where there are no wealthy people, and at the same time, homeless people. Brace up, friend, if it won't work for you where you are, it may never work for you anywhere else. Raise up. I see a new day for you. Yes, God can send you to any nation of the earth. Why not? He's the Lord of all the earth. For there is no escape in any nation. Without a covenant covering, you remain a victim wherever you go. The covenant is it. Say to him, Lord, help me to stand strong under this covenant covering as a lifestyle. Help me to give to it all of the time the things it demands of me. If you're a giver and a thinker worker, i.e. a creative worker, things must always work for you. You will be satisfied in famine. Friend, I would like you to embrace.
embrace and appreciate the validity and infallibility of the covenant. If God can't break the covenant, let no man attempt to break it. If his covenant is tied to day and night, it is foolishness for anyone to attempt to break it. I see the covenant prevail for you in your time. May everything that is against you bow to the power of this covenant. Enter thou into the joy of thy God in Jesus' precious name. Chapter 2 Consecration Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruits of their doings. Isaiah 3 verse 10 God, without any doubt, is taking us somewhere to a place of honor, a place of glory, and a place of beauty. We will surely get there. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. Psalm 102 verse 16 What is this saying? That is God will come when Zion has taken her full and rightful position. Jesus will be here after Zion has fully taken her position in destiny. After she has taken over the earth according to God's word, then all nations shall flow unto her. Isaiah 2 verse 2. That, of course, is talking about the church. God is preparing for that ultimate so that the sons of God will take over the affairs of life on this earth. You won't miss your place in it. Every plan of God has a foundation. If you don't understand the foundation, you will suffer frustration. That's what Psalm 11 verse 3 makes us understand. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So, every plan and purpose of God has its foundation. And as we embark on this adventure into the realms of kingdom prosperity, it is necessary for for us to properly examine the foundation for the Jesus kind of prosperity. So we won't be building on sand. See what 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19 tells us. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standard sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We need to understand that every provision of God for man has this as its foundation depart from iniquity. I'm going to show you a few more things from the scriptures that will help you to appreciate this fact so that the subsequent teachings can produce for you. Many people have the teachings but they don't have the results. Why? The foundation is not in place. Many are operating the principles but lack the foundation. So, the principles appear untrue. Their foundation is faulty. Let me quickly say this. The word of God provides a four-dimensional ministry to us. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Second Timothy 3 verse 16. If it is out of place, the principles will not work adjustments will not produce either but when the foundation is in place every other thing keeps working the foundation is crucial to every structure so as we proceed to build a strong lasting prosperity structure in this book we need a good understanding of the foundation the mother of poverty and the lord god called unto adam and said unto him where art thou and he said i heard thy voice in the garden and i was afraid because i was naked and i hid myself genesis 3 verse 9 to 10 man was put in the garden and the lord god took man and put him into the garden of eden to dress it and to keep it and the lord god commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it for in the day that thou eatest therefore thou shalt surely die Genesis 2 verse 15 to 17 but he messed up and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was 
pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise she took of the fruits thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat and the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sealed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons genesis 3 verse 6 to 7 the immediate effect of man's fall was nakedness he was stripped of honor and dignity as a result of sin so sin is the mother of poverty sin stripped adam naked adam lost his beauty to sin poverty arrived upon man right there in eden at the invitation of sin therefore the lord god sent him forth from the garden of eden to till the ground from whence he was taken so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life genesis 3 verse 23 to 24 this is where all of man's struggle began god sent man out of plenty into lack he drove him out of comfort into the wilderness of want sin sent man out of plenty into lack sin sent man out of the garden into the wilderness the foundation of human depravity is sin it wasn't the serpent that sent adam out of the garden it was sin it wasn't the fruit the fruit had always been there it was sin as long as sin remains poverty won't go give up sin nevertheless the foundation of god standeth sure having this seal the lord knoweth them that are his and let every one that nameth the name of christ depart from iniquity second timothy 2 verse 19 until you step out of sin you cannot step into plenty this is the sure foundation for every kingdom benefit it hasn't changed and it will never change because god never changes kingdom prosperity answers to iniquity free candidates if thou return to the almighty thou shalt be built up thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacle then shalt thou lay up gold as dust and the gold of offering as the stones of the brooks job 22 verse 23 to 24 when you return to the almighty and separate yourself from sin then you'll become a candidate for prosperity the law begins to deliver and produce for you in malachi 3 verse 10 god commands us to give so that the windows of heaven can open for us but before then verse 3 and 4 tells us and he shall see it as a refiner and purifier of silver and he shall purify the sons of levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the lord an offering in righteousness then shall the offering of judah and jerusalem be pleasant unto the lord as in the days of old and as in former years only when he has purged you can you then give offerings in righteousness then and only then will he accept it the foundation has not changed departure from evil is a demand it is what grants you access to prosperity if you have not departed you won't see god's prosperity no matter what method you use iniquity is the cheapest way to block your heavens until you step out of iniquity you don't step into prosperity the secrets of god are not for the general public and he said unto them unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of god but unto them that are without all these things are done in parables mark 4 verse 11 if you enjoy sin you can never come in touch with god's secrets if sin has become your lifestyle you are without you can't have access to his secrets for his secrets are with those who fear him 
Psalm 25 verse 14. There are two levels of people that are without. Number one is the unbeliever. Nothing you say about God matters to him because he is a dog and is without. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to him. For the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14. There's yet another class of people without. This is the believer who has no understanding of the things he is doing. The sort of person, for example, when he is giving, it is so that his church can prosper. Well, if you want us to contribute, let's contribute. If he is making contributions, he is not giving. He doesn't understand anything about giving. He is suffering from both mental and spiritual blindness because he is born again but yet wallowing in sin. Revelations 22 verse 15 tells us, For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. For without are dogs. If you join that to Mark 4 verse 11, you will find out that to be without means to be a dog. Who are dogs? For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it is happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the soul that was washed to her wallowing in the mirth. Second Peter 2 verse 20, 22. From this we see that dogs refer to those believers who having been cleansed return again to sin friend the secrets of god that make for kingdom prosperity are for the righteous you must therefore endeavor to make yourself pure so you can enjoy the blessings of god's plan to prosper and bless your life what man is he that feareth the lord him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose psalm 25 verse 12 who will god teach the man who fears him that was what qualified job for god's secret and which made him the greatest man in the east he was described as perfect and upright and one that feared god and received evil job 1 verse 1 the secret of the lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant psalm 25 verse 14 who will god show his covenant those that fear him not those who just go to church so the fear of god is what qualifies you for access into the secrets of god which guarantees triumph in all areas of life the secrets of god which job had access to accounted for his shining he said i washed my step with butter and the rock Poured me out rivers of oil. Job 29 verse 6. You need to eschew evil. You need to enjoy holiness. You need to love righteousness. You need to hate wickedness. Then will he show you his secrets. God's secrets are not free. They are limited to those who love righteousness. That's why everywhere you see wealth or prosperity in the kingdom, you discover that it is tied to righteousness. Why? Because the secrets that will lead you into that realm of pleasure, that realm of accomplishment, come only by practical righteousness. In Proverbs 1 verse 7, we have this powerful word from heaven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. For fools despise wisdom and 
and instruction. The fear of the Lord is what gives you access to the revelations of God. Say, help me, Lord. God's foundation has not changed. Until you step out of iniquity, you don't step into plenty. Look at this testimony that came from Burkina Faso. When I came to the seminar last month and heard the man of God say that God can turn our lives around if we are to read the book Breaking Financial Hardship by Bishop Oyedeko, I took it as a challenge. Even though I have very little understanding of English language, yet I believe the Holy Spirit will teach me the truth in the book. So I read the book in the Holy Ghost, so to say. Suddenly, things began to happen in my life. For almost three years, I had been trying to sell some caterpillar parts I brought from France, but could not get buyers, and they were becoming rusty. As I was reading this book, I got to page 109, where the bishop was talking about compromising your integrity, and I began to receive fast understanding of my problem selling those parts. Not only this, I got to page 112, and the bishop said, said right dealings do not reduce men's height he promotes and sustains it referring to luke 16 verse 10 to 11 i could not go any further i was grounded in these truths and immediately i realized my past dirty dealings in business i went on my knees and asked god to forgive me and vowed to avoid ungodly dealings in my business few days later i received a call from one of my friends who told me that he has seen a man looking for caterpillar parts. I supplied these parts and even made double gain on them. God is indeed faithful. I give him all the praise and glory for the inspiration given to the bishop in writing this book. Kauda Musa Burkina Faso. This man discovered his problem from the word. He responded on the spot and came on curse with God. And every curse of his life was lifted. Psalm 1 verse 1 to 3 has this to say. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not be and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Why? He has given up on sin. He has turned his back on iniquity. Now he is face to face with plenty. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. God sent man out of the garden because man sinned against him until the sin question is solved. Plenty is not in view. Jesus knew no sin, so he knew no lack. The Bible calls him the second Adam. He lived in Eden while he was here on earth in the realm of no lack and want. Because he knew no sin, he was not permitted to no lack. No one shines in the kingdom with sin. Sin stinks. Sin is a reproach to any people. There are two kinds of pleasures in the scriptures. The pleasure of sin and godly pleasure. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Hebrews 11 verse 24 to 25. The pleasure of sin is always for a season, but there is also goodly pleasure. Thou wilt surely mean the path of life 
in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16 verse 11. One is for a season, the other is forevermore. The pleasure of sin is for a season, but godly pleasure is forevermore. It transcends the temporal life into eternity. That's why we have durable riches and righteousness. Proverbs 8 verse 18. Whatsoever the Lord doeth, it shall be forever. As long as you are in your place, God will never shift his ground. Pleasures forevermore and pleasures for a season. The choice is yours. I want you to look at any pleasure that sin brings and say, I know you are temporal. I am not going for you. I have chosen eternal pleasures. Friend, detest any pleasure of sin, for sin stinks. Get back to Eden. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Then shalt thou lay up gold as dust, and the gold of offer as the stones of the brooks. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. Job 22 verse 23 to 25. Disobedience took man out of Eden. Only obedience can get him back there. The foundation of human depravity is sin. The escape therefore is righteousness. Each man now has to decide whether he wants to stay on in the wilderness of nakedness, penury, lack, and want or whether he wants to get back to Eden, the city of plenty where God's favor flows freely. Positive responses to every word of God is a prelude to a return to Eden. Now, note that every blessing begins with your return home. The father couldn't reach the prodigal son outside until he returned home. Likewise, your prosperity is at home and until you're back home poverty remains your lot until you're saved you're not safe your prosperity begins with your salvation beloved i wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth 3 john 2 until you're saved what you have is a dead soul do you carry gifts to the graveyard for a dead man no matter how much you loved a dead relation do you take food and gifts to him or her in the graveyard let's look at some prophetic scriptures that points us to the way back to eden redemption makes you and i citizens of eden but unfortunately many like esau have sold their birthrights for the lord shall comfort zion he will comfort all her waste places and he would make her wilderness like them and her desert like the garden of the lord joy and gladness shall be found therein thanksgiving and the voice of melody isaiah 51 verse 3 god is saying here hearken unto me all you who follow after righteousness i am taking you back to eden see what i did with abraham i am taking you back to eden that's why i am cleaning you up you are the seed of the second adam it is your heritage to be back in eden follow after righteousness you will soon arrive there the place of no lack the place of no want. I see you walking back to Eden with dignity. You will not know the meaning of lack anymore in your life. Eden is your destination and you're getting there. Henceforth, God's presence will make the difference in your career, your business, your home, your body, and your mind in Jesus' name. As righteousness increases, favor increases to march. For if God be for us, who can be against us? I see that favor of God exploding forth on your life. In Asa, we were told in Second Chronicles 15, catch the covenant for 20 years. For when he shifted his ground, it was wilderness all over again for him. Say with me, Lord, 
keep my feet in your house. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Psalm 92 verse 12 to 15. I command God's blessings in your coming in and your going out. I command blessings over your storehouse and your baskets. I command the rain of heaven over the works of your hands in Jesus' precious name. Purity begets plenty. Righteousness exalted a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 14 verse 24. Remember we're examining the fundamental for God's kind of prosperity. It has its roots in integrity. Kingdom purity is what gives birth to kingdom plenty. Note that lack and want are not holiness. We have been told that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and wisdom is the mother of wealth. Proverbs 3 verse 13 to 16. It is God's wisdom that begets kingdom wealth. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So your access to kingdom wealth begins with the fear of God. Consecration is your first step into kingdom colors. God will give your life color when you consecrate it to him. Joseph said, I fear God. And we saw that even in prison he prospered because he was on the right frequency. Job too was a man that feared God, a perfect man, and he became the greatest man all the best. Crookedness never earns anyone a future wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished for he that gathereth by labor shall increase proverbs 13 verse 11 god prospers those who follow after righteousness in isaiah 3 verse 10 he said say to the righteous it shall be well with him a man i admire a lot in ministry is billy graham he probably has never preached any message on prosperity but he lives it god prospers his people when they follow after righteousness billy graham lives on a 126 acre land friend you are saved and you walk in righteousness if you carry god on your inside the world must take notice of you righteousness is not synonymous with suffering no righteousness is profitable it is the will of god that we live the edenic life here on earth eden is a place of fulfillment abundance rest and luxury if pleasure is your choice therefore his presence must be your goal for in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore thus saith the lord God, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the wastes shall be built. Ezekiel 36 verse 33. There is a place of no want, a place of no lack, but access there becomes possible only after God has cleansed you from all your iniquity. Then will he rescue you from the wilderness where you have been banished to and bring you back to the garden of comfort. People had thought that seed planting equals automatic prosperity. No, it's your walk with God. God prospered Abraham. Yes, but he told him, walk before me and be thou perfect. Genesis 17 verse one friend the covenant is not a game it is a walk enoch walked with god and was not because god took him before he was translated had this testimony that he pleased god genesis 5 verse 24 hebrews 11 verse 5 god took him so he did not see death so will god take you that you will not see lack 
there's a place of no lack on this earth. When you become iniquity free, you will enjoy plenty from God. Let's open up. When you are tired of purity, you are tired of plenty. Let's open up. It's a lifetime adventure. If you must live in Eden, you must live free of iniquity. Practice holiness, but refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. First Timothy four verse seven. I call godliness godlikeness. God's predominant nature is holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Revelations 4 verse 8. So there is no God-likeness without the practice of holiness. He said, exercise yourself. So it's a thing you walk out. It's not a thing you keep waiting for. You walk it out by yourself. Now let's see what happens when you exercise yourself unto godliness. For bodily exercise profited little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that is now is, and of that which is to come, meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. First Timothy 4 verse 8 15 Godliness is profitable unto all things, not only heavenly things. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Godliness gets you back to Eden to give you access to the grapes of life. It gives you a taste of God's original plan for man before taking you off to heaven to enjoy eternity with God. Now look at the breakdown. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. First Timothy 4 verse 12. That is godliness. That means be an example of the believer in your utterance and in your conduct, in the conduct of your business, the way you conduct yourself in your career. Be an example of the believer in spirit, in faith, and in purity. That is godliness. So it shows in what you say in your conduct and in your exhibition of love. It shows in all areas of life, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Godliness is profitable unto all things. So purity has earthly values. True prosperity follows your restoration back to Eden. It's not just money. No, it affords you things money cannot buy. You need to take definite steps towards your return back to Eden. That is a place of no lack on this earth. And it is only guaranteed when you live a sin free life. God is saying, if I chased man out of Eden because of sin, no man will live in Eden while in sin. Only righteousness qualifies any man to be back in Eden. Until you are set for righteousness, Eden is not in view for you. First Timothy 6 verse 6, 11 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. But thou, O man of God, leave these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Great gain means great prosperity. Follow after righteousness. Follow after godliness. Follow after faith, love, patience, and the meekness. And you shall inherit the earth. Follow after all these things. And you will enjoy plenty beyond what anybody can lay hold on with struggles and efforts. Purity begets plenty. Iniquity begets penury. Financial iniquity begets financial scarcity. Luke 16 verse 11. If you are not financially straight, you will die in wretchedness. 
So awake unto righteousness. Stop playing games and cheating people. It takes financial sanity to enjoy financial plenty. It takes financial integrity to enjoy financial plenty. Say with me, Lord, help me to live straight. Look at this poem I wrote. Nothing beautifies like holiness. In the beauty of holiness, in the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Psalm 110 verse 3. Nothing dignifies like integrity. The integrity of the offering shall preserve him. Proverbs 11 verse 3. Nothing uplifts like uprightness. His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Psalm 112 verse 2. Nothing causes to flourish like righteousness. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall go up like the cedar in Lebanon. Psalm 92 verse 12. Nothing is as colorful as consecration. The foundation of God standeth sure. If any purges himself of these things, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Second Timothy 2 verse 19 to 21. Nothing prospers like purity. It is satanic oppression to think purity equals poverty. The purest place in the whole universe is also the wealthiest place, heaven. Heaven is the purest place in all of creation. The streets in heaven are paved with gold, so purity will never be equal to poverty. Nor will poverty ever be a proof of purity. As a matter of fact, Poverty is a proof of unrighteousness. The day man sinned, God took off his clothes. Remember? Sin strips naked. Holiness makes beautiful. Not for fools. The Bible says, The prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Proverbs 1 verse 32. Who is a fool? Fools make a mock at sin. But among the righteous there is favor. Proverbs 14 verse 9. Fools mock sin. It doesn't matter, they say. Since God knows that prosperity will destroy them, so he doesn't allow them to move near it. He keeps it from them. Fools in the kingdom don't prosper. We have seen that fools are those who make a mockery at sin, those whose sin doesn't move, and those who are comfortable with it. But the righteous shall flourish. They shall enter into the realm of true prosperity. It is cheap to connect purity with plenty. The holiest of all is the wealthiest of all, even the Almighty himself. He said, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. And we have heard it said that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and all that dwell therein, the cattle upon a thousand hills, all these belong to God, the holiest of all. So we really don't have to go far to understand that purity begets plenty. Personal purity guarantees personal plenty. Impurity is an enemy of plenty. Many have preached prosperity. Many can quote many scriptures on it, but very few experience it. Iniquity is one of the greatest reasons why it is so. Your hearts and habits go a long way in your desire for prosperity. If you can put your heart in line with God and your habit under covenant control. You got it. Let go of all that lying and cheating. All that unholy and ungodly scheming you're carrying on in your business, which are the reasons why you're going around in circles. But there's victory for you today. You probably might have identified one area of weakness or the other where the devil has been playing tricks on you. Begin to use the blood of Jesus against it now. That anger, that fury, that as vulgar language. Begin to use the blood against them. God is going to prosper his church, but for him to prosper you as a person, 
you must attain unto a level of consecration that will not let money bring you into corruption friend you can have money without money having you it's possible many have proved it god is the lifter of the righteous we saw that in job was a perfect man one that feared god and ensued evil and he was so blessed of god that he became the greatest man in the east job was a hater of iniquity and a lover of righteousness when sin goes lack dies giving will never be equal to prosperity until the foundation is in place you can give from now till you die and not see any returns the greatest men in the world will soon begin to emerge from the church not from the mosques the shrines or from the occult all those fellows are only occupying temporary positions we understand this from god's word for he said after a while you look for them but won't find them again psalm 73 verse 1 to 22 every prosperity is traceable to victory over iniquity your giving will never change your position until you return to god in truth two great prosperity scriptures make this claim return unto me and i will return unto you malachi 3 verse 7 if thou return to the almighty thou shalt be built up thou shalt put away iniquity from thy tabernacle then shall thou lay up gold as dust and the gold of offer as the stones of the brook yeah the almighty shall be thy defense and thou shalt have plenty of silver job 22 verse 23 to 25 so prosperity begins as we return after man sinned god chased him away into the wilderness the wilderness is the portion for sinners because god is angry with the wicked every day if only you will clean up all your seeds sown which have been dying in the earth will come back to life righteousness and thrones it causes to flourish it dignifies it brings beauty joseph refused sin if you don't refuse sin you will soon become a refuse joseph would have become a lifetime refuse in the house of potiphar but he refused sin the fear of god lifted him as we see in genesis 41 verse 38 to 44 see how daniel trans Sended all his persecutors and became their head because an excellent spirit was in him everybody knew daniel with his god it's time for people to know you with your god too i pray that you will not cut short your destiny with iniquity or rather be cheated than cheat my destiny be awake we are not serving a heavenly banker but a heavenly father god is not in need of of your money i need to ring this truth into you very well he said my son give me your heart proverbs 23 verse 26 did he say my son give me your money a departure from iniquity and a return home are the foundation of prosperity as long as the prodigal son stayed away from home he remained naked for the day he returned home he was clothed and he became a celebrity you will not suffer anymore see your nakedness clothed this time the god that prospered joseph on the ground of righteousness purity and integrity will clothe you also the god that enthroned joseph will enthrone you sin is a destroyer not a friend let's fight it with all our being there is a future in righteousness job became the greatest because he lived the purest life in the land for the eyes of the lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him second chronicles 16 verse 9 god will look 
and find you this time and take you off to where you belong. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Psalm 1, 1, 2, verse 1, 2, 3. The true riches of God are for faithful stewards. Faithfulness means righteousness. Oh, I see the dawn of a new day. There's a future in purity. Let's go for it. Iniquity is a destroyer. Let's destroy it. Depart from iniquity. May the secrets of God our cause men to shine as stars be made available to you in this book. Nothing beautifies like holiness. Nothing dignifies like integrity. Nothing uplifts like uprightness. Nothing is as colorful as consecration. Nothing prospers like purity. Nothing causes to flourish like righteousness. These are the missing links, I believe, that have frustrated many prosperity practitioners. The scripture cannot be broken, not even by your giving. Many givers may as well die in poverty because there is more to prosperity than giving. Giving is only one of the two many aspects that make for your prosperity. In the kingdom, I see God taking you back to the garden from the wilderness of lack and want where you have been chilling and toiling from today you will not know lack anymore chapter 3 dedication my son give me thy heart and let thine eyes observe my ways proverbs 23 verse 26 note that god didn't say my son give me your cash when it comes to kingdom prosperity if your heart is not there your cash is wasted talking about the macedonia church they enjoy so much grace in the realm of prosperity because as paul said of them and this they did not as we hoped but first gave their own selves to the lord and unto us by the will of god second corinthians 8 verse 5 they first gave their own selves and then their prosperity became legendary in psalm 51 verse 16 to 19 david said for thou desirest not sacrifice else would i give it thou delightest not in burnt offering the sacrifices of god are a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart O god thou will not despise do good in thy good pleasure unto zion build thou the walls of jerusalem then shall thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar when your heart is tuned unto god your sacrifices become acceptable otherwise they have no meaning to him people have made too many mistakes hitherto what moves him is your heart dedication is getting connected to god and his pleasures when you're separated from him you separate yourself unto suffering and troubles after consecration is dedication dedication is being there with him at all times it's been planted in the house of god those that be planted in the house of the lord shall flourish in the courts of our god they shall still bring forth fruit in old age they shall be fat and flourishing psalm 92 verse 13 to 14 to be planted means to be committed do you find trees moving about wherever you find a tree today that's where you meet it tomorrow it's planted those who are planted that word planted explains what dedication is all about dedication is deadly commitment being always there dedication guarantees a glorious future dedication is the mystery behind extinction how dedicated you are determines how distinguished you will ever become in the kingdom it's not activity i'm talking about it's dedication dedicated to god being planted in the courts 
house of our God, flourishing and still bringing forth fruits in old age. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruits in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Psalm 1 verse 1 to 3. When you are planted, you flourish. That makes all the difference. It says, whatsoever he doeth, it shall prosper. Whatever he does, whether it is selling firewood or whatever, it must prosper. Isaiah 61 verse 3 says, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. When you are planted in him and by him, that settles it. You will be glorified and God is glorified through you too. So our yieldedness to God is what determines our results. Until our hearts are planted in God, our destinies are not secured. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hated his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. John 12 verse 24 to 26. This approach is the way to greatness. It is the way to prosperity. When you put a seed in the ground, it comes under some form of pressure. This pressure is required for it to become a fruit. So the seed goes into the earth and dies in the earth. But later life emerges from that same region of death. Two grains of corn were put in the ground, but they bring forth for you an average of 600 grains on each cob. Sometimes you might have three cobs on one stem just from two grains of corn that had to die. That's how fruitful Christianity becomes when you become thoroughly dedicated to God. Nothing multiplies until it is sown. So until your life becomes a seed planted in the ground of the kingdom, it will not have the color God has ordained for it. Dedication is what determines the flow of life from God to you. It is putting yourself inside the kingdom earth for a fruitful destiny. Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. We have been grafted in and as long as we stay there, we will keep on drawing life directly from the vine. Whatever obtains in the vine naturally becomes our own lot. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 4. If the branch gets off the vine, there is no more hope for it. It may still look green, but it's only for a while. It will soon dry up, transformed. Let's look at transformation mystery of dedication in Romans 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Your transformation is sequel to your dedication. He said, when you give yourself over to him as a living sacrifice, you will be transformed. Every dedicated seed ends up transformed into fruits. If you look at the yam seedling, for instance, it looks very pitiable. If while it's growing, you try to check what is happening to it. It looks like some rotten feces, but inside that rottenness is the life 
beauty and color of the yam tuba. After a while, the old yam dies and a new whole tuba begins to develop and you end up with something about two feet long, heavy and breaking the ground around it. But it first had to die. That is how beautiful dedication can be. Dedication is the mother of distinction. My son, give me your heart. I am not serving him for things. No, I have chosen to offer myself to him. Somebody says God has called you to preach and he doesn't pay his tithe. He's a liar. Someone who can't pay tithe can't give his life. Nobody called him. He's simply looking for a means of livelihood. There is no truly dedicated person that does not find joy in giving material and monetary offerings. If he has given his life, his material possessions have no more value in his sight. On September 12, 1976, I made my life a seed. I did it personally, deliberately and consciously. So I can't but be fruitful because I am not just giving seeds. I'm a seed. I was not yet called into ministry then, but I knew that all my life will be lived pleasing him and promoting his kingdom. I said, now I deliberately turn my back on everything. Henceforth, there is nothing that is mine anymore. You must be Lord of all or not Lord at all. I wrote this down and showed it to my wife. We weren't married then. This is what the Lord has told me. Do you still want to marry me? She said, yes. And I said, now sign. And she did. Many have wondered, what is Bishop Uyedeko's secret? It's a long story. It's a whole lot of diverse encounters and dangerous decisions. Friend, you must get to a point of desperate surrenderedness before your true colors can come out. I'm talking about total yieldedness to God. Then everything begins to respond to you. Many have consecrated themselves so as to secure a place in heaven. But your place on earth is impossible without dedication as God will be careful to bless you if your dedication is out of place. He can't tell where you will be off to next. You may go off target. Consecration guarantees you a place in heaven. But dedication is the mystery behind your distinction on the earth. No truly dedicated Christian loses color. They could not find anything against Daniel except against the law of his God. God, God, God. The Bible also tells us that in spite of all Job's suffering, he did not sin against God. So his latter end was more colorful than his beginning. You can't be sold out for God and not be marketable on the earth. Your color will be so attractive that everybody will be looking for you. Your transformation in life is tied to your reasonable service. When your life becomes a living sacrifice, your transformation in life is secured. The late man of God, Lester Sumra, had just bought a new car. When he got to know that two students were about to be sent out of the Bible school where he was a lecturer, because they couldn't pay their fees. That car was like a new wife to him. He used to just sit in it, smiling to himself during his free periods. But when he heard about these two students, he said, God says the laborers are few. Who knows what place these ones have in God's central program. So he sold the car to pay up their fees. That wasn't a give and receive gimmick. That was dedication such that brings about your distinction in life. I am never motivated by the returns I hope to get when I give. My heart has found a resting place in God. Others may be in it for money, but I'm in it 
for God. Anything about God just turns me on. The choice is yours. Dedication makes your life better and fruitful. It makes you a reasonable worshiper and your transformation is sure. Jesus said, no one take it from me. Talking about his life, I lay it down on my own. I have power to lay it down and have power to take it up again. John 10 verse 18. That's dedication. Say with me, Lord, help me to stay dedicated and stay planted in your house. My life I will no more lose color. I know where to stand now for my colors in the covenant to comfort. I will stay consecrated. I will remain planted in the house of God so I can keep bringing forth fruits the remaining days of my life. May God give you an encounter with this kind of dedication. May you get to that point where your life becomes truly a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is the reasonable service. Plenty answers to dedication. Dedication is simply kingdom commitment and kingdom connection. Until you commit yourself to the kingdom ground, you cannot become fruitful. Chapter 4 Affection because thou servedest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things, therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. Deuteronomy 28 verse 47 to 48. The next issue we want to consider in the foundation for prosperity is affection. I define affection as the lightsome commitment, getting involved with excitement. There is this prophetic parable in Jeremiah 23 verse 36 to 39. And the burden of the Lord shall ye mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts our God. Thus shalt thou say to the prophet, What has the Lord answered thee? And what has the Lord spoken? For since ye say, The burden of the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, because ye say this word, the burden of the Lord, and I have sent unto you, saying, Ye shall not say the burden of the Lord. Therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you, and I will forsake you, and the city that I gave you, and your fathers, and cast you out of my presence. So you have to be delighted in God. You you have to be excited. God loves a cheerful giver. That is, God doesn't love just the giver, but the one that gives cheerfully. Giving, therefore, without being cheerful is wasting your seed. It has no future. When you do it as a burden and not as a delight, you end up in shame and reproach. When you don't obey God with delight, it's a curse. God is not a taskmaster. He brought us out of the taskmaster's domain in Egypt so we can enjoy his favors and blessings. God must not be seen as a burden. Otherwise, life remains a burden for you. When you are not delighted in your service unto God, you suffer lack. You know why many people are in lack today? They give their tithes with complaints and murmuring. Anytime you're not excited, please never drop an offering. It's a waste. Serve the Lord with gladness of heart. There is nothing that has happened to you that is not common to man. But when you now make your own special, you become a special problem to God. Hear me. You don't have a special problem. 
time. Only special ignorance. You have a flat tire. Thank God you're not the one who went flat. All you do is get out of the car if you're really going somewhere and jump into the next bus that comes along and be about your job. God is not a burden. There is no special problem in this world. Don't create one for yourself. There's nothing around you that you cannot handle. There's a great tomorrow for you. It's not a burden serving the Lord. It's a privilege. Affection is an expression of love. When that young ruler came to Jesus and asked, what is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Matthew 22 verse 37. Your affection for God is crucial in your Christian adventure and Solomon loved the Lord. 1 Kings 3 verse 3. That love was what opened him up to the realm of supernatural plenty which he enjoyed. Solomon loved the Lord, not Solomon gave to the Lord. Love drove him to offer to the Lord a thousand burnt offerings. He wasn't giving to get. His giving was just an expression of his affection for God. Please understand what I'm talking about. Giving on its own has no future. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. James 4 verse 3. So nothing happens when God is not the center of your action. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. 1 Kings 3 verse 4. The heavens was full of the smoke of his sacrifice. God came down to him in the night and said, Ask what I shall give thee. Solomon said, Lord, I just love you and I don't want to displease you. I don't want to hurt you. I want to appreciate you for the honor and glory you have placed on me. Just help me to stay pleasing you. Giving to God without a heart seated affection for him will always lead to a lifetime of frustrations. The quality of your affection for God determines your future in the kingdom. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profited me nothing. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3. So giving without affection cancels out the giving. Say with me, Lord help me to stay in love with you and in the affairs of your kingdom. It is the degree of your affection that determines the multiplication of grace you enjoy. If you don't have affection for him, your giving is nothing but philanthropy. No man can outsmart the covenant. I carry God in my heart. That's why I'm shaking my earth. You need to get started now. Bodily exercise. Paul said, profited little, but giving without affection profits nothing. So, there are many in church who are profiting nothing. Someone defined prosperity in a way I love. He said, prosperity is making satisfactory progress. That agrees with Proverbs 4 verse 18, which says, but the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. When it's not more and more, the man is not just. Something is out of place. Life is designed for continuous progress. If a child is not walking at age 3, shouldn't the parents be bothered? People say, don't worry. No, you should worry. If you don't diagnose a case on time, it may kill you. You may ask, what if one is ignorant of this throughout his life? Well, he will just go through life 
catching and managing. Friend, it is the intensity of your love for God that determines the level of blessings you live to enjoy. Jesus is asking you today like he asked Peter, love thou me, John 21 verse 15. Peter replied, Lord, you know that I love you. How many can say that with all sincerity today? Your transformation begins with your affection for God. Paul the apostle asked, what shall separate us from the love of God? That's what determines your height in the kingdom. When you become inseparable from the love of God, your destiny destiny begins to shine forth. Many in the charismatic circle are in crisis today. Why? There is no affection for God. They are seeking God for their own sakes. God is not the reason they're serving in church. They're serving for bread and butter. So they keep going through crisis. I see you come out of those crises now. Develop a heart for God and the earth will hear you. Without a heart for God, you don't make a mark on the earth. David kept celebrating his unique affection for God, so they called him a man after God's heart. You can't be a man after God's heart and not shake your world. No, it's impossible. Lord, give me a heart for you. You need a heart for God. Every bread and butter Christian ends up disappointed. Somebody once asked me, what do you do between the time you give and the time you receive? I told him I had never given it a thought because my reason for giving is different from his. Love is the motive behind all my imputes into the kingdom. It drives me like wine. I can be careful about the shoes I wear, but I can never be careful about what goes out from me to the kingdom because it's where my heart is it is not luck it's not fortune it is light when you have that light and you're walking in it darkness will respect you it's one thing to have the light it's another thing to walk in it can be in love without knowing it I have said before the lord several times lord you know i love you love gets you the light Somebody committed. You can be committed as a duty, but love makes it more colorful. You count it a privilege, not a duty or a burden. You're just excited. Something is just tickling you for him night and day. Looking at all the scriptures on prosperity, you find the word delight recurring. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night psalm 1 verse 2 praise ye the lord blessed is the man that feareth the lord that delighteth greatly in his commandments his seed shall be mighty upon earth the generation of the upright shall be blessed psalm 1 1 2 verse 1 to 2 the word delight connotes affection charity a romantic word it's one thing to be committed it's another to be delightsomely committed that is god is not a burden to you you're just in love with him i just love god so much that's why i know he can't leave me alone my entire being pants after him is the only being that moves me it's not a gift it's a choice just like your wife is not a gift but your choice love is also not a gift but your choice i have chosen him as my central figure anybody else may choose cars and houses but i chose him anybody can choose name or fame but he is my choice ask him anytime anywhere and he will tell you that my heart has been with him for years i don't love money yet i have it why i know the rule of the game the young lions do lack and suffer hunger but they that seek the lord shall not want any good thing psalm 34 verse 10 there are many money hunters in church so they suffer lack and hunger when you are consumed 
by God. Your destiny can no longer be doomed. When God becomes your song, you never have tears. Lasting prosperity is nothing but carrying divine presence. And in his presence, there is joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16 verse 11. The house of your friend is never far, is it? You have neighbors. Or when you want to pour out your heart to someone, you go in search of your friend, no matter how far his house is from yours. You will never be alone when you get into a real love relationship with God. David was that kind of man. And who? Oh, how God blessed him. He said, Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God the gold for things to be made of gold and the silver for things of silver and the brass for things of brass the iron for things of iron and wood for things of wood onyx stones and stones to be set glistering stones and of diverse colors and all manner of precious stones and marble stones in abundance moreover because i have set my affection to the house of my God I have of my own proper good of gold and silver which I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house first chronicles 29 verse 2 to 3 it is affection that moves you to the realm of over and above given David brought 3,000 talents of gold which is equivalent to 500 and 76 million dollars in today's value he encountered all that by reason of affection please get back and properly relocate your heart put it on the correct covenant frequency and you will soon begin to shake your world all this oh god i need mercedes best 230 is not christianity that's not what you need just get on the line with god and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6 verse 33. For a Christian not to sleep because he needs a television set is terrible. He has a problem. That's demonic oppression. He needs to be free. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knoweth that he have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you matthew 6 32 to 33 i have never knocked at god's door for money for he is committed to keep blessing me because i am in the covenant just get god committed and you will be free for life i have committed him by doing what he said i should do i'm doing it how he said it should be done i am not doing it to get things but in love as he has commanded god called abraham at 75 and made a name out of him it's never late light will always generate life love makes you a sweatless winner listen to me those things you concern yourself with are not the real issues of life these things i'm talking about are the things that make things great psalm 37 verse 4 says delight thyself also in the lord and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart you can't be in love with god and not enjoy plenty when you're in love with him you're through with struggles he that hath my commandments and keepeth them he it is that loveth me and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father and i will love him and will manifest myself to him john 14 verse 21 when the father loves you you're through god so loved the world he gave his best when you you win God's love, you become a star on the earth. Friends, stay in love and you will, will be fulfilled. Stay in love and your struggles will end. That's what and he shall grant you the desires of your heart means. No one loves him without being lifted. Everyone that's 
stays in love with him leaves as a star on the earth say with me lord help me to stand strong in the love covenant when you win the father's love heaven's best becomes available to you god can't love you without the world taking notice because heaven's best comes naturally to you god has made a supernatural help available that will help us stay in love with him that help is the holy spirit romans 5 verse 5 tells us because the love of god is shed abroad in our hearts by the holy ghost who is given to us pray intensely in the spirit for self to give way to god in your heart be baptized into the lightsome commitment into affection and genuine love for him this are in the name of jesus i decree that your love for him stays aflame forever in jesus name chapter 5 addiction pray for the peace of jerusalem they shall prosper that love thee psalm 122 verse 6 now i want to take you to a point of encounter with jehovah jireh we will be looking at what i consider the fourth fundamental issue in kingdom prosperity addiction who shall prosper the above scripture says they shall prosper that love thee not that love to prosper those that shall prosper are those that love the peace of jerusalem god's kingdom it is those who want to see it advancing progressing and established that's addiction verse 9 says because of the house of the lord our god i will seek that good that's not a trade by battle life but a life utterly dedicated and committed to the good of the house of god david was simply addicted the formula is clear but seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you matthew 6 33 there is what to seek first so that you won't have any need to seek any other thing as they will cheaply be added unto you i don't know where your heart is but i must tell you that where your heart is determines where god places you seek ye first the kingdom of god that is you're moved by every kingdom issue not just to be seen but because that's where your heart is many are in the kingdom for what they can get so they always get disappointed there are many who are only moved by their own things so their own things never work or when the kingdom of god moves you as your own thing would you're on your way to the topmost stop in life david can testify to this first chronicles 29 verse 2 to 5 change your position in the great prosperity passage in job 22 one thing is very clear if thou return to the almighty thou shalt be built up job 22 verse 23 so there is need for a relocation you're not built up because you are given you are built up because you have relocated and you have aligned yourself with the terms of the covenant return unto me and i will return unto you say yet the lord of hosts malachi 3 verse 7 so covenant alignment is the key to heaven's abundance that is relocating yourself to fall in line with the covenant demands for abundance until you change your position your situation remains the same god said in jeremiah 29 verse 13 and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart psalm 16 verse 11 makes us to understand that in thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand 
hand, there are pleasures forevermore. How addicted you are to the advancement of the kingdom determines the level of abundance you enjoy. This addiction I'm talking about is not in the volume of what you give. No, it's in the tenacity of your heart. How connected you are to God. David said, I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Psalm 132 verse 4 to 5. God has seen how much offerings you drop continually in church. Now let him see you drop your heart for him. That's your reasonable service. Drop your heart. Where is your heart? Return. Don't let the offerings you give deceive you until your body becomes a living sacrifice you're not in reasonable service yet say with me lord i will seek the good of your house with all my heart my giving is secondary my heart is the primary issue help me lord the word says rend your heart not your garments joel 2 verse 13 it is your heart that connects with god let that heart be truly connected and then you will begin to see your reign of blessings you will begin to make progress at the end of the day you won't have any more requests because while you were busy seeking the peace of jerusalem he was busy bestowing on you his own peace while you're seeking the prosperity of his kingdom he was busy adding to you all these things seeking the good of god's people commands good to follow you david was an example of true biblical addiction which led to earthly distinction for him if every businessman has a kingdom dream his business will definitely flourish now let's have a look at abraham's addiction to god and it came to pass after these things and god did tempt abraham and said unto him abraham and he said behold here i am and he said take now thy son thy only son isaac whom thou lovest and get thee into the land of moriah and offer him therefore a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which i will tell thee of and abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and isaac his son and cleaved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went on to the place of which god had told him then on the third day abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the the place afar off genesis 22 verse 1 to 4 abraham had ample time to change his mind but he didn't and neither did he consult with anybody i have looked at this account very carefully and have come to appreciate the fact that this was not just dedication no neither is it just affection it's addiction abraham was a god addict a kingdom addict just like you have people addicted to drugs cigarettes adultery or one vice or the other abraham was addicted to god see what became of him and abraham was very rich in cattle in silver and in gold genesis 13 verse 2 and abraham was old and well stricken in age and the lord had blessed abraham in all things genesis 24 verse 1 friend kingdom addiction is the highway to supernatural addictions and they came to the place which god had told him of and abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood and abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son genesis 22 verse 9 to 10 this was no pretense he went three days climbed up the mountain built the altar himself he didn't send anyone to do it for him all at his age and the angel of the lord called unto him out of heaven and said abraham abraham and he said here i am and he said lay not thy hand upon the lad neither do thou anything unto him for now i know that thou fearest god seeing thou hast not withheld thy son and only 
only son from me. Genesis 22 verse 11 to 12. That means the sacrifice was concluded. Abraham had concluded slaying his son Isaac. But we were not told anywhere that it was done in tears. Drunkards don't weep for lack in their homes because they are addicted to their drinks. When his wife tells him there is no food in the house, all he replies is, go to blazes. Abraham was lost in his obedience to God's demand. There was nothing more inside him but God. You must also get to that point in your life. That is the point of eternal triumph. You will just keep flying. May God help you to get to this point and stay there in Jesus' name. May you tap into the Abrahamic grace today and step into the realm of kingdom addiction so you can enjoy endless provisions the remaining days of your life. God swore an eternal blessing to Abraham. Genesis 22 verse 16 to 18. God said, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And in another place he said, he that honors me will I honor. He is in other words saying, if you are addicted to me, I will be addicted to you. Abraham took in his hand what could be regarded as his greatest testimony. And without questioning God, he was set to go and slay him. He encountered God. He encountered Jehovah Jireh. His emotions, attitude, thinking and everything were God controlled. Just like every drug addict is drug controlled. When he hasn't taken it, his whole body begins to shiver. He can do anything, sell anything to get a fresh supply of his drugs. The same way God controlled the whole of Abraham. We were not told anywhere that he discussed the matter with even his wife Sarah. When you come under such control, you become a controller on the earth. Say with me, oh God, help me. I want to see the Abrahamic order of faith at work in my life. I want to obey you absolutely on every issue, no matter what it cost me. Daniel was another God addict. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Daniel 6 verse 5. There was no trap that could catch this man Daniel. All around him knew Daniel was addicted to his God. It's time for people around you to know where you belong. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a four times. Daniel 6 verse 10. Daniel was addicted to his God and it led to supernatural liftings for him. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Daniel 6 verse 12. 28. When you become addicted to the law of your God, you have set the pace for the supernatural additions of his blessings. Let's also look at the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Daniel 3 verse 14. And they answered him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, I will, will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Daniel 3 verse 16 to 18. That's the language of 
one that is drunk with his God. Remember that they were captives. They didn't even need to commit any offense to be killed. But yet they despised the fiery furnace. See what that earned them. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Daniel 3 verse 13. Friend, if you are addicted to God, he will be addicted to you. Daniel prospered. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were promoted all on the tickets of kingdom addiction. Addiction is your way to Mount Moriah where you encounter Jehovah Jireh. Addiction, when God takes hold of the whole of you, when emotionally, psychologically, physiologically, you are all wrapped up in God, completely tied up to Him. When nothing moves you like Him, nothing stirs you on the inside like Him. When it's all you're living for, when you get to that realm, no matter how many forces are against you, you just keep going up. I'm sure that with the examples of Abraham, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you have a clearer understanding of what I mean by kingdom addiction. It is unreserved obedience, the cost notwithstanding. It is absolute yieldedness. When God becomes the central focus of your life, it is when all his words have become law to you. It is when you rise up in the morning and all you celebrate is God. You go to bed at night and all you celebrate is God. There is no way you won't prosper this way. Just get addicted to God and you will be free. When he becomes the controller of the affairs of your life, everything will go in your favor. So, you see, now that prosperity goes far beyond giving you will notice that you haven't mentioned giving so far because it is not the only critical issue in prosperity if the foundation we have considered is not in place you can have all the theory till jesus comes and still not see god's good and grace finger in your life I would like you to say this prayer. Lord, get me drunk with you like Abraham, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were drunk. Get me drunk with you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Part 2. Why God Prospers Chapter 6. So you can be a blessing. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Genesis 12 verse 2. There is nothing God does without a reason. He said in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, I alone know the plans I have for you. Good news Bible. God is a planner. So what's his plan or reason for blessing us? Why does God prosper? And thou shalt shall be a blessing that's not a title but the reason why god blesses that's the only way that the blessing he will bless you with won't kill or destroy you until you understand the secret of being a blessing you will never enjoy god's blessings the level to which you are prepared to be a blessing is the level to which you will be blessed god will never bless you beyond the level to which you are ready to be a blessing we often think abraham's blessings are mine wonderful but this is the condition if you're not ready to be a blessing neither will god be ready to bless you no matter how delicious a meal is for instance if you're not ready to bless the earth with the waste you're likely to die with it no matter how much you love any dish or how much you enjoy it you still need to pass the waste out otherwise you'll be a dead man very soon the reason many are financially dead is because they stopped going to toilet financially that is he stopped being blessings unto others so they are going about as financial corpses when somebody hasn't passed out feces for about three days do you ask him what food would you like to eat no he wouldn't like any food at that time because there is one inside him that has become poisonous if you eat all your food and drink all your water alone it will soon dry up but let it 
flow out to others and you stay refreshed stagnant water stinks you know and thou shalt be a blessing this is a commandment that has long been forgotten in the church when we talk about prosperity every blessing must flow out to others to enjoy if you don't want it to stop abraham reached out to be a blessing to tired travelers and he lifted up his eyes and looked and lo three men stood by him and when he saw them he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said my lord if now i have found favor in thy sight pass not away i pray thee from thy servant let a little water i pray you be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree and i will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts genesis 18 verse 2 to 5 he was inviting blessings on our wares many people have allowed blessings to pass them by because they are tight fisted if you touch their money you have touched their soul do you want abraham's blessings then you need abraham's lifestyle that's the way he got the blessings abraham lived practically as a blessing he was an addicted giver giving leads to blessing and blessings in turn leads to giving and the cycle continues like that every time god talks of blessings he also talks of being a blessing genesis 22 verse 15 to 18 god blesses you so you can bless others every genuine giver is more excited at giving than at receiving covenant people are not opportunists they are not schemers they are people who have the love and the affection of the people in their hearts in genesis 23 abraham needed a piece of land on which to bury his wife sarah though the people wanted to give it to him free he however insisted on paying for it so Somebody once gave me a piece of land which I fenced round, put two gates there, and gave it back to the person. Another person also gave me a property, a building located in a good place. I was told I never saw it. I said, "Call this person. Let me bless her." I said to her, "It's in your heart to give this gift, but I cede it back to you as Abraham's Isaac on the altar that will not be killed." receive it back in Jesus name covenant people are more eager to bless because Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive acts 20 verse 35 one day i got to the church and i saw my precious people the sanctuary keepers working so hard at keeping the whole place clean as i looked at them i felt in my heart that some of them had some needs so i called their leader and and asked him to let me have the details of such deeds at the end of the day i gave out over 700000 naira to take care of those needs why because it's more blessed to give than to receive god doesn't bless people for the fun of it he blesses them so that they can become a blessing abraham's blessings are mine is more than a mere song it's a lifestyle stop dancing around people people's possessions stop praying prayers that will make them give you something no covenant people are not opportunists they are givers and are excited at giving everybody who lifts up his hand to the lord will never lack you are blessed to be a blessing when you stop being a blessing you stop being blessed if your income is 500 naira don't eat it all it's not safe you might be eating off your future unknowingly the only way to step into abrahamic blessings is to live the abrahamic lifestyle when god was talking about giving he said thou shall love the lord thy god with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind 
This is the first and great commandment. Matthew 22 verse 37 to 38. So your giving goes first to God and then to men around you. God's love is a given love. When you are not a giver, you are not in love. God so loved the world. He gave his best to the world to prove his love, his son Jesus. So God's love is a given love. Everyone that loves him he said he will love when god loves you he will give to you when you are in the practice of the love of god therefore you don't stop receiving don't ever give any man what you won't give to god that's not correct somebody wants to give me a car wonderful but i find out first has he ever given such a thing to god if i'm not sure he should take his car back and give it to god directly not through me it's god first and anybody else next i will never give my wife what i don't give god god forbid it will never happen i'm wiser than that i have vowed i will never take to my mouth any Anything near what I give to the Lord. I won't wear what I won't put on God. No, God first. God's love is a given love. God blessed Abraham, and Abraham responded by giving back to him. Genesis 14. He gave, he didn't pray. He gave to say, I saw the blessing. Here is my giving. Giving is living. You won't be blessed until you are ready to be a blessing. Don't shut your door and eat all the food and drink all the water while somebody is dying next door to you demonstrate your love for god in church give galatians 6 verse 10 tells us as we have therefore opportunity let us do good unto all men especially unto them who are of the household of faith also but whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shut it off his vows of compassion from him how dwelleth the love of god in him first john 3 verse 17 i could pray for you from now till eternity but the scripture cannot be broken god blesses only to make men sources of blessing friend if you want to be blessed open up say with me lord help me to become a blessing i have found out that it's the only way to be blessed Blessed, help me, Lord. Chapter 7 For His Kingdom's Sake. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. Exodus 3 verse 21 to 22 later in exodus 25 verse 2 and 8 we got to know why speak unto the children of israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart ye shall take my offering and let them make me a sanctuary that i may dwell among them god blesses primarily for his kingdom's sake the children of israel were just about to take up their redemption in god they were just about escaping the slavery of egypt and god said to them you shall not go empty i will make sure i bless you so he transferred the wealth of the egyptians to them he blessed them with the wealth of the gentiles he gave them gold silver and brass he brought them out out of bondage with plenty but in exodus 35 verse 4 to 5 he called for the gold and moses spoke unto all the congregation of the children of israel saying this is the thing which the lord commanded saying take ye from among you an offering unto the lord whosoever is of a willing heart let him bring it an offering of the lord gold and silver and brass take 
not go and look for he had already blessed them and out of that blessing he was calling for offerings from a willing heart for the building of the tabernacle he said to them as it were take it i need it now it's me who gave it to you you were in rags in egypt then i gave you loads of gold and silver to carry now take it bring it here so they responded and they came both men and women as many as were willing hearted and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets all jewels of gold and every man that offered offered an offering of gold unto the lord and every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and red skin of rams and badger skin brought them exodus 35 verse 22 to 23 please understand this god blesses for his kingdom's sake when we entrench this into our lifestyle we keep the taps of his blessings permanently open so the angel that communed with me said unto me cry thou saying thus saith the lord of hosts i am jealous for jerusalem and for zion with a great jealousy and i am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease for i was but a little displeased and they helped forward the affliction therefore thus saith the lord i am returned to jerusalem with mercies my house shall be built in it saith the lord of hosts and a line shall be stretched forth from jerusalem cry yet saying thus saith the lord of hosts my city through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad zachariah 1 verse 14 to 17 why was god turning their captivity so he could spread his city abroad god is out to bless us so we can in turn become avenues of blessings to his kingdom every gold you keep away from god will take you away from him you either worship god with your gold or you worship your gold make your choice there are two great contestants for your worship god and gold and jesus said ye cannot serve god and mammon money you are either serving god with your means or you end up worshiping your means because the children of israel would not worship god with their gold they became worshipers of gold remember the golden calf exodus 32 verse 1 to 6 so it's a risk when you lack the opportunity to give like this did god had not called for any offering so they used it to build the golden calf but when the opportunity came to give for the building of the tabernacle they kept giving until moses had to tell them to stop giving exodus 36 verse 6 to 7 god blesses primarily for his kingdom's sake when you're a kingdom seeker you will never lack any good thing in life seek the kingdom of god seek its expansion its beauty and seek its glory and all these things shall be added unto you matthew 6 verse 33 without a heart for god you can't make a mark on the earth if everything god is saying doesn't move you there's nothing you will ever say that will move him the reason why god is always running after my things tirelessly is because i run after his things tirelessly i can't watch his work die all my being and my thoughts are after the progress and expansion of his kingdom 26 years ago i was a student worker in a remote village when i arrived there there was no single church i said lord i must not leave this place the way i met it so help me in whichever way you will i then got a young man who speaks the language of the place and said to him you will interpret for me work is to start here now i first got him to accept christ then we began in 40 days we didn't only have a church
church in place but had also put up a church structure yes it was a grass structure but god saw me when i was climbing the palm tree and cutting down palm fronds he also saw me when i left that village with less than i went in with because i gave out all my shoes and clothes to the boys who were my co-laborers the day i was leaving the village the village chief came to church for the first time in his life he said we have been told that anywhere church gets to civilization gets there too thank you for bringing civilization to our village meanwhile we had converts of all kinds in church i wasn't yet called into ministry then i just had a heart for god the eldest man in the village on behalf of the whole village presented a bush lamp to me saying the light you brought into our village let it shine around the whole world i believe that i earned this ministry i now have from that village where is your heart if your heart is not with him don't expect his hand to be on you for blessings without a heart for god you don't make a mark on the earth if you're in church only to collect you will never stop being disappointed but if you're in church to be be part of the lifting promotion and progress of the kingdom give it time all your mockers will soon see you right on top why does god bless he blesses so you can bless his kingdom and be part of of lifting it whatever gold he gives you when he calls for it may you not keep it solomon said there is a saw evil which i have seen under the sun namely riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt ecclesiastes 5 verse 13 when you keep your riches away from god it is to your own hurt god is not eyeing your money there's nothing in your pocket that didn't come from him in the first place god is not looking for your money he's looking for your heart you know why you do not give consistently to the kingdom your heart is not there if your heart is there you won't need any encouragement i've never needed encouragement from anyone in this world to serve him by the weight of my givings which is now in millions god is not afraid to give me billions because he knows what i would do with it you know he testified concerning abraham for i know him genesis 18 verse 19 hear this again god won't bless you more than how far you are set to promote his kingdom it's not the prayer of any man that will change your position it's you positioning yourself in the covenant that will bring a turnaround for you god is a lifter he said honor me and i will honor you lift me and i will lift you promote me and i will promote you it is wisdom to put god first oh yes i'm involved in ministering to the poor and the needy but there's nobody i will minister to in this world with things near what i minister to god thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thy heart that's the first and the great commandment you don't go to the second when you have not done the first god so loved the world that he gave if you love the lord your god with all your heart you will give to him with all your heart as well god is not your heavenly banker he's your heavenly father he responds to love more than anything else i just love you lord i can't help myself when that becomes your song you're on your way to the topmost top god blesses for his kingdom's sake when you allow these blessings to fulfill the purpose for which he has blessed you he keeps blessing you the more and everyone that has forsaken houses 
or brethren or sisters or fathers or mothers or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life matthew 19 verse 29 so when you allow the purpose for which he blessed you to be fulfilled then he blesses you more and more don't give for the sake of receiving that's a wrong type of giving and jesus answered and said verily i say unto you there is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels for he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution in the world to come eternal life mark 10 verse 29 to 30 luke 18 verse 29 to 30 is in the same vein and he said unto them verily i say unto you there is no man that has left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of god's sake who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come life everlasting look at psalm 102 verse 13 to 14 as well thou shalt arise and have mercy upon zan for the time to favor her yeah the said time is come for thy servant take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof all you need to do is to favor his kingdom and you will encounter kingdom wealth without sweat favor the very dust of his kingdom when the children of israel didn't give their gold they suffered or when they gave it he kept blessing them and they kept bringing until moses announced that it was enough listen to me when god says i will bless you never mind the climate it's irrelevant as he would surely favor you but the time to favor you doesn't come until you begin to display your favor for his kingdom when everything about the kingdom moves you then you begin to move him to bless you i see you going up in jesus precious name amen chapter 8 so you can bless the poor for i was an hungered and ye gave me meat i was thirsty and you gave me drink i was a stranger and ye took me in naked and you clothed me i was sick and ye visited me i was in prison and ye came unto me then shall the righteous answer him say lord when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee and the king shall answer and say say unto them verily i say unto you inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren ye have done it unto me matthew 25 verse 35 to 40 the poor around you are god given assets for your increase in life so celebrate every opportunity with excitement there's always somebody in need just around the corner for ye have the poor always with you matthew 26 verse 11 deuteronomy 15 verse 11 also adds for the poor shall never cease out of the land therefore i command thee saying thou shalt open thy hand wide unto thy brother to thy poor and to thy needy in thy land when you open up your boils heaven's windows also open in your direction one of the reasons god blesses us is so that we can bless the poor around us to open our hands wide towards them and rescue them from the jaws and plague of poverty until your arms are open wide to the needy god's window stays shut over you if you eat all your food and drink your water alone it will soon run dry there's an opportunity around you there grab it you may say there was 
somebody I helped the other day and he did this, he did that, recounting some negative experiences you had in the past. No, just keep reaching out to the poor and needy. Don't say, when I have a big house, it's a big heart you need, not a big house. He that keepeth the commandment keepeth his own soul, or he that despiseth his ways shall die. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that will which he has given will he pay him again proverbs 19 verse 16 to 17 giving to the poor is a commandment verse 16 established it as a commandment and verse 17 gives us an understanding of that commandment having pity on the poor is lending unto the lord by so doing you commit god to give it back to you of course when you lend to a man bigger than you who is repaying you it's always with a bonus when you lend to a man bigger than you you're securing extraordinary favor in your direction god said oh no man anything so there's nothing that you lend to him that is lost if he says he that gives to the poor lend it to the lord then you're through because you're sure he will repay you it's a privilege to lend to the lord by giving to the poor you have a guarantee of returns he that oppressed the poor reproached his maker or he that honored him has mercy on the poor proverbs 14 verse 31 so when you have mercy on the poor you're honoring god now join this with first samuel 2 verse 30 for them that honor me i will honor when you're meeting the needs of the poor according According to the grace of God on your life, you are securing honor from heaven. Whoso mocked the poor, reproached his maker. Proverbs 17 verse 5. Whoso stopped his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. Proverbs 21 verse 13. May you respond with godly fear every time the poor knocks at your door. He that by us an unjust gain increases in substance he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor proverbs 28 verse 8 god will always favor the one that pities the poor he that giveth unto the poor shall not lack but he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. Proverbs 28 verse 27. One of the reasons God blesses is so that you can clothe the naked, feed the hungry, and help the helpless. That way you're on your way to the top. On my birthday in 1996, God laid it in my heart to give two separate checks of one million naira each for scholarship to indigenous students in the church and the order to service the needs of the people friend giving is living it's just like breathing when a man stops breathing that's the end he's regarded as a dead man since he's tired of breathing he's tired of living accumulators of money don't get kingdom wealth it is distributors of money that are blessed with it there is that scatter it and yet increase it and there is that withholdeth more than his meat but he tendereth to poverty proverbs 11 verse 24 anyone who gives to the poor can never lack you remember job one secret that accounted for his greatness he told us was giving to the poor he said i was eyes to the blind and feet was i to the lame i was a father to the poor and the cause which i knew not i searched out and i break the jaws of the wicked and plucked the spur out of his teeth job 29 verse 15 to 17 so he came out 
out as a mighty prince in his community, the greatest man in all the East. First John 3 verse 17 tells us, For whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth off his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? God's love is only given expression by giving. Friend, God is not blessing you to give you more clothes, more cars, etc. Those ones do come along, but they are not the issue. He blesses you to bless your generation in every way that they need a blessing. Then he blesses you for his kingdom's sake. So when you begin to give for his kingdom's sake, you open the windows of heaven in your direction for ceaseless and continuous supplies. Then he blesses you to bless the poor. Watch every man that is prosperous in the kingdom. He is one that has a large heart, one towards God and towards men that are around him. So God blesses us to make us a blessing. When you are tired of being a blessing, God also will be tired of blessing you. Chapter 9 Scriptural Proofs Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For they said, We will not walk therein. Jeremiah 6 verse 16 Examples are the most effective ways of teaching. Let's find out how the men who have trodden the old path made it. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and it was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Genesis 14 verse 18 to 20. Abraham Abraham had victory and blessings. He gave to fulfill the purpose for which he was blessed. According to Hebrews, Melchizedek was Jesus in a figure. So when God blesses you, you respond by blessing him. Abraham gave the tithes of all, laying an example for us to follow. God blessed Abraham with a son called Isaac at the age of 100 years. Genesis 22, God called for Isaac as an offering. Then Abraham went three day journey looking for a mountain where he would sacrifice his son. God blesses us so we can bless him in return. Abraham understood this so he took his son off to Mount Moriah to to offer him to God. God was sure he would do it. When he saw him bind the lad and lift up the knife to kill him, then God responded, By myself have I sworn that in blessing I will bless thee. When you fulfill the purpose for the blessing, you keep the blessing flowing. Abraham could bless God with anything God had blessed him with, so the blessings kept flowing. When you know the reason for which God has blessed you, and you're standing on it, he will never stop blessing you. That's how God operates. Let's look at the nation Israel. And I will give these people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. Exodus 3 verse 21. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such thing as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. Exodus 12 verse 36 God gave them such favors that transferred the wealth of Egypt unto them. But why did God do so? And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass. Exodus 35 verse 4 to 5. And they received of Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought 
brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary to make it wither and they brought yet unto him free offerings every morning and all the wise men that wrought all the work of the sanctuary came every man from his work which they made exodus 36 verse 3 to 4 mysteriously even though they were still in the wilderness as they were giving the gold and the silver they kept multiplying back to them so they kept bringing and bringing i have discovered that whenever god makes a proclamation requesting for something it's an opportunity to open your heavens to you god's blessing has nothing to do with the size of what you give but with your heart and readiness to serve him the word of god in second corinthians 9 verse 7 says every man according as he purposeth in his heart so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity for god loveth a cheerful giver david said now i have prepared with all my might for the house of my god the gold for things to be made of gold moreover because i have set my affection to the house of my god i have of my own proper good of gold and silver which i have given to the house house of my god over and above all that i have prepared for the holy house first chronicles 29 verse 2 to 3 how many in church can say that today when you join the over and above company you're on your way to the top the larger your heart for god the greater you become on the earth god told david i won't let you build a house for me because of your blood-stained hands shouldn't he go and rest then david should have just rejoiced and gone ahead to start building all manner of houses for himself but no he wouldn't do that he said god you don't know me i'm an addict i will prepare everything before i die friend god blesses to make you a blessing david has proved that god's blessing can be unlimited until you're a blessing to the kingdom of god you don't become blessed on the earth so get started on time lord remember david and all his afflictions how he swore unto the lord and vowed unto the mighty god of jacob surely i will not come into the tabernacle of my house nor go off into my bed i will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until i find out a place for the lord and habitation for the mighty god of jacob psalm 132 verse 1 to 5 that's the kind of person god blesses job was an extraordinary blessing to the needy in his community so god also blessed him extraordinarily he knew the secret to god's blessings this is the secret behind kingdom prosperity friend god is out to bless his people you won't be the odd one out you are blessed to be a blessing so if you're not prepared to be a blessing don't expect his blessings when you're committed to being a blessing you have committed god to blessing you so you better start working now while others are working otherwise while they are eating you will be begging you will not suffer in jesus name part three the covenant platform for prosperity chapter 10 the seed is the word this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success joshua 1 verse 8 now we're going to begin to explore how god blesses some people have thought that god blesses you financially when you give financial seed well that's not the whole truth 
prosperity in the kingdom is on the platform of encounters with this book, the Bible. The word of God is God's highway to the world of wealth. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth and lay up his words in thine heart. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacle then shalt thou lay up gold as dust and the gold of offer as the stones of the brooks job 22 verse 21 to 24 god's kind of prosperity begins with receiving the law and laying up his words in your heart because god's word is what leads to the world of wealth it's god's gateway to heavenly blessings Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Psalm 112 verse 1 to 3. It is your encounter with God's commandment that makes you a commander i command sickness at will because have encountered the word of healing concerning supernatural supplies i once said to god won't you even wait for someone to pray before you answer he said no there's a company of people who before they call on me i answered them and while they are yet speaking i perform that's the word company when you become a word operator you become an automatic commander it is your encounters with his commandments that makes you a commander it's your gateway to heaven's blessings amazing unmistakable and undeniable blessings in deuteronomy 28 verse 1 to 14 we see where god opens up showing us the pathway to his everlasting blessings it begins with and it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently to the voice of the lord thy god to observe and to do all his commandments verse 1 and he goes on to list out the blessings the lord thy god will set thee on high above all nations of the earth blessed shalt thou be in the city and blessed shalt thou be in the field and the lord shall make thee plenteous in goods the law shall open unto thee his good treasure look at all of that friend the word is the way to wealth god has packaged it so his ways are higher than our ways there's nothing we can do about it this book is the gateway to wealth it is the answer book for prosperity anything that can help your understanding of this book is an asset to your destiny so grab it until you're able to lay hold on his commandments you never become a commander in isaiah 60 verse 1 he says arise shine for thy light is come when do you shine when your light comes nothing shines without light what is that light the entrance of thy word giveth light psalm 119 verse 130 that light refers to scriptural illuminations that help your appreciation of divine truths when does light come when the word enters not when you hear it but when it enters all the way down to verse 22 of isaiah 60 he goes on to list all that that light carries in form of blessings and distinction the word of god is god's gateway to heaven's blessings it's our cover covenant platform for kingdom prosperity no shortcuts it is the word that creates wealth declaring his mission in luke 4 verse 18 jesus said the spirit of the lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor what do you do to the poor you preach the gospel what is good news to the poor 
prosperity what is good news to the hungry prosperity what is good news to the naked prosperity what is good news to the homeless prosperity prosperity is preached you don't pray it you don't fast for it you preach it the encounter comes by the word not by the rigors of religious exercise speaking to john's disciples in matthew 11 verse 4 to 5 jesus said go and show john again those things which ye do hear and see the blind receive their sight and the lame walk the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them so it is the word that delivers men from poverty you therefore need an encounter with the word an eye-opening insight that will deliver you from all the things holding you down the true riches of god are only available through the word of god my son eat thou honey because it is good and the honeycomb which is sweet to thy taste so shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul when thou hast found it then there shall be a reward and thy expectation shall not be cut off proverbs 24 verse 13 to 14 you can't find it without knowing it so many people know the law very few understand the ways the law will only prosper by the understanding of the ways of god a prominent man of god used to be very poor but one day he encountered one little book written by kenneth hagen titled redeemed from sickness poverty and death from the insight he contacted from that book poverty fled another man of god also used to be poor but one day he got a load of kenneth hagen's tapes locked himself up in a room and began to listen to them light came and his star rose he began to shine and poverty had to flee for every man with an understanding breakthrough such breakthroughs are traceable to a definite life they encountered from god's word my own personal encounter in march 1981 i went on a three-day adventure into the word of god i sat down with my bible and gloria copeland's book god's will is prosperity on the third day while reading i found it light dawned from heaven like a lightning i stood up and began to spin around in the room in the excitement of my discovery i came out and announced to everyone at the top of my voice i can never be poor it was a verdict backed up by my light from heaven poverty ended in my life that day just so will end today one thing i will never be called till jesus comes is needy no i will never mistakenly be called needy by any man i was in america some time ago and a man having enjoyed my ministration walked up to me and asked what needs do you have in your ministry i said to him with absolute conviction our ministry has no needs we only meet needs to date we don't receive a dime as aid from any country in the world nor have we ever solicited for it friend it's no luck it's not chance it's light the prosperity of your soul first the prosperity of your soul determines your overall prosperity in life the word is what prospers the soul until your soul prospers by the word of god your life can't taste prosperity every man that was released from the bondage of poverty encountered certain words that brought about their release it's not the practice it's first and foremost the word the prosperity of your soul by the word is what results in your outward prosperity in life this book is the key it shall not depart from your mouth you shall meditate therein day and night then shall you make your way prosperous
lives by encounters with the word and the operation of the revelations released to you. It is your soul that prospers first before your life begins to prosper. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. 3 John 2 The prosperity of the soul is nothing but the revelation of the word of God. Please understand that there is nothing called luck. You are down because you lack light. When you encounter appropriate light in the area where you're walking in darkness, it will shine as a star. Men triumph by truth, not by tricks. In that testimony from Burkina Faso, Kauda Musa did not get his breakthrough until he encountered the light on integrity. Nothing shines without light. Until your light comes, your struggle continues. There is this testimony from a precious brother in the church. He said, I've been privileged by the grace of the Lord to be in contact with this ministry since 1988. I desired to go to school but couldn't because I come from a broken home. In 1990, I listened to one of Bishop's tapes where he prayed on possessing the land with the money. He said, if you are educated and you don't have money, press men will not come to your birthday party. But if you have money and you're not educated, press men will come to your birthday. I caught that word and I went out to take up a job. The Lord blessed me tremendously. Within three years of doing that job, I was able to put up a three-bedroom flat. After that, I was transferred to another site. After I received my Christmas bonus in January, I gave my pastor the whole package minus my tithes and asked him to buy me all the bishop's books and as many tapes as the money I gave him could purchase. He bought them for me. In March, I listened to one of those tapes. It was that of the December pastor's meeting. The bishop said, this is your peak and if you miss your peak, you will end up in a pit. This is your time and you must take time to make it count. So I sacrificed the month of April to come for Wolf B course. I wasn't paid for that month because if you don't work, you won't be paid. When I got back to the office after the course, there was a letter waiting for me that I should report at our head office in Lagos to fill out the workers evaluation sheet. Meanwhile on Tuesday the bishop had told us to pray that God will single us out for a blessing. Yesterday while in the office I got a radio phone message saying brother Nate what is happening? I discovered that we are owing you 300 tons of granite. What do you want us to do? My reply was was please dispose of them immediately and send me the money. In less than three hours, my project manager brought 300,000 naira to me. He also went on to say, I discovered we didn't pay you in April and I said yes sir. He said I will pay you your salary from my pocket. He did exactly that. At ABC NB. If you don't love the truth, you will never be free from trials. Psalm 45 verse 3 to 4 says, Gild thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. It is your wonderful insight, contacted from the word of God, that makes you a wonder in the kingdom. Supernatural supplies don't answer to prayer it answers to insight friend if only you can have light from heaven oh if you can locate yourself in this dramatic access to heaven source you will be free for life the adventure into the realm of supernatural world
requires your sitting down to prosper your soul first so that your life can prosper along that's all it takes and when he was come into his own company he taught them in their synagogue in so much that they were astonished and said whence has this man this wisdom and these mighty works matthew 13 verse 54 every mighty work that people talk about today in the kingdom answered directly to this wisdom which is the correct application of the revelations of life as contained in this book when you walk in the wisdom of financial prosperity you will end up in mighty finances when you walk in the wisdom of divine health you will live in mighty health and when you walk in the wisdom of marriage covenant you will have mighty peace in your home it is not luck it is not chance nor is it connection it is light when you walk in that light you enforce first the miraculous it's not money the word seed is what controls all forms of increase in our human endeavors in the kingdom not your money abraham only heard the word of god acted upon it and prospered by it there was no monetary transaction involved but money came out of that obedience now the lord had said unto abram get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that i will show thee and i will make of thee a great nation and i will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing genesis 12 verse 1 to 2 and the bible says so abram departed as the lord had spoken unto him and lot went with him and abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of haran and genesis 13 verse 2 records and abram was very rich in cattle in silver and in gold it's just for acting on the word of god he received the word he applied himself to it and he prospered no one should be confused about god's basis for prospering his people the word not money is the platform upon which we prospered in the word every time you talk about prosperity and god's blessings you talk about the word of god that is applied to produce them in deuteronomy 28 god said and it shall come to pass if thou shalt diligently hearken to the voice of the lord your god not and it shall come to pass if you shall diligently give offerings he goes on to say these blessings shall come on thee and over take thee you shall be blessed in the city you shall be blessed outside the city you shall lend always and shall never borrow you shall be the head and not the tail you shall be above only you shall never be beneath all that for doing what for diligently hearkening to his word and putting it to work so god's word is a covenant platform for prosperity it is word encounter that guarantees access into kingdom wealth everywhere you see god talk about about prosperity the word of god is the basis it is the all controlling seed luke 8 verse 11 tells us now the seed is the word of god now the lord god had said unto abram so abram departed did you see where it said and abraham gave offerings jesus said therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them i will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock 
Matthew 7 verse 24. Your unreserved response to God's word is your highway to kingdom prosperity. What did Abraham do? He received the seed and the seed prospered in the ground of his heart. Everywhere you see God talk about prosperity. The word of God is the foundation. When you respond with excitement to every demand of scripture, whatsoever you do, it shall prosper. You can then say, now the parable of prosperity is this. The seed is the word of God. When the seed of the word of God and prosperity, such as your encountering in this book, falls on the good ground of your heart and you respond appropriately to it, you explode in kingdom prosperity without sweat. The word of God is God's eternal seed that controls all forms of increase in all realms of life. For your health to prosper, you have to prosper in revelations on health. For your home to be peaceful, harmonious, and pleasant, you have to prosper in revelations of the word of God on marriage. For finances to multiply and increase in your hand, you have to prosper in revelations of the word concerning finances. This is because he upholds all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1 verse 3 Every increase in your life answers to the quality of the seed in your heart. So prosperity is what seed determined, not money seed determined. It is word burn, not cash created. People have forgotten the seed and are dancing around with seeds. It is the seed that controls the overall increase of any man in every area of life. The seed is not your money. Now, the seed is the word of God. I didn't see money written anywhere in Deuteronomy 28, neither in Job 22 verse 21. Acquaint now thyself with him, and be at peace, thereby good shall come unto thee. Did it say, give him now your money, and thereby good shall come unto thee? Many are in a trade by battle worship with God. God. Every outstanding scripture on prosperity doesn't dwell on money. God does not prosper you on the grounds of cash. He prospers you on the grounds of the light in which you are walking. Receive, I pray thee, the law. Job 22 verse 22. This book of the law, Joshua 1 verse 8. When I found the word on prosperity that destroyed poverty in my life, I didn't have a dime in any account count anywhere. But that was the day I knew I couldn't ever be poor. And I announced it all around. I can never be poor. Every demon heard me. Everyone preaching against prosperity gives offering but have never seen any financial miracle in their lives. This is because what causes your money seed to produce is the word seed that is operational in you. Locate the scent. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of his and bring glad tidings of good things. Romans 10 verse 14 to 15. The cheapest way to prosperity is to seek people who are sent with that message. People who have proofs that it works. Locate the scent and camp around his message. It is in that message that you will have an encounter. You can read your Bible from now till Jesus comes and still not get a light from it. But locate a man whom God has sent. Camp around him. Begin to swallow his words and you will 
will soon find something that will lose you from the chains of poverty. I'm saying in essence that apart from your direct personal effort in locating these things in scriptures, also locate men who are sent to enlighten the world in such areas as you have in need of a breakthrough and then come around them until it happens for you. You remember my encounter with prosperity? It started when I heard the testimony of the Copelands and believed it. I then went out on a three-day search for the light that would give me the same testimony armed with their books. I wanted to find out what prosperity really meant because their testimony was very profound and outstanding and I believed it was of God. I had never met them. You can't give what you don't have. Acts 3 verse 6 says, such as I have give I thee. For instance, I don't bother reading books on church growth written by people who are not pastoring any church. This is because they don't have anything to give to you, only theories. God has sent people in different areas. Locate those sent in the area of your need. The Bible tells us that Uzziah the king sought God in the days of Zechariah who had understanding in the visions of God. That is, as long as Uzziah sought God, according to the revelation delivered to Zechariah, God made him to prosper. Second Chronicles 26 verse 1 to 5 God has sent men in various areas of life and has given them adequate proofs to show so that people can find light by their light. The Lord sent a word into Jacob and it lighted upon Israel. Isaiah 9 verse 8 I found it through Gloria Copeland's book. A few people have found it through me and I see many more finding it through through this book. There was calamity in the days of Asha the king. There was no teaching priest then and everybody was doing what was right in their sight. Then Azariah the prophet came on the scene and Asha took courage and responded to the revelation that God gave through him. Consequently, God gave them rest round about. 2 Chronicles 15. No generation in God's creation has ever been left without sent men to provide solution to the calamities of humanity. God has always sent men and women to service the needs of creation in every generation. Many have tried to catch it on their own, but God has sent men and women to service the needs of his creation. Locate them and camp with them and you will go places. Locate material materials on prosperity swim in them and you will be up see this lady's testimony before we started attending this church we had financial problems when we started worshiping here we heard about giving and we started giving but there was no result i then went to one of the pastors for counseling he told me to read one of the bishop's books covenant wealth my husband and i read the book and we discovered why we had not been seeing results in our giving. The reason was that we had been giving towards our own needs, not to the kingdom of God. We then asked for forgiveness from God. That same week, miracles started in our lives. My husband was on a salary of 1,200 naira per month. But after reading the book, he had to leave the job. Immediately, God gave him another job. Someone called him to interpret English for him. My husband is a Frenchman and can't speak English very well. But this man called him to interpret English for him. The man gave him 9,400 naira for his efforts that week. That same man again said, you are a good man. You are a Christian. You will now represent our company here in Nigeria. That was not all. God then made a way for us to get money without struggling. God showed my husband the way to get money without serving under anybody. He now gets a minimum of 1,000 
her day. Also, since we got married, he had been looking for a house because we had been living in my father's house. But the following week, a brother called my husband and told him to go and look for a house that he would give him the money to pay for three years rent. Another person called him again and told him to look for a house that the money to pay for it was ready. Now, about three different people want to pay for a house for us. They are the ones now hasting us off to go and get a house. Yochchi, see, Mrs. You seek to find. He that seeketh findeth. Matthew 7 verse 8. Riches and honor are with the word of God. Let's conclude like this. Therefore, the parable of prosperity is this. The seed is the word of God, no matter what you give, until the seed of the word is in place. There is no future for your money seed. The water dimension of the word. Let's quickly look at this other side of the word paul said i have planted apollos watered but god gave the increase first corinthians 3 verse 6 let's take the money you give as a seed and the word of god as the water tell me what is your seed in the ground worth without water death for you to see the importance of the word of god for your increase let's bring out god's word in its water dimension that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Ephesians 5 verse 26. God's word is water. That means no matter what you sow as seed, it has to be watered with the word before God can bring the increase. You want prosperity? Make sure you catch the necessary word that will open you up to the wealth of the kingdom. God is determined to prosper the end time church because you're part of that church. God has programmed to prosper you. All you need to do is to make it happen. How do you make it happen? Go all out for the word. When you flourish in the word, you're bound to flourish on the earth. Chapter 11 Faith are covenant access but without faith it is impossible to please god hebrews 11 verse 6 did it say but without offerings it is impossible to please god but the just shall live by his faith habakkuk 2 verse 4 the just shall not live by his offerings how does god bless while the earth remaineth seed time and harvest shall not cease genesis 8 verse 22 hitherto everybody goes straight to conclude that seed here means money it is inconclusive but it is not the whole issue you have earlier been able to establish what that seed primarily represents the word of god while god's word opens us up to prosperity the faith that we put in is what makes it to deliver that is god's word is the covenant platform for our prosperity and faith is our covenant access into it and blessed is she that believed for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the lord luke 1 verse 45 no blessing of god can be delivered to you without faith for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them but the word preached did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it hebrews 4 verse 2 so it's one thing to have the word it's another thing to mix it with faith on your inside until that happens it does not deliver for without faith it is impossible to please god it was by it that the elders obtained a good report so you don't obtain good reports without faith this is the reason the enemy keeps attacking the teachings on prosperity because he knows that until you hear it and hear it 
faith will not come. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. 1 John 5 verse 4 The word of God, when mixed with faith, provides access to everything that the word promises. It's important, therefore, for us to know what faith is. Evidence of faith. Faith is not, I agree, that's consent. Faith is not mental assent. Faith is an active living force. It is something that controls your attitude and your actions as you allow the word you have encountered to direct and control you. God said to Abraham, Get thee out to a land that I will show you. And so Abraham departed because that word from God had taken control of his entire being. If it were mere mental agreement, he would have sat down first to begin to organize his departure. But the Bible says, and so Abram departed. How do I know when faith is at work? Your actions. Shew me thy faith without thy works, and I will shew thee my faith by my works. James 2 verse 18. The word translated works here means action. Show me your faith without your actions, and I will show you my faith by my actions. Abraham believed God. So everything God told him to do, he was on the move immediately. Get thee out of thy country. And so Abram departed. At another time, God said to him, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Genesis 22 verse 2. And again we see Abraham's response. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Friend, faith is not taking down notes and doing nothing about it. That's theology, not faith. That's theocracy. God, I agree. I'm under your government after all. Show me your faith with your actions. Somebody who has heard. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needed not be ashamed. Second Timothy 2 verse 15. But who is not studying is simply planning shame for himself unknowingly. You have heard. Bring ye all the time into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith say yet the lord of hosts if i will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out of blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it all you do is to only thank God for the message, but don't pay your tithe, or you give offerings grumbling from leftover change from Coca-Cola. You certainly don't know the meaning of what you have heard. You hear the word that says, Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. You agree, but do nothing about it. That's not faith. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Your actions betray you. It's your actions that tell whether you believe what God has said or not. The Lord is a God of knowledge. And by him actions are weighed. First Samuel 2 verse 3. God weighs actions. That was Hannah speaking. The Bible tells us that after her encounter with Eli in chapter 1, where he told her, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Hannah went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. That was faith in action. So God visited her, and she came up with that prophecy. God weighs your actions to prove your faith. Your actions either betrays or authenticates your claim of faith. When your action is negative, it only betrays you before God. Faith is an active living force. 
when it gets into a man, it turns him on. I got home one day and my wife announced to me I had a miscarriage. I said to her, that cannot happen. Can I have my food, please? That was the final word said on that issue. No further discussion, no prayer, no opportunity for explanations. The pregnancy was sustained by the force of faith and ended up in our first son, David Jr. For this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. All this, your sluggish religious motions in response to God's word is a proof that the thing hasn't entered you. Some say, nobody knows tomorrow, but I know the one who knows tomorrow, and I am following him, so my tomorrow is sure. I'm glad to let you know that your God knows your end from the beginning. Faith is an active living force that controls its possessor. It's an active living force that controls your mentality. When you're the one monitoring it, it's no longer faith. God told Moses, go forward. Was it to go and drown in the Red Sea, but he was under the influence of faith. So he went forward. As he stretched forth his hand, the sea divided. Friend, faith has evidence. It is in your action. God told me, the laborer is worthy of his wages. So if I must earn wages in this kingdom, I can't be an overseer or a supervisor. I have to be a laborer. I then decided to remain a laborer so that my wages will never cease. I work and work and all my co-laborers know that I have a covenant with the work. I'll never step out on the platform without preparation. Otherwise, I will end up in shame. I'm a worker, so I'm worthy of his hire. When God pays you, you know it's something really big. When you are not acting according to the word you have heard, you are not in faith. For every word you believe, there must be a corresponding action to prove that you actually believe it. So if you do believe the word of financial prosperity, your actions will prove whether you actually believe it. God is a God of knowledge by whom actions are weighed. Abraham said, I know God can raise up children for me from stones. He took Isaac to go and slay him. That's faith in action. Your utterance. The second evidence of faith is utterance. When God was telling Joshua of his program to prosper him, he first of all charged him concerning his utterance. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Joshua 1 verse 8. Watch a man speak and you can tell what the future holds for him in the kingdom. You can't talk lack, for instance, and stumble into plenty. No way. You can't talk once and enjoy divine supplies. Because Mark 11 verse 24 says, You shall have whatsoever you say. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13, We have the same spirit of faith. According as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. So what you have believed, you naturally speak. Faith is expressed in words, not just by the words you speak to other people, but even the ones you speak to yourself. The words you speak either count for you or against you. Everything in life answers to what you say. In the school of faith, your tongue draws the conclusion, but your tongue answers to the content of your heart because it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. That's why God is stuffing your heart with the matters so that your tongue will never run dry of the truth that refreshes and prospers. 
one of the laws of the spirit of life is the law of right speaking that functions according to the content of your heart every seed sower is a prosperous citizen of the kingdom if only his mouth allows him to get it let faith be in your mouth then you shall make your way prosperous and you shall have good success obedience what is the connection between faith and covenant wealth it is simply obedience that is walking in obedience to what the covenant demands when you walk in practical obedience to the terms of the covenant you are in faith and it will always produce for you samuel speaking to saul in first samuel 15 verse 22 said to him behold to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams obedience will always lead to prosperity if they obey and serve him they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures job 36 verse 11 the conclusion of the whole matter is be willing and obedient and you will eat the good of the land isaiah 1 verse 19 that is faith in its practical terms faith is not in confessing it but is professing it confession is mere talk of the mouth profession is your actual practical commitment and involvement paul said holding fast the profession of our faith it is faithful that promised hebrews 10 verse 23 we've talked so much about confession now let's go to the mother of confession profession confession is only one of its children profession is your stepping out to walk it the way god has commanded it when a miracle was needed at the marriage in cana of galilee mary the mother of jesus told the servant whatever he said unto you do it john 2 verse 5 that is the master key to the miraculous don't recite it don't cram it but do it every time you begin to respond to the word of god things begin to happen for you i say things begin to happen for you right now our adventure into kingdom prosperity requires that we lay hold on this mystery of faith so prosperity can become real in our lives faith is it it's our covenant access into kingdom prosperity and blessed is she that believed for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the lord luke 1 verse 45 so there is no performance until faith is in place faith is what triggers of performance from heaven your faith is what determines the events of your life chapter 12 increase answers to impute for the seed shall be prosperous the vine shall give her fruit and the ground shall give her increase and the heavens shall give their due and i will cause the remnants of this people to possess all these things zechariah 8 verse 12 prosperity is impossible without seed while the earth remaineth seed time and harvest shall not cease genesis 8 verse 22 the covenant anchors on seed time and harvest god is not mocked says galatians 6 verse 7 for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap the covenant of prosperity hinges on the mystery of seed time and harvest it is this law that brings you into an encounter with the power to get wealth deuteronomy 8 verse 18 for as the rain cometh down 
and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. Isaiah 55 verse 10 Seed time precedes harvest. It is not harvest that determines the seed, but the seed determines the harvest. First, he gives seed to the sower, and then bread to the eater. It's not bread to the eater from which he will take the seed. No, it is the seed that generates the bread. Until this is understood, you will remain at the same level. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Second Corinthians 9 verse 10 Did you see that? He ministers seed to the sower, so that food can come forth, and seed multiplies. Seed to the sower first, and then bread will come out of it, and inside that bread is multiplied seed. Ask any farmer, and he will tell you that the seed time is prepared for from the current harvest. He looks at his yams and picks out the fattest of them all and keeps them away in the barn for the next planting season. The small boys who lack understanding of the farming laws want those fat ones home as they're the pride of the harvest season. But the father knows better. He says to himself, for me to get the size of harvest next year, I must put the size of yam aside for replanting. Wise farming demands that you prepare yourself for the next harvest season. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Proverbs 3 verse 9 to 10. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Second Corinthians 9 verse 8. That's talking about riches. What do you do with your riches? Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. 1 Timothy 6 verse 17 Paul is here talking about sowing financial seed to create room for our financial harvest. Seed time and harvest shall not cease. God is committed to increase only where seed is found. The scriptures cannot be broken. When you attempt to break the unbreakable, you are broken. What prospers is your seed. No one ever sees increase without first putting in his seed. When there's no seed, there's no prosperity. Zechariah 8 verse 12 As you see the day exchanging position with the night, then know that the covenant of God, the covenant of increase, remains intact. It anchors on one truth, seed time before harvest. Chapter 13 Financial Integrity Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 14 verse 34 You still remember Job's story, a man that feared God and eschewed evil, a perfect man. And this man was lifted by God until he became the greatest man in all the East. What was his qualification? He stood strong on the foundation of God, the fear of of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9 verse 10. What is wisdom? Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. Matthew 7 verse 24. Now if the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, then the fear of God is the foundation that makes your acting 
on the word of God to produce. Job's testimony shows us that you don't have to be crooked to get to the topmost top. Nothing corrupts more than money in today's world. People scheming to play out one another. When the Bible said, fight the good fight of faith, it's talking about money. You must fight financial corruption or you die in it. The Bible says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. First Timothy 6 verse 12. That means money is wrestling against eternal life in your life. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. 1 Timothy 6 verse 6 to 7 and verse 10 to 12 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. In other words, I'm telling you, it's a fight. It's a battle. Financial corruption is a deadly attack from hell. Jesus once said to a man, this is money. This is heaven. Choose one. And the man said, I take money. Or how else would you explain that account in Mark 10 verse 17 to 25? Jesus told him, Sell all you have and give to the poor and you have eternal life. But he said, no, I don't want eternal life. I want eternal money. He signed for suicide because of money. Say with me, Lord, keep me financially sane. Baptize me into your kind of integrity. Let not money corrupt my destiny. Lord, help me to retain this eternal life all the days of my life. There was a man called Jacob. This man sent his sons to Egypt to go and buy food. Joseph, finding out that they were his brothers, put back their money in their bags. The Bible tells us that Jacob sent back that money. Genesis 43 verse 12. Integrity guarantees plenty. All our covenant fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were people of integrity. Who then do you look like? playing pranks on account of money. There's nothing in money to warrant anybody dying and laying his life on the line for. Many people need to be delivered from the bondage of financial corruption. Such people, when they see money, their bodies begin to vibrate. Their nerves are no longer at rest. You hide money from your wife. You hide money from your husband. What for? Listen to me. You don't love money to get it. You love God to be blessed. Lovers of money get lost or lovers of God get increasingly blessed. Tomorrow is fantastic. All you need to do is to live right today. If you live right today, you secure a future for yourself and for generations coming after you. Don't sell off your destiny. No, it's too dangerous to your soul. If you remember Judas and Gehazi, you won't do that. To buy something in your office and tender a forged receipt, you're already under the chains of financial corruption. Why must you tie your destiny down? You don't have to. It takes financial integrity to enjoy financial plenty. Practical Righteousness and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, 
and as in former years. Malachi 3 verse 3 to 4. Why? Look at verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Before he spoke about giving, he first of all talked about the refining of the saints. That's talking about our need for righteousness before our seed can be pleasant and acceptable to him. Practical righteousness is a principal requirement in the school of prosperity. Your yeah must be yeah and your nay, nay, no matter the cost it places on you, that's practical righteousness. Until your offering is acceptable to God, it holds no benefits for you. Do you know that Jesus came and put a stamp on that? He said, if you bring your offering to the altar and you remember that there's a problem between you and your brother back at home don't drop the offering first go back home and sort things out and then come drop your offering otherwise it's a waste matthew 5 verse 23 to 24 my prayer is that you will practically deal with the things that won't let your offerings be pleasant unto the lord the lord was speaking to me from second chronicles 15 the bible says that there was no law and no teaching priest. Everyone was doing what was right in his sight. So there was great devastation upon all the inhabitants of the land. When you're without law, you'll get into trouble. Nature is governed by laws. To be lawless is to be lifeless. When the first man, Adam, was put in the garden, there was a law to guard his destiny. When he broke that law, his destiny was destroyed. Genesis 3 life without law is deadly and chaotic it is colorless let's enjoy the laws of god things don't just work anyhow there is divine order in our relationship with god when that order is embraced your life becomes colorful christianity is not lawless living somebody may say we're no longer under the law no we're not but we're free from one law to get under the order there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in christ jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death romans 8 verse 1 to 2 one law sets you free from another nature harbors vacuum to be lawless is to be lifeless watch every schema he keeps losing weight while the righteous keeps flourishing what god has for you no smartness of yours can get it for you so yield your life to him for you never get stranded with righteousness unto the upright there arises light in the darkness psalm 112 verse 4 there is no embarrassment for the righteous in the kingdom there is always a way of escape there is always a future for the righteous when you respond to his righteousness god responds to you by filling your treasures proverbs 8 verse 18 to 21 who will inherit substance the people who who follow the way of righteousness and the paths of judgment who will god fill up his treasures the man who is filled with the righteousness of god blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled matthew 5 verse 6 now in the name of jesus i command everything that is set on your way to corrupt your destiny to drop off you right now be free from that chain of bondage in the name of jesus i would like you to consciously plead the blood of jesus for your total freedom and deliverance from every form of financial corruption the god that lifted joseph in the land of captivity on the tickets of integrity will lift you to the god 
that lifted Daniel in the land of bondage on the grounds of purity will lift you. The God that lifted Job in the midst of sin on the grounds of integrity and purity will lift you. Integrity shall preserve you. Righteousness shall exalt you. Purity shall deliver plenty into your hands in the precious name of Jesus. Part 4. How God Prospers. Seven Pillars of Kingdom Prosperity. Chapter 14. Giving. The way God prospers is different from the way the world prospers. What the world calls prosperity is how much you have. But in the kingdom of God, prosperity is determined by how much you give. In this chapter, you're going to be looking at four dimensions of giving. Giving is living. No matter how delicious the food you have eaten may be, there's a maximum number of hours it should stay in your stomach. After that period, it becomes poisonous to your body. Even if you had dinner with the president of America and you feel like keeping the food in your stomach as a souvenir, after some time, the food turns acidic and must leave your body or you'll be in danger of ending up in the grave. The joy of eating is in giving out, i.e. passing out waste. When what is going in is not going out at all, you become a source of concern. And if something is not done quickly to evacuate your boils, they might as well start digging your grave. God's word is four-dimensional principles, reproofs, correction, and instructions. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 Many like the principles, but very few enjoy the instructions. In the school of prosperity, there is a law. Job 22 verse 21 And then there are the principles that help the law to produce maximally. Now, let's consider one very vital instruction in the school of prosperity. Tighten. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now here with saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruits before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Malachi 3 verse 10 to 12. This commandment is the master key to financial miracles. Titan is an inescapable covenant obligation. No one escapes poverty when they do not pay their tithes because they come under a curse. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Malachi 3 verse 8 to 9. So, no matter how much you give, once your tithe is out of place, the curse still remains. Titan is an inescapable covenant obligation. Prosperity is impossible without Titan because when you're not paying your tithe, you're under a financial curse. Titan has been in existence before the law of Moses came. Abraham paid tithe of all to Melchizedek. Genesis 14 verse 20. Jacob covenanted the tenth of all his treasures to God. Genesis 28 verse 22. All these took place long before Moses came and brought the law. The law only came to help us appreciate how to do it. What is tithe? The tithe of your income is not yours. That's where to start from. 
so you don't give the tithe you only give that which is yours and all the tithe of the land whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the lord's it is holy unto the lord leviticus 27 verse 30 that's why god was saying in malachi 3 verse 8 ye have robbed me that will be a wrong word for god to use if the tithe wasn't his the tenth part or the ten percent of whatever comes to you as income is not yours it belongs to god and concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock even of whatsoever passeth under the rod the tent shall be holy unto the lord leviticus 27 verse 32 also god's word stipulates that if for any reason you spend or eat part of that 10 percent god will charge you because it belongs to him and if a man will at all redeem out of his tithe he shall add hitherto the fifth part thereof leviticus 27 verse 31 tithing is therefore inescapable you either give it willingly to him or he collects it by charging you to his court men do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his soul when he is hungry but if he be found he shall restore sevenfold he shall give all the substance of his house proverbs 6 verse 30 to 31 it is not possible to steal from the all-seeing god and not be caught please understand that pay your tithing doesn't enrich god it is in order for you to secure your covenant destiny with him prosperity is impossible without tithing the tithe is not yours so there's nothing to celebrate over when you pay it do you celebrate that you pay your tax nobody asks you whether you're interested in paying your tax or not it's your civic responsibility even so is the payment of your tithe your covenant responsibility as a citizen of the kingdom to be lawless is to be lifeless nature is guided by laws the first man adam was created in the center of prosperity but his destiny in it was to be guided by a law that says the day you eat of this tree you will die likewise when you eat your tithe you begin to die financially you move but nothing moves you work and work but nothing works you run but nothing is accomplished do you want a financial testimony then obey the financial laws of god the tithe of all your income is the lord's don't touch it it's dangerous to eat up your tithe don't try it every other offering answers on the earth but the tithe answers in heaven tithe has a heavenly transaction link which guarantees you the opening of the windows of heaven when your tithe answers and your harvest is due the heavens open unto you titan is your god-given privilege to establish your destiny of prosperity sickness has no right to touch you when you're under this covenant of titan accidents and misfortune have no right to affect you either because god has committed himself he said bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith say yet the lord of hosts if i will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it and i will rebuke the devourer for your sakes and it shall not destroy the fruits of your ground neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field say yet the lord of hosts malachi 3 verse 10 11 unlike in verse 8 offering is not mentioned here because 
What brings you under this covenant is your tithe. Any other offering you give is according to what God has blessed you with. But this one is defined. Bring ye all the tithes. If you've been suffering under this curse, you have here a wonderful opportunity to come to yourself like the prodigal son did and return home. The home of beauty, comfort, fulfillment, and refreshing. Don't let the devil will strip you naked god said prove me now if i will not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a refreshing that you won't have room enough to contain he said he will rebuke the devourers for your sake and make your laughter a permanent one friend you can't outsmart god the devourers have tormented you enough so whatever he tells you to do do it when aura roberts was on his dying bed as a teenager he said to his mother i have some tights there in my suit pocket help me go and drop it in the church i don't want to get into heaven owing god that was how tuberculosis dropped off his life the devourer will no longer have access to you as your heart is turning back to god every evil will begin to turn away from you when tithing becomes your practice life will give you its best take cover from the devourer by entering into the covenant of titan he will be far from you as the east is from the west god has overlooked the time of ignorance but now he commands every man everywhere to repent jesus said if therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon who will commit to your trust the true riches luke 16 verse 11 so what you do with your carnal wealth determines how much of the true wealth you have access to there is what is called the true riches of god it is the sorrow free sickness free failure free trouble free confusion free frustration and depression free blessings you're just free free spirit soul and body that is the true riches of god titan does not only guarantee you a blessing it also establishes an insurance against the wicked arrows of life I see you escape every such arrows from now on in Jesus name. Titan is our master key to prosperity. We saw it in Abraham, Jacob, and we have it in the law of Moses. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 23 verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the way here matters of the law judgment mercy and faith these ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone jesus is here putting his stamp on titan it is obligatory for your covenant birthright to be realized if you're not a titer things won't stop being tight for you why the windows of heaven will remain shut and you know that it's the blessing of the lord coming from those windows that make rich so when the windows are shut you remain poor i would like you to know that everybody pays tight one way or the other why no one steals from god without being caught but we find out that very few pay willingly to the right source while devourers are sent to collect from quite a lot of people who won't pay theirs willingly hospital bill today car breakdown tomorrow accident here business failure there it's the devourer at work no one survives the curse of god god said the man who robs him of his tight is cursed with a curse let's stop sweating and let's reach out and take the sweets of life Titan is the only way to keep the windows of heaven open the moment you're set to do it god is committed and when you begin to do it god begins to fulfill his part you want a 
financial miracle then whatever he tells you to do do it what is he saying bring ye all your tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house tithe is not optional it's obligatory it is a master key to the world of prosperity until you pay your tithe the devourers are permitted by god to operate in any way they want in your life what happens to your tithe for this melchizedek king of salem priest of the most high god who met abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him to whom also abraham gave a tenth part of all first being by interpretation king of righteousness and after that also king of salem which is king of peace without father without mother without descent having neither beginning of days nor end of life but made like unto the son of god abided a priest continually now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch abraham gave the tent of the spoils and verily they that are of the sons of levi who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithe of the people according to the law that is of their brethren though they come out of the loins of abraham but he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of abraham and blessed him that had the promises and without all contradiction the less is blessed of the better and here men that die receive tithes but there he received them for whom it is witnessed that he liveth hebrews 7 verse 1 to 8 that's talking about jesus christ so it is not your church that receives the tithe for jesus who receives it up there there is a book of record with him in heaven for there he received them he receives your tithe by himself this should steer you up for a change of heart in your attitude to titan let me say here that everyone including pastors pay tithes and as i may say so levy also who received tithe paid tithes in abraham hebrews 7 verse 9 some pastors just sit down and expect people to give them things no even the levites who by law received tithes of their brethren also paid tithes like abraham because they were all abraham's seed outstanding testimonies abound around the world to prove that titus are the wisest men of the kingdom a man called robert ladlaw a new zealand businessman drew up a strategy for his tithe payment which started with 10 percent saying lord as you increase this business i will increase my tithe by this drawing up a graduated skill by which he would increase his tithe he did it giving increased share to the lord as he enjoyed more success in his business from the 10 percent he increased it to 30 40 and 50 he said god seems to be saying to me since i have been taken into partnership in this business i am committed to bless it he rose on the wings of tithes and became a world figure there's this other man called john lang he was managing a small family business in britain that business grew to become the largest construction company in britain by reason of his committed adherence to the principles of giving these are not 18th century stories they are current life stories i see jesus touch you and do something unique in your life as you walk in obedience to his commandments giving is very well defined in the scriptures the one that opens you up to heaven's riches which has no substitute is called tithe every other thing happens after bring ye all the tithes don't let any devil confuse you the tent of every increase that comes your way is not your own don't mix it up with yours instead of waiting 
looking for. After one month, I'll pay it. Pay it as often as the increase comes your way and you'll be free. Remember, there's a record on you up there. When that record is in place, the blessing will answer. It is the blessing of God that makes rich and adds no sorrow with it. It's time to cease from your own understanding. You won't see sorrows anymore. Many like to collect prayers. Only very few like to comply with instructions. But nobody can pray God's blessings upon you when his own blessings from you are not going up to him. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. One key thing he's saying to you right now is do tighten and things will start being tight for you. Do it now. Begin today. Not as a law but in a loving response to his instructions don't look at your tithe and say let's quickly rush and use it for something first before we pay the tithe no don't touch what should not be touched otherwise you pay for it when you keep the accursed thing you are destroyed by it you will not be destroyed god has given you the whole ten but says give me one of it remember he is the god that said without me ye can do nothing he also said vain is the help of man so every help you have received came from him everybody who has shown you favor did so because god commanded it so god is the one doing it he is the one helping you to play your own part at the end of the day he says you take nine send me one retain your name on my covenant register you now say god hold on i need all the ten for now hold on for just about three months i'll see you shortly friend you can't outsmart god the simple instruction is one of the things that make for outstanding results in the kingdom paul said in second corinthians 11 verse 3 but i fear lest by any means as a serpent be guided if through his thoughts so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in christ don't now begin to turn the instructions this way and that way in your mind saying you mean it's only tight that i would pay and things would just turn for me when i had all the ten it didn't work when i now give out one from it what will the remaining do for me didn't they say that a bird in hand is worth two in the bush nothing makes a fool more than to say god is not relevant nothing makes a greater fool more than to look at heaven and say god i don't think you understand this situation lord i need all of it hear me nobody has a stable and continuous financial testimony without being a tighter an addicted one at that do it naturally not as a law but in love god said return unto me and i will return unto you they said wherein shall we return and he said in tithes and offerings let me say this in conclusion tithe is not your uncle's it's not your mother's nor your brother's it is the lord's and it shall be holy unto the lord tithing is an inescapable covenant obligation so don't try to escape it why you are not actually giving it is god's part of your earnings don't take it don't eat it don't touch it anyone who despises tithing signs in for poverty lack and want don't it's not safe i see a bright future ahead of you kingdom promotion givings this is another type of giving and it includes your free will offerings and your kingdom demands offerings the free will offering is as you will jesus referring to it in matthew 5 verse 23 said therefore if thou bring thy gift to the altar so there is what you bring to the altar each time you come to church in deuteronomy 16 verse 
16 to 17 we read three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the lord thy god in the place which he shall choose in the feast of unleavened bread and in the feast of weeks and in the feast of tabernacles and they shall not appear before the lord empty every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the lord thy god which he hath given thee first corinthians 16 verse 2 says upon the first day of the week let every one of you lay by him in store as god has prospered him that there be no gatherings when i come so at no time should you come before the lord empty-handed this is not titan it is free will offerings aimed at the promotion of god's kingdom note that it says every man shall give not some men shall give if you're not a giver no fasting no prayers nor prophecy can rescue you from being a beggar giving is an every man's responsibility and everyone's privilege saying i don't have before the lord is a self-inflicted curse don't put that curse on your life once the man of god kenneth copeland was at a meeting and there was nothing in his hand to give as offering when the offering basket came to him he simply took off the buttons on his suit and dropped them as offering many years ago i said to the lord i don't have any cash in my hand to give as offering what happens today i have to give something so i woke up very early in the morning and went to sweep the church so that whatever god would have paid whosoever was to have swept the church will be my offering to him never come before him empty it's an abuse of privilege giving to the poor what you don't give to the lord is covenant foolishness it has to be in order you're not a philanthropist somebody has a need yes but what goes from me to the needy will never match what goes from me to god because my destiny is not in the hands of the needy i'm an intelligent distributor i'm not a waster free will offering is coming before the lord with something to appreciate his good hand upon your life according to how he has blessed you kingdom demands offerings or sacrifices is like god saying to abraham bring me your son your only son isaac whom you love and sacrifice him to me every such sacrifice is god's covenant device for your supernatural lifting and moses spoke unto all the congregation of the children of israel saying this is the thing which the lord commanded saying take ye from among you an offering unto the lord exodus 35 verse 4 to 5 this is a kingdom demand offering the things you do for the kingdom's sake by the reason of kingdom demands that you're privileged to encounter they are the kingdom demands for the promotion of god's work on the earth this is the thing with the lord commanded that's where sacrifices come in of course you know that whatsoever you give for the kingdom's sake comes back to you a hundredfold manifold more in this present time and in the time to come life everlasting matthew 19 verse 29 mark 10 29 to 30 luke 13 29 to 30 whatever you let go for the kingdom's sake jesus said it is an investment it will surely come back to you in multiplied forms every sacrifice that is done of a willing heart naturally leads to a divine and supernatural encounter it must be wholeheartedly given with excitement and cheerfulness you will always be sure 
of an encounter for increase that way. Please enjoy giving. It's the cheapest way to enjoy living. Whatever you have is never enough until God is there. As long as the prophet was in the house of the widow, the flower didn't finish. You need a personal encounter and a personal testimony in order to subdue the trials of life. When we were to start church planting, there was a great need for money, but the offerings that came in were inadequate. It was an opportunity for me. As I sat down discussing the matter with God, he said to me, my son, give me that your car. I knew it was God speaking to me. When I told my wife what the Lord had told me, she simply said, praise the Lord. That was it. So I called one of my staff and ordered him to drive it straight to the car dealer and let it go. It was a Mercedes-Benz 280. From that moment, the car left my heart, my mind, and my head. I was so excited. I felt very privileged. After that sacrifice, I was going home one day when the Lord said to me, My son David, even if you don't want to be rich, it's too late. God swore to me the way he swore to Abraham in Genesis. Genesis 22. When God makes a kingdom demand on you, it is so he can add color to your destiny. It is his secret way of promoting you. So respond with excitement and understanding. Abraham jumped at that demand and God jumped in to lift him. He became the possessor of the human race. Genesis 22 verse 12, 15 to 18. As you keep dreaming kingdom dreams, your business and career can't be doomed. Every kingdom demand is a covenant device for your lifting, so jump at it. A brother shared this testimony in church. Before the last business fellowship, I was sitting in the sanctuary, and as the bishop was preaching, I heard the voice say, My son, beautify my altar before the victory celebration. I immediately went to one of the pastors and told him what I heard. He said I should go ahead. The following day, I went ahead to do what God told me to do. Then I started swimming in business worth millions of naira. I'm now swimming in a 2.44 million naira. Also, before the victory celebration, there was a property I paid 155,000 naira for, but it became a tussle between my client lawyer and myself. So I told my lawyer, I have a God and he is always by my side. I told him I wasn't taking any case to court because I know the God I serve. That if my bishop had never failed, I don't see me being a failure. Just last week, I was called upon and the man that had been tussling with me for this property now started pleading with me to come and have my property back. David, okay. As long as your kingdom dreams remain aflame, that your business can never be doomed. Just keep doing it with excitement, joy and gratitude to God. Giving for kingdom's sake establishes great destinies for people. When you respond to his demand with excitement, God swears a blessing on you. When God swears, the battle is over. After he swore to Abraham, he ended up this way. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Genesis 24 verse 1. That's the same way you end your journey on earth. In Jesus' name, it shall be said concerning you and your family that God has blessed you in everything. Plan your givings. An enterprise is built by wise planning. Proverbs 24 verse 3 TLB. God is a planner and he believes in planning. Your offerings must not be haphazardly done. They should be planned and properly 
programmed plan you're given because you are investing in heaven don't just bring out any amount carelessly from your pockets and drop in the offering basket and at the end of the month you can't tell how much you have given no somebody into whose hands god will deliver millions can't be doing such haphazard giving god is a planner so let's go ahead and be like him in planning plan your expenditure plan your investment walk sensibly in the covenant you're the easiest man to be cheated if you're not a planner but if you're a kingdom planner you won't have problems you will give with excitement and not with apprehension ask the lord to help you remain a resourceful covenant planner in all your financial dealings at home at work in your business in your employment program so you don't go and employ people you don't need and pay them money you didn't have to pay I curse every form of waste in your life now. As you enter into this covenant of abundance, may all the needs of your life find an answer. Giving to the prophets. Another kind of giving is giving to the prophets. Jesus introduced us to this ministry. He that giveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Matthew 10 verse 41. Prophets are God's anointed messengers sent to be a blessing to us everything you give to god's prophets attracts prophetic rewards because they are messengers of god so we provoke prophetic utterances from them with the prophets offering we give to them prophets are spiritual fathers so when you touch their hearts you provoke a release of blessings you remember isaac when he was about to die he called his son esau and said to him behold now i am old i know not the day of my death now therefore take i pray thee thy weapons thy quiver and thy bow and go out to the field and take me some venison and make me savory meat such as i love and bring it to me that i may eat that my soul may bless thee before i die genesis 27 verse 2 to 4 jacob outsmarted esau and brought the venison and isaac poured out his soul to jacob in blessing also remember elisha who always poured water in the hands of elijah whom he called my father my father elisha had a natural father but elijah was his spiritual father when elijah left a double portion of his anointing came upon elisha giving to the prophets of god provokes prophetic blessings that cannot be bought with the money let us see two encounters in the scriptures that will help us appreciate the place of giving to the prophets for our prosperity the widow of zarephath the popular story of the widow of zarephath is found in first kings 17 after the brook where elijah was receiving his refreshing from dried up god said to him arise get thee to zarephath which belonged to zidon and dwell there behold i have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee so he arose and went to zarephath and when he came to the gate of the city behold the widow woman was there gathering sticks and he called to her and said fetch me i pray thee a little water in a vessel that i may drink and as she was going to fetch it he called to her and said bring me i pray thee a morsel of bread in thy hand and she said as the lord thy god liveth i have not a cake 
but a an handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise and behold i am gathering two sticks that i may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die and elijah said unto her fear not go and do as thou hast said but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me after make for thee and for thy son for thus saith yet the lord god of israel the barrel of meal shall not waste neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the lord send a rain upon the earth and she went and did according to the saying of elijah and she and he and her house did it many days and the barrel of meal wasted not neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the lord which he spake by elijah first kings 17 verse 9 to 16 look at that prophetic blessing god confirmed it the widow and her family were supernatural sustained till the end of the famine prophetic encounters you need prophetic encounters that will last you all the days of your life i was out on a major outreach in america some years ago and god blessed me in every way when i returned home the lord told me what to do with the offering i came home with it was the first time i was handling such large amount of money in dollars i took all of it no dime was it removed from it and gave it all to the man of god whom god directed me to give it to the man placed his hand on the offering and said your hand will never be dry not only that he went ahead to sow the offering back to me ever since i've never needed to rely on bta traveling allowance to go anywhere in this world since then i've always had more than enough money on me wherever i travel besides anywhere i get to money is always there waiting for me believe in the lord your god so shall ye be established believe his prophets so shall ye prosper second chronicles 20 verse 20 that was how the widow of zarephath triumphed in famine by responding positively to the word of the prophet giving to the prophets of god grants you access into the prophetic unction that they carry bringing a refreshing upon your life the shunammite woman let's see how this woman encountered god through giving to the prophet and it fell on a day that elisha passed to shunem where was a great woman and she constrained him to eat bread and so it was that as oft as he passed by he turned in thither to eat bread and she said unto her husband behold now i perceive that this is an holy man of god which passed by us continually let us make a little chamber i pray thee on the wall and let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick and it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither and it fell on a day that he came thither and he turned into the chamber and lay there and he said to gehazi his servant call this shunammite and when he had called her she stood before him and he said unto him say now unto her behold thou has been careful for us with all this care what is it to be done for thee wouldest thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host and she answered i dwell among mine own people and he said what then is to be done for her and gehazi answered verily she has no child and her husband is old and he said call her and when he had called her she stood in the door 
and he said about this season according to the time of life thou shalt embrace a son and she said nay my lord thou man of god do not lie unto thine handmaid and the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that elisha had said unto her according to the time of life second kings 4 verse 8 to 17 caring for prophets takes care of your cares so let's embrace the ministry of the prophets of god in our midst so we can manifest more of kingdom prosperity by impartation as god is committed to the things they say and their counsel isaiah 44 verse 26 this mystery is my natural practice which has helped me to connect with the things that are connected to life on one occasion the prophet of god laid hands on me and said from this day i impart to you the gift of on time before the needs arise the supplies will be waiting such utterances are stimulated by venisons such as they love god has made it possible for everyone to have at least one of such person in his life that can become his channel of prophetic liftings every prophetic blessing lasts forever when the shunammite woman's miracle child died she said i'm going to the prophet the one who said the impossible and it happened he can make it happen again she went on to lay the child on the bed she had prepared for the prophet the prophet laid on the dead child and he came back to life you can't kill of prophetic delivery friend you need to provoke something upon your life and break through all those barriers holding down your destiny when you don't have any messenger of god sent for your prosperity your case is bad somebody else must say to you be blessed one day one of the prophets of god that god linked me up with said to me i see you going 20 times more than where i stopped this came from the depth of his heart you need to provoke something in your direction let's take advantage of the prophets of god in our midst there are messengers of god sent to every generation when you identify one of them take advantage of it they don't have needs they are only agents sent to service the needs of humanity and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities mary called magdalene out of whom were seven devils and joanna the wife of shusa herod steward and susanna and many others which ministered unto him of their substance luke 8 verse 2 to 3 they were ministering to jesus the greatest prophets that ever lived out of their substance one woman poured a jar of alabaster oil on jesus's head jesus said verily i say unto you wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world there shall also this that this woman has done to be told for a memorial of her matthew 26 verse 13 everything that comes forth prophetically as a result of seeds and gifts to the prophet usually lasts everyone requires their blessing for lasting prosperity the ephesian church enjoyed the blessings of the prophet that came as a result of their giving to apostle paul now ye philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when i departed from macedonia no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving but ye only for even in thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity not because i desire a gift but i desire fruit that may abound to your account but i have all and abound i for having received of a prophetus the things which were sent from you an odor of a 
sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4 verse 15 to 19. When you're in the covenant of giving to the prophets of God, things are bound to your account. Your account keeps increasing, giving food and multiplied seed back to you. God supplies all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. All your needs. I see God turn your captivity in all areas as you key into this covenant access of prosperity. Giving to the poor. A fourth dimension of giving is giving to the poor. It would interest you to know that the poor around you is an opportunity for your rise in the kingdom. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. Deuteronomy 15 verse 11. You are either a needy or a supplier of the needs of the needy. You are either a giver or a beggar. Well thank God for the opportunity of having the poor around us. It is an additional opportunity for us to rise higher. Your name is not included among the poor that shall not cease out of the land. So why must you accept that status? Jesus also confirmed this truth in Matthew 26 verse 11. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. So the opportunity to give to the poor is an everlasting one. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he has given will he pay him again. Proverbs 19 verse 17. When you give to the poor, you're giving to him on God's behalf. You're lending to the Lord. The word of God says you're sure of getting it back. Ministering to the needs of the poor is one of God's covenant strategies for your prosperity. Proverbs 28 verse 27 Until you're concerned about the needs of the needy, your needs will never be met. I would like you to be ever ready and willing to service the needs of people. You will never suffer lack doing so. It's an interesting ministry. See this prophetic covering. Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. And he shall be blessed upon the earth. And thou will not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. Psalm 41 verse 1 to 2. The deliverance of the Lord is a thing money can't buy. Can you buy deliverance from trouble? No, but these are are the things you enjoy when you minister to the poor. That's what the Bible calls the true riches of God. When you minister to the poor, no matter how determined your enemies are, their evil plans will be punctured. Also, ministering to the poor will destroy sickness. So stop eating all your food alone and drinking all your water alone. Ministering to the poor brings you into the realm of the true riches of God. Every man in need around you is an opportunity for you to increase in your financial heights. Acts 1 verse 1 talks about the things which Jesus began to do and to teach. Anything Jesus did, he taught. He believed in tithing and so he taught it. I'm sure that because he taught it, he did it also. Jesus gave offerings too. He sat down in the sanctuary when others were bringing their offerings. He wouldn't have been sitting there if he hadn't brought his own. He gave and 
and gave until he gave his own life. Jesus also taught that whosoever gives to a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. So he believed in prophet's offering. Likewise, he was addicted to giving to the poor. In John 13 verse 27 to 29, where he said to Judas, What thou doest, do quickly. The people thought he was telling Judas, to go give something to the poor. So Jesus believed in these four dimensions of giving. That was why he had a bag of prosperity following him. I would like you to receive grace from God to enter into the four dimensions of giving. There is that scatter it and yet increase it. And there is that withholdeth more than is meet, but it tendereth to poverty. The liberal so shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. Proverbs 11 verse 24 to 25. The liberal soul, not the receiver's soul, shall be made fat. The giving soul shall be made fat. He that blesses shall be blessed in return. What you receive does not make you. What you give is what makes you. Solomon, a man who one should listen to in these matters, sounds this note of caution. There is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 13. Giving is living. If you are not a giver, you are not living. The joy of living is given, so enjoy it. As God has blessed everyone, so let him give. Animals, for instance, are in sizes, and they eat according to their sizes. When an elephant, despite all it consumes daily, begins to excrete like a cow or a cat, it's on its way to the grave. Give according to your level. Everybody is giving, yes, but many are under giving, so sickness, disease, and frustration continue as god has blessed each man so let him give god will never demand from you what you do not have god is not a taskmaster his commandments are not grievous giving is living giving your size is healthy living give with a willing heart not every sacrifice is acceptable if it is not given willingly it holds no future paul said for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17. Calling for offerings for the building of the tabernacle, Moses said, Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring. Exodus 35 verse 5. Willing hearted, not forced, not coerced, not not cajoled. Not every sacrifice is acceptable. That's why you have probably given some offerings that didn't bring you any rainfall. Give willingly, heartedly, and cheerfully. Do it, counting it a privilege from heaven. In Philippians 4 verse 18 to 19, Paul said, But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. If you give without it, being willing hearted, it's a failure. God is not hungry. It is you that need to fill your clouds. Never be forced to give any offering. Just be excited so that it will be acceptable. Why must you give an offering that will be rejected? You are not king. People who give offerings that are unacceptable to God end up in anger and bitterness. They are eventually overtaken by some extreme acts of evil. Don't give out of a corrupt heart either. Don't seek only what you can get back. Don't be a trader. You're not loaning God money. 
far be it that the Almighty will depend on your wretched purse. Rather, our wretched purses depend on Him for replenishing. Don't give an offering that will make it difficult for you to fulfill your financial responsibilities to your family. Whatever you won't do willing heartedly, don't do it because it will not be accepted and you will end up in anger and from anger to bitterness and bitterness to any other grievous offense and they came and everyone whose heart stirred him up and everyone whom his spirit made willing and they brought the lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and they came both men and women as many as were willing hearted and brought the children of israel brought a willing offering unto the lord every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring exodus 35 verse 21 to 22 29 if ye be willing and obedient ye shall eat the good of the land isaiah 1 verse 19 you don't ever fill your clouds with corrupt offerings you fill it with an acceptable offering coming from a willing heart if it's not a willing hearted commitment it is empty and has no reward give cheerfully every man according as he proposes in his heart so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity for god loveth a cheerful giver second corinthians 9 verse 7 god receives only offerings that are cheerfully given if you're not willing hearted you can't be cheerful in your giving it is only a willing hearted and cheerful offering that fills the cloud any other kind dries off the cloud anything you present to god as if it is a burden multiplies your burden so watch it you have the opportunity of giving any kind of offering as long as it is from a willing heart and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skin dyed red and badger skins and sitting wood and oil for the light and spices for anointing oil and for the sweet incense and onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate exodus 35 verse 6 to 9 the issue therefore is not as it were what you have brought but your attitude in bringing in your covenant walk with god it is your attitude that determines your altitude because he looks at the heart and not on the outward appearance chapter 15 working he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, for the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Proverbs 10 verse 4 No one is born poor, neither is anyone born rich. Nobody was born with a three-piece suit and a pair of shoes on. Everybody came to this earth stark naked. Nobody carried a purse or a checkbook when he was born. People arrive here to become whatever they choose to be he becometh poor just like men become rich others also become poor your choice determines what you become but the hand of the diligent maketh rich so the making of wealth is not limited to given alone just in a moment i will show you the balance between giving and working giving procures the blessing while working opens the channel through which that blessing flows back to you giving establishes the blessings but working provides the channel through which the blessings are released giving without working is like pouring water into a basket the channel is not created for the blessings that accrue from grieving to be delivered here are two striking scriptures that draw 
a link between giving and working. A man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. Proverbs 18 verse 16. That is, room is created by your giving. But look at Proverbs 22 verse 29. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. So it is your giving and your working that determines your ultimate placement in life. The charismatics have been taught how to give, but many have not been taught the covenant place and dignity of labor. Abraham encountered the promise of blessings by giving, but he took delivery of the blessings by working. In Genesis 12, God called him out and promised to bless him. In chapter 14, he gave tithes to Melchizedek, king of Salem, who blessed him. Yet, Abraham was a cattle rearer. God has nothing to bless when you are not working. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seated in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And it shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Psalm 1 verse 1 to 3. Whatsoever he doeth, not whatsoever he giveth. It is the giving that positions you by the rivers of water. What you do thereafter is what then enables you to take delivery of the blessings of this privileged positioning. The work of your hand is the channel through which you take delivery of the blessings. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. There is no future for the idle man in the covenant. You have a choice between hard work and a hard life. I made my choice for hard work, so I'm free from hard life. The Bible says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman watcheth but in vain. Psalm 127 verse 1. This tells us that God can bless you until you are busy working. It is your working in the covenant that attracts God's help to get the job done. Jesus said, My father walketh hitherto and I work. John 5 verse 17. Friend, let's stop wishing. Let's start working. Nothing works until you work it. There's dignity in labor. Stop playing around. You may attract a curse. Don't hang around looking for who will dole out something to you. No, that's not the covenant. If you're not working, you will not only become poor, you are signing in to die poor. The Bible says anyone who does not work should not eat. Second Thessalonians 3 verse 10. That means if he must survive, he has to beg. Kingdom prosperity doesn't stop at giving. It continues in working. Very many are givers, but far less are workers because majority think the blessings will drop down for them from the sky. We give what we have to create channels for the blessings. When you're not going out and coming in, you're not a candidate for blessings. Looking at Deuteronomy 28, you will discover that every blessing is poured out on the work of the hands of the people. All that thou settest thy hand unto are given is like the rainfall that falls upon the work we do, causing a release of the blessings. However, your working very hard will be labor in vain without the giving covenant being in place. In Haggai 1 verse 11, God 
said, And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of thy hands. Why? Because my house was lying in ruins, and you are not bothered about it. So I can't be bothered about you. God says, so when you earn wages, it goes into pockets that have holes. Why? Because you're not in the giving covenant. When you're not a giver, but you're a hard worker, you just keep suffering in frustration. This is because God's blessings are not on what you're doing, so they cannot produce results. Remain tireless. God's ultimate for your life demands tireless impute. God's word says in Galatians 6 verse 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So your ultimate in the kingdom demands that you faint not. When you faint, it fails. Jesus told a parable in Mark 4 verse 26 to 28. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself first the blade then the ear after that the full corn in the air no matter how marvelous the revelation you have received from god it should still bring forth results in phases it takes patience to make the mark that god has designed for us in the school of prosperity it is that kind of patience that steers you off for tireless impute for in due season you shall reap if you faint not if you faint it fails for the vision is yet for an appointed time but at the end it shall speak and not lie though it tarry wait for it because it will surely come it will not tarry habakkuk 2 verse 3 every revelation only speaks at the end so you need tireless pursuit of the vision in order not to fail before the end scriptures like let God be true and all men liars become very useful at such times. At the end it shall speak. There are too many get rich quick Christians today and they are the quickest to be frustrated. Many I guess may have looked at me at one time or the other and said to themselves, Hmm, Bishop is lucky. No, Bishop is lucky. I work out my salvation in givings and in labor and I have been doing that for years i'm not into the teaching of glamorous covenant wealth but into practical covenant pursuits i understand god's ways and i give myself totally to it knowing that the one who has spoken cannot lie so any time it comes it's good time every vision speaks at the end many would have gone far ahead but unfortunately just one more day to their breakthrough they faint i curse every force set against you to make you faint and fall in the covenant in jesus name you remember the way saul failed he had waited and just one more minute for samuel to come he said i can't wait anymore he lost his kingdom to impatience just one more day for a man's heaven to open and reward his labor of many years and he says i don't think this thing is working he gives up that will not be your case in jesus name but he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved mark 13 verse 13 this is also repeated in matthew 24 verse 13 receive the grace to endure to the end now it's time for god's vision in your life to start speaking they have turned you into a laughing stock in some quarters but don't give up because you're just about entering into your destiny when i first started preaching the prosperity 
same message. I was an object of mockery because I didn't look it at all. God had encouraged me with these words. As poor yet making many rich. As having nothing and yes possessing all things. Second Corinthians 6 verse 10. So I kept on doing what he sent me to do. Go make my people rich. I had a choice to bang it because a very terrible wave of mockery had risen up against me but i knew in whom i had believed they called me all manner of names then but all my mockers are in oblivion today now the vision is speaking so we must remain tireless both in our giving and working ecclesiastes 7 verse 8 tells us better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof and the patience in spirit is better than the proud in spirit and verse 10 adds say not thou what is the cause that the former days were better than these for thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this your today is better than your yesterday that is godly wisdom that is what propels you and keeps you going why god's word has said but the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day proverbs 4 verse 18 if god said it why are you saying something else it is wisdom to know that today is better than yesterday and that tomorrow will be better than today there's a better tomorrow for you all you need to do is keep working towards it at the end it shall speak every impute is an investment the dividends must surely answer someday may you be there that someday when the dividend begins to answer to your faithfulness we need covenant patience to enjoy covenant blessings god is not a robber god is not a thief his name is called the faithful witness he cannot deny himself as long as you don't stop giving and you don't stop working there is no way it will not speak at the end proverbs 14 verse 23 makes us to understand that in all labor there is profit so every impute is a kind of seed the fruits will answer someday just make sure your hands remain working hands because working hands are blessed hands our covenant fathers all our covenant fathers were hard and tireless workers abraham at the age of 75 was still a cattle rarer isaac dug a well they filled it he dug yet another and they filled it then he dug the third one and for that they strove not genesis 26 he tired out his contenders another famine rose in the days of isaac different from the famine that was in the days of abraham but isaac rose up to the task he was a smart worker abimelech and his chiefs went to isaac to do obeisance to him for thou art much mightier than we they said to him a stranger became mightier than the sons of the soil because of his giving and working life he was perfectly in the covenant if one job closes open another what are you there morning and morning for didn't the scriptures say they shall come against you one way but they will flee before you seven ways you lost one job yes do you now want to lose your life along with it it's not your hands you lost it's only a job so find another one whatsoever thy hand findeth to do do it with all thine might your hand therefore shall be a finding hand it is impossible to rise without working anybody that won't provoke you to work is destroying your destiny without knowing there are three levels at which our covenant fathers worked they were hard workers they were tireless workers they were creative workers it was creative work 
that brought Jacob out of the house of Laban. Laban said to him, All the strived shall be mine, the speckled shall be yours. His plan was to keep Jacob in perpetual slavery. Jacob then sat down and considered, How can I make the cattle to give birth to speckled cows? And Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree and peeled white sticks in them and made the white appear which was in the rods and he set the rods which he had piled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering trough when the flocks came to drink that they should conceive when they came to drink and the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle ring streaked speckled and spotted genesis 30 verse 37 to 39 that was ingenuity the power of ready invention and the facility of combining ideas it is what i call the ability to foresee and calculate for results all our covenant fathers were hard workers abraham they were tireless workers isaac and they were creative workers jacob friend you created to matter so don't sell your birthright you are a creature of dignity don't sell off where you are is a fair place but a better place awaits you so don't sell off whatsoever he doeth shall prosper blessings don't drop on people they drop on what people do whatever blessing god has promised in his word will only meet you on your job deuteronomy 28 verse 4 to 6 declares blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground and the fruit of thy cattle the increase of thy kin and the flocks of thy sheep blessed shall be thy basket and thy store blessed shall thou be when thou comest in and blessed shall thou be when thou goest out don't sit down in your house doing nothing from morning till night you're not a candidate for blessing if you're not going out and coming in if you are not working if we work as hard as we give we will start off a revolution in the world we would have created enough channels for the delivery of our heavenly blessings whatsoever he doeth it shall prosper that's an open check don't be ashamed of whatever work you're doing as it is what determines your worth you're in a covenant relationship with god and he will bless all that thou settest thy hand to do so celebrate your work for you will soon become a celebrity in the society increase answers to giving plus labor so get started get started from where you are chapter 16 thinking in the course of my meditation i came up with the statement it is wisdom that begets wealth wealth is the offspring of wisdom happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that gettest understanding for the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold she is more precious than rubies and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her length of days is in her right hand and in her left hand riches and honor proverbs 3 verse 13 to 16 we've talked about working but work alone does not make rich it is creative work that guarantees productivity and in turn wealth thinking in this context is the ability to coordinate thoughts productively for increased output reasoning is what makes rich when paul talked about the eyes of your understanding being enlightened in ephesians 1 verse 18 he was referring to being mentally sound 
that is high level productive thinking that is somebody sitting down and creating something productive that will make living great working alone does not make for wealth it is wise working that begets wealth a man may be laboring but because he lacks result he becomes wearied he knows what to do but doesn't know how to do it it is the knowledge of how to do a thing that gets it done not just the doing of it it's not just work but wise work that makes for wealth the labor of the foolish wearies every one of them because he knoweth not how to go to the city ecclesiastes 10 verse 15 that wisdom element of our labor in most cases is the missing link that causes us to work and work without having any result remember our giving does not equal plenty on its own giving connects us to the blessing while working helps us to take delivery of the blessing if we are wise workers then we can take greater delivery of his blessings the labor of the foolish we are told weary yet every one of them because he knoweth not how when you know how you begin to get better results and you receive more of those blessings you will not labor in vain anymore all the wealth of the universe came out of wisdom psalm 104 verse 24 that wisdom has no respect for problems it will obtain results in any environment under any circumstances no matter how impossible the situation may appear that wisdom can locate treasures in any place job 28 verse 9 to 12 therefore the economy of your country is not your problem it's your mentality that needs to be adjusted you are a new creature all things are passed away all things are become new you're not like the people of the world so when they say there's a casting down you should say there's lifting up if you see things the way the world sees it you will fall the way they fall the covenant is superior to the climate all we need is to engage our covenant mentality for high level productivity sit down jesus said no one builds a tar without first sitting down to generate create and analyze ideas for instance before our bible school started i went out to find out what other bible schools were doing so i would know how to get better results it grieves me to see covenant people go mentally asleep it's time to awake there's so much treasure in this rock the bible wisdom will cut it out and the rivers in it will flow out in spiritual warfare we've talked so much about studying the word praying and fasting but not much has been said about sitting down to think not just reading or searching the word that alone won't do but sitting down to make discoveries searching the way out of whatever crisis you are faced with for the egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose therefore have i cried concerning this their strength is to sit still for thus saith the lord god the holy one of israel in returning and rest shall ye be saved in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength and ye would not isaiah 30 verse 7 15 there's a place for sitting still to locate the treasures in the word to bring forth ideas that will enhance productivity what do you get when you sit still and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying this is the way walk ye in it when ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left isaiah 30 verse 21 as you sit down to quality 
meditation with a there must be a way out attitude. You provoke the treasures on your inside to come forth. Friend, there's something inside you. The answer is within you in your house. Elisha asked that widow, what hast thou in thine house? She said, I have nothing but a cruise of oil. And Elisha said to her, you've got the answer. Second Kings chapter 4. The answer to her crisis came out of her house. The answer you require is inside you. So sit down and make it come forth. Every event is an invention and every invention is a product of intuition. What is intuition? Nothing but qualitative meditation, which is the ability to coordinate thoughts productively. The prodigal son came to himself and found his way back home by reasoning. I don't think it took more than one hour of reasoning to do that. This is one of the forgotten but most powerful powerful forces in life. You have an excellent spirit. All you need to do is to engage it. Your car has a gear system, but until you engage the gear, the car won't move. So let's engage our covenant mentality for cheap victories in the battles of life. You get things to work, not by prayer, but by engaging covenant reasoning, putting the facts on the ground and then working things out. That is pure wisdom. So the level to which you engage your mind determines the level of results you obtain. If the way you give is the way you work and coupled with the wisdom required, this earth will shake under your feet. If you see a better way of doing whatever thing you're doing now, what are you doing with the old way? You have a shop that is hardly making any sales. Why don't you sit down and reason? Do people really need what I'm selling? If they don't then, what is it that they need in this area? You have gone to rent an office space in a local for the services you are rendering is needed in another area. What lopsided wisdom? Friend, believe in results and stop playing around with false images. Somebody is jobless and yet he sits at home watching television. Sell that television and buy a paper grinding machine. Put on an apron and a chef cap and get to work with excitement. Let's get into productive level. It's productive thinking that makes for productivity. One whole day of sitting down to think can bring about that long-awaited lifetime change. Creative thinking brought Jacob out of slavery. I see you coming out of the slavery of lack and want right now. Every throne is created. Every throne is created. It is not a gift. It is a creation of wisdom. The heaven and the earth, including all the wealth in the universe, came out of wisdom. O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. Psalm 104 verse 24. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. Proverbs 3 verse 19 to 20. The creative ability of God was put to productive use and all that we see today came into being. The fullness of the earth, the gold, the oil, the diamonds, name it, all came out of God's creative wisdom. The Bible tells us that heaven is God's throne. And and the earth is footstool. So we discover that even the Almighty had to create his own throne. Likewise, everyone that desires a throne on the earth today must be ready to create one. Let me stir you up for results with this. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? For we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. But we have the mind mind of Christ. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. 
and the Bible says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1 verse 3. Also, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 24. If therefore we have the mind of Christ, and it is the wisdom of God by which all things were created, then we are by inheritance possessors of divine creativity. It is our birthright to operate in the creative realms of God. The creative capabilities of God reside on our inside. Let's go and stir them up. Let's draw them out by engaging the sitting down warfare strategy for exploits. Let's sit down with God. You have prayed. You have fasted. Now think. Engage creative thinking for high level productivity. I believe in new things. Every new thing comes out of new thoughts. Why should God have a goal of billions for you and you're dying with the millions? Why should God have a supermarket for you and you are there in a kiosk? No. Unto whom much is given, much is required. You have the mind of Christ. Be willing to cut down on anything that is seeking to cut down your destiny and focus on productive living focus on productivity it will enhance your dignity if i have the mind of christ then the world must mind me when jesus was here on the earth the world minded him but the world will never mind you until you have results to command their attention it is result that commands respect before you're through with reading this book God will visit you with very strange productive ideas. Ideas that will put you on a higher level of life. Where are you really going? Look like someone who is going somewhere. Know where you are going and draw out a strategy that will help you get there. You're an enviable creature. You possess the mind of Christ. By that same mind, all things were created. That mind carries life, and that life is the light of men, which shines in darkness, and darkness cannot handle it. Friend, wake up, for well, you have the Creator's mentality. You can cut rivers out of the rock. You can overturn mountains by the roots and you can see every precious thing in every difficult situation. May God help you to engage this great gift on your inside productively. You can make things happen. What you're doing now may not be what you need to do to get to where you're going. You need a change and change is a choice. You make your choice and your choice makes you. You need to change your approach to the thing you're doing now so as to get better results results out of it. I want you to be very excited because the mind that created the world and all that is in it is the same one you possess. If that mind can create the universe and it is in perfect order till now, can't it create your little world? Three kinds of wisdom. There are three kinds of wisdom. Heavenly wisdom, earthly wisdom, and demonic wisdom. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 6 to 8, James 3 verse 15. But that which is from above is above them all. The wisdom of God is superior to every other kind of wisdom. It is not found in the land of the living because it comes from heaven. It is superior to intellectualism. It is far above it. It is superior to demonic forces because they're under our feet. The Bible says this wisdom of God is justified of all her children. So it is your heritage in Christ. Paul told Timothy, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbyter. 1 Timothy 4 verse 14 I prophesy an awakening upon your mentality the God of light will shed very
very unique light on your path. That light will distinguish you among your peers. Your generation will celebrate your birth. No more shall you be mistaken for a nuisance. You shall remain an asset on this earth. No more a parasite. Whatever has hitherto made for shame in your life as a result of an inadequate engagement of your covenant mentality is destroyed right now. Everything that is not making your mind work the way it should vanishes from you now in Jesus' precious name. God gave the three Hebrew boys knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. Daniel 1 verse 17 and he said, I am the Lord, I change not. So God is still in the business of giving knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. You have seen enough sweat. It's time to taste the sweet of the covenant and the grapes of life. Wherever wisdom dwells, that's where wealth is found. In him, Jesus, we are told, dwell all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And he dwells in you. So you're a treasure of wisdom and knowledge. Not theoretical wisdom, but productive wisdom. I command the creative abilities of God in you to begin to work right now. That better idea you need for better results, receive it now in Jesus' mighty name. Be free from every confusion. Be free from every depression. That weight on your mind that will not let it function at its best. I command it to drop off you now in the name of Jesus. Reasoning makes rich. Many of us are a concern to God. This is because the things we cry about don't require tears at all. They just require taking the appropriate steps and then walking into victory. But when you don't know what steps to take, how do you take them? I'd like you to know that God has made every provision available for us to exercise our minds so we can excel in life. The creative abilities in us will only come to light with the adequate exercising of our senses. It is strong meat for strong destiny. Hitherto, many have thought that sense knowledge is contrary to scriptural or spiritual knowledge. But without a good sense knowledge, you can't understand the things of the spirit. Your spirit can't instruct your body. It is your mind that does that because the body only responds to instructions from the mental region. Your spirit illuminates your mind, passing on information to it, and then your your mind dispatches it to the body for appropriate actions. Please understand this. How much mental exercise you engage in determines how much you will excel in life. Remember, wisdom begets wealth. It is reasoning that makes rich. Through wisdom is in house builded, and by understanding is it established, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Proverbs 24 verse 3 to 4. The Amplified Bible puts it in a very colorful way. Through skillful and godly wisdom is a house, a life, a home, a family built. And by understanding it is established on a sound and good foundation. And by knowledge shall its chambers of every area be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Friend, it takes facts to become fat. What they call common sense is not really common. The moment you cannot explain the step you are taking, you don't have that common sense. If you cannot explain to the people around the reasons for what you are doing or what you expect at the end of what you are doing, and you don't know what you're doing. You have the mind of Christ. It's time to exercise that mind in order to excel in life. How to exercise your senses. Now let me show you how you can exercise your senses for maximum results. 
Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Daniel 2 verse 16. Time is the greatest asset in the school of creativity. It is the common denominator in our bid to excel in mental exercise. Daniel said to them, no matter how hard the situation, just give me time. I will get the answer. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel Bless the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God for ever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Daniel 2 verse 17 to 20. This is what I call revelation expectant prayer. It is different from healing miracle prayer. It is communicating with the unseen in faith and opening up to receive direction from on high. Revelation expectant and prayer says which way lord and is followed by listening attentively in the spirit and speaking quietly in tongues lord i need light from you on this subject speak to me lord i'm ready to do whatever you say he said you have not because you asked not i am the lord that leadest thee in the way that thou shouldest go i am the lord that teacheth thee to profit you may May not hear him while you're in that prayer but it may be while you're asleep in the night as was the case with daniel we suffer frustration because of assumptions it's better to be slow and sure than to be fast and fail when the lord is your shepherd you shall not want every business you rush into many times you come back with regrets but psalm 112 verse 5 says he shall guide his affairs with discretion. If you lack discretion, you're set for destruction. I guide my affairs with discretion. The enemy plays on time, but time is your greatest asset in locating direction. Daniel said, give us time. They utilize the time in a revelation expectant prayer. Seeking is also important in exercising a good given mentality you need to be informed in whatever field of endeavor you are in you need facts to become facts decisions based on quality information will always lead to distinctions you need to locate current materials that will enhance your decision so go after those who have excelled in your field and in their stories you will locate their secrets and with those secrets you can make better decisions businessmen should seek for materials of successful businessmen and find out how they excelled that would help to boost the quality of your decisions daniel said i daniel understood by books daniel 9 verse 2 even though god gave him wisdom understanding and light with which he could dissolve hard sentences yet he needed information for quality decisions the word of god is our principal reading material other books related to our field of specialization will help boost the quality of our decisions so you don't only ask for wisdom in prayer you also seek for wisdom through expanded knowledge using books and tapes to boost your insight as you exercise your senses that's why daniel said give us time it takes time to encounter light god's word makes wise we therefore need to spend time in the word of god and relevant materials pertaining to our areas of pursuit to be informed is to be transformed 
and to be uninformed is to be deformed so let's crave for quality information it will enhance the quality of our decisions meditation is the third way by which we exercise our senses in god what is meditation it is processing acquired information for quality decisions if you look at god's word you'll discover that every success related matter is tied to meditation blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners nor seated in the seat of the scornful but his delight is in the law of the lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season his leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper psalm 1 verse 1 to 3 the man is first a thinker then a walker and in his law doth he meditate day and night and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper he ponders his steps in the word of god and based on the information he has acquired he takes decision god said come let us reason together produce your cost bring forth your strong reasons he wants you to be a strong thinker and not a baby thinker in isaiah 43 verse 26 he said put me in remembrance let us plead together declare thou that thou mayest be justified and in isaiah 1 verse 18 he said come and let us reason together you see you have a thinking father so you can't afford to be a mindless christian in psalm 1 verse 1 to 3 and joshua 1 verse 8 we see prosperity being tied to meditation so let's settle down and invest our time it is our greatest asset in our quest for creativity time is all you need and time is what you have invest it now and you'll see great results tomorrow you may perhaps be facing some difficult financial times right now i would like you to sit up in your privacy and say to yourself i know there's a way out of the situation then pray a revelation expectant prayer and lay hold on wisdom materials to provoke your mind to action and light will surely come as you follow that light you will discover the answer is there don't go to sleep with problems because by the time you wake up you will find them waiting the psalmist said give me understanding and i shall live that's all you need don't sit around a commodity that is not selling create something else that will sell there is a way out for you let me conclude this subsection by saying this the strongholds of life usually reside in the mind second corinthians 10 verse 3 to 5 tells us for though we walk in the flesh we do not walk after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through god to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of god and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of christ so you can tame your thoughts it demands that you be vast in the word in order to tame your thoughts the word of god must dominate your mind for it to be able to tame your thoughts remember you have the mind of christ stir it up there is need to develop into manhood mentality manhood is not a function of age but a function of mental maturity for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace isaiah 9 verse 6 government is placed upon the shoulders of sons not children the labor of the foolish wearies so think as you work so that your labor will not be in vain be creative in your approach to labor 
and you will never cease to be productive. You have the mind of Christ. You are to be envied. You have no business staying in the pit. People pity men because they're in the pit. Get out of that pit. You don't belong there. What God has put in you qualifies you for a crown. Sin corrupts mentality. The mind that we are talking about is a gift from God. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. I would like to say that this end time the church of Jesus Christ is going to experience such explosive operations of our minds. The Bible calls it the manifold wisdom of God. Manifold that is many-sided complicated wisdom of God working in us freely and in all realms. Man was in control until sin came. When sin came, man lost control and the beauty of creation was eroded. Before sin came, man was covered with the glory of heaven. But after sin came, he was stripped of that glory and was naked. With sin, man also lost his ability to think like God. But God has stepped in one more time into the affairs of his creation by his only begotten son Jesus. Jesus came to recover man back from that realm of mental depravity and failure. So everyone that is in sin has automatically sold off that sound mind that we now have in Christ. Every testimony of soundness of mind in scriptures is rooted in purity. E.g. Joseph, Daniel, Job, Sin is a destroyer of mentality. Sin corrupts creation. You can't live in habitual sin and expect to remain sound. No, the first Adam couldn't make it. You can't make it either. Before the fall, Adam singularly named all the animals that we see today. Whatever name he called them, that was the name God called them. He was on the same mental frequency with God. He was in total dominion but lost it to sin. I believe that adultery eroded Solomon's mentality. The Bible says and his wives turned his heart away from the Lord. The same Solomon who 1 Kings 3 verse 3 said and Solomon loved the Lord was corrupted by adultery. Samson's mentality was so corrupted that when Delilah told him, tell me where your power is. He told her she actually bound him and called the Philistines to arrest him. When Samson got up, he killed those who came upon him. But ironically, he left the woman. Who should he have first killed? Isn't it Delilah? But Samson had lost his mind to adultery. Watch every adulterer. They're dull-minded. That's why a man in adultery doesn't think of his family. He goes around town with the women, leaving his family at home with plenty of problems. No habitual sinner has mental soundness. No, not in the kingdom. A drunkard, for instance, has no mind of his own. He may have common sense, which of course is not adequate to handle uncommon problems. You can decide whether to operate a dull head or a sound mind. Sin corrupts mentality. Only righteousness quickens it. But there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Job 32 verse 8. It is sin that quenches that spirit which is what connects with understanding from on high. So when you give in to sin, you have quenched the candle of the Lord in you that searches the inward part of the belly resulting in mental powers. 
Ephesians 4 verse 23 instructs us and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's what makes our wisdom as children of God superior to intellectualism. Intellectualism is limited to the ordinary man, the spiritless mind of the unregenerated man. Or when you're born again, the Holy Spirit is fired into your mind to quicken that dead mind and bring it on a redemptive frequency where it can deliver at the level of God. Before you came to Christ, you had a mind. The mind was there, but it was a dead mind, acquiring only dead materials to produce dead results. But a one-day-old Christian who has received the touch of Jesus and the fire of the Holy Spirit can easily deliver results because he's now on a higher level. The Spirit of God is fired into his mind to quicken that once upon a time dead mind so it can now function on a redemptive frequency and in the class of God. Seeing it what quenches that spirit. The Bible says quench not the spirit. At another time it says grieve not the spirit. When you don't stop grieving the spirit you end up quenching him. When that happens the candle of the Lord inside you is quenched destroying the ability to search the inward parts of your belly. There is no kind of physical exertion that can bring any Christian into mental dignity. There is therefore need to subdue and overcome the sin matter so that your mind will be released to function at the correct frequency. Mental dignity is your birthright. Iniquity is the only way to sell off. The purer you are, the brighter you are mentally. Jesus knew no sin and they marveled at his wisdom. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Proverbs 13 verse 20. If you're reasoning with the wise, you can't be a fool. So you need to establish a good relationship with the word of God. Not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. It's time to decamp from the world and camp with Jesus for extraordinary results. The sin matter is a capital issue. We have to keep going back to it because our redemptive colors will never come forth until sin is permanently dealt with. Sin corrupts mentality. Righteousness is what quickens it. The wisdom of God is first pure. So it is purity that guarantees pure wisdom. Sin gives birth to corruption which corrupts the mind, the spirit and the body. Don't give room to sin. Victory over sin guarantees soundness of mind. So settle down and and tell sin to its face. You won't send me out of my Eden the way you sent Adam out. Watch out. You will begin to encounter very straight light as you destroy the hold of sin over your life. Your redemptive mind will be quickened back to life for divine encounters. Keep your spirit alive. Your spirit is the vital force in you and it is vulnerable to sin. When sin comes, it dies. Sin makes it sick and if it is not quickly and properly treated, it dies. Your level of illumination is determined by how alive your spirit man is. So keep it alive always. I command the spirit in your mind to come alive in Jesus name. I curse every trap of corruption. You shall no longer be a victim. Enjoy the blessings of divine creativity. God created his throne by wisdom. Go and create yours too. Every extra input you make from now on will attract extra results from above. I command your mind to stay awake in the mighty name of Jesus. Chapter 17 Trusting The next step to getting blessed is trusting. We have established the place of giving, the place of working, and the place of thinking. Now let's establish the place of trusting in the school of prosperity. 
quite a number believe God, but very few trust Him. What enhances a successful, cheerful, and relaxed giving life is trusting. It makes for profitable giving. Those who trust Him are totally dependent on Him and on no one else. Blessed is the man that trusted in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Jeremiah 17 verse 7. Trusting is the highway to continuous triumph. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. The Lord redeemed the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Psalm 34 verse 8 and 22. In Matthew 6 verse 31, God said, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewither shall we be clothed? The only way not to take thoughts for your life is to trust. That's your highway to the realm of kingdom prosperity. There are so many people who are given in worship but who have never enjoyed the blessings of god why they are not dependent on god for their needs so they keep suffering they depend on their pay packets and on their big brothers thus saith the lord Cursed be the man that trusted in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departed from the Lord. Jeremiah 17 verse 5 Friend, you need to come into that realm of trusting. It is the realm of continuous triumph. I don't have needs because I'm trusting him. It's my natural lifestyle. No needs, no begging, no borrowing. There are many who would have built their own houses if only they knew how to trust God. Trusting God is simply beautiful. My trust is not in the congregation I pastor as I don't do my planning based on the number of the congregation. I plan based on my knowledge of God since the day I heard woe unto him that trusts in man. I decided to avoid woes. Listen to me. You won't know true triumph until you learn trusting it is your understanding of the mystery of trusting that brings you to the realm of true triumph in life many love him but very few trust him multitudes worship him but very very few trust him they that trust in the lord shall be as mount zion which cannot be removed but abideth forever as the mountains are round about jerusalem so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth even forever. For the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands in iniquity. Psalm 125 verse 1 to 3. If you want to enjoy true prosperity, you have to enjoy the mystery of trusting him. One of the things that easily commands people's trust is money. Many people's souls are tied to and anchored on their money. God does not bring multiplication the way of such people because it will lead to their destruction. The moment your trust is in money, God withdraws it to a level where you will keep believing God for every meal. He that trusted in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall fall flourish as a branch proverbs 11 verse 28 when money is what determines your countenance it shows that that's where your trust is paul told timothy charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living god who giveth us richly all things to enjoy first timothy 6 verse 17 that money in your bank account or in your pocket is not what holds your tomorrow i don't trust in it 
I'm not putting away money that my children will spend tomorrow. No, they are learning now how to possess their own possession. I don't trust anybody, including myself. I just trust God. Money is crazy. There's nothing in it. So to now go to the terrible extent of borrowing is making God feel unworthy of handling your life. The only way to show that you don't trust in money is to give it out. You trust it. That's why you can't give it. When you trust God, friend, he gives you all things richly to enjoy. As you keep on demonstrating your trust in him, he keeps on blessing you with his favors night and day. Oh, I just trust him. Your earthly savings could amount to losses, particularly if you trust in them. But your heavenly treasures guarantees you a future and a fortune. Now, quite a multitude have have passed the test of giving and many are creative thinkers but we need to train up ourselves into the realm of trusting that will make for outstanding and profound triumphs don't trust in your expertise or your contacts just put your trust in the living god also many have overcome trusting in men but are yet to overcome trusting themselves let's trust him Trusting delivers from trials. When you trust God for everything, you are free from trials in everything. Let me show you another secret for Job's wealth in Job 31 verse 28. If I have made gold my hope or have said to the fine gold, thou art my confidence. Job was recounting his integrity before the Lord and he included the fact that gold was not his hope. Fine gold was not his confidence. His wealth was not an attraction to him. He said, if it had been, I would have denied the God that is above. Whatever else you trust apart from God makes you a betrayer. They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. Psalm 34 verse 5. There is no substitute for trust in the school of prosperity. In Psalm 112, the prophetic chapter that provides insight into God's kind of wealth. The psalmist tells us that the man's heart is established. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings because his heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. He has dispersed because he is not afraid. He is trusting. He is giving to the poor. His righteousness endures forever and his horn shall be exalted with honor. That's what happens when you trust God. I command your freedom from the tensions of unbelief. Every unholy marriage with money, I command a divorce right now. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Luke 16 verse 11. God's riches is held in trust, but delivered on trust to those who trust in him. If you can't trust him for supplies, he can't trust you with his provisions. The reason people play financial pranks is because they can't trust God to meet their needs. Let's see David's secret. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice seller grant thee according to thine own heart and fulfill all thy counsel we will rejoice in thy salvation and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength 
of his right hand some trust in chariots and some in horses but we will remember the name of the lord our god they are brought down and fallen but we are risen and stand upright save lord let the king hear us when we call psalm 20 verse 1 to 9 my offerings are given in trust that he is my source i'm not depending on my ability but on his resources trust is an expression of commitment the three hebrew boys said if it be so our god whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand o king but if not be it known unto thee o king that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up daniel 3 17 to 18 friend we are not on contractual relationship with god but in a son father relationship with him trusting is what gets you satisfied in farming let's look at various scripture references in the book of psalms behold the eye of the lord is upon them that fear him upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine psalm 33 verse 18 to 19 the lord knoweth the days of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever they shall not be ashamed in the evil time and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied psalm 37 verse 18 to 19 he shall not be afraid of evil tidings his heart is fixed trusting in the lord psalm 112 verse 7 trust is it it's what gets you satisfied in hard times it's wonderful to trust in the lord it is better to trust in the lord than to put confidence in man it is better to trust in the lord than to put confidence in princes psalm 118 verse 8 to 9 things don't get better until your trust goes higher as you trust him more things get better they get sweeter and come more cheaply there's a great future for us as we put our trust in god don't trust your purse anymore trust in the lord money has never finished in my hand because the source from which i am drawing never finishes i don't celebrate what i receive i celebrate what i give because what i give is an expression of my trust your trust becomes practicable when you just enjoy your state for a time it will free you from anxieties enjoy your state for a time and you will enjoy god for life it's so sweet to trust the lord faith and trust let's distinguish between faith and trust faith is confidence trust is commitment faith breeds confidence while trust breeds commitment they are two different levels of life faith can fail but trust cannot fail remember what jesus said to peter but i have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not and when thou art converted strength thy brethren luke 22 verse 32 confidence can be cast away cast not away therefore your confidence which has great recompense of reward hebrews 10 verse 35 confidence can be cast away depending on the weight of the conflict but trust can never be removed they that trust in the lord shall be as mount zion which cannot be removed but abideth forever psalm 125 verse 1 faith believes that god can do it but trust says even if he doesn't do it my position remains the same trust says if i perish i perish until you get to the realm of trusting you will never see true triumph in life i don't trust anyone including myself you know why anything and anyone can fail but whatever you place in his hand is secured the bible refers to faith as one of the 
elementary principles of the doctrines of Christ. For trust is the advanced level. At the trust level, you become unbeatable on the earth because you're one with God. It's one thing to be a giver. It's another thing to be a worker and a thinker. But it is yet another to be a truster. Do you trust him? If God is your source, what you have will never become your God. It's this realm of trusting that brings you into the realm of sweatless giving because you count on God for the next supplies. Confidence is not as strong as commitment in the face of a fairy furnace. Confidence may fail, but commitment will stand. How far you go with God determines how far you go in life. A great tomorrow awaits you. You only require great steps to get there. Quite a number believe God. For very few trust Him. Trust is eternal. It stands out. It cannot be removed. Its authority is irrevocable. I know my God can, but if He does not, that does not change my position that's commitment but faith says i know god can god will and god must do it when he can't say it he is cast down we have been confident all this while but let's now go on higher and be committed whatever i don't have now is not good for me the one i'm seeking says since i seek him i will not lack any good thing so whatever i lack now is no good thing that's trust say with me lord help me to live trust in you it is the way to live a triumphant life take your rest trust commands your rest from scriptures we know that rest commands results the lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace exodus 14 verse 14 god only fights when you take your rest because in your state of rest you provoke divine intervention when god fights for you who can doubt the results it's time to take financial rest now that's one of my secrets in life jesus said take no thought for your life what you will eat what you will drink what you will wear just seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you matthew 6 verse 31 to 33 you need to enter into the realms of additions now by entering into a supernatural state of rest around you this is a missing covenant detail which has made life lopsided for many every man and family needs rest don't be encumbered by your needs there's more to life than possessions let's look at one mystery behind trust in second chronicles 20 verse 17 ye shall not need to fight in this battle set yourselves stand ye still and see the salvation of the lord with you o judah and jerusalem fear not nor be dismayed tomorrow go out against them for the lord will be with you are you tired of struggling god says set yourselves stand ye still and i promise you divine intervention when you stop trusting you stop triumphing because a state of doubt is a state of doom friend go and take your rest you are struggling to collect things that are beyond that's why your body is not at rest a state of rest is consciously created it's not a thing you wish it's a thing you program god says in psalm 46 verse 10 be still and know that i am god when will you know that he is god when you are still then and only then will he step in nothing upsets people as much as finance and that's the reason why many are in financial lack today remove money and all the high blood pressure cases we have in the world today would be reduced remove money and the crisis in homes will be greatly reduced you will not see divine interventions in your finances until you take your rest 
enter into your rest and that business will not die enter into your rest and your children's children will never beg enter into your rest and the devourer will not devour the works of your hand god is not a liar you're a giver you're a worker you're a thinker now begin to trust him and no one will be able to stop you from getting results after hannah heard the word of eli she took her rest then the atmosphere became conducive for god to intervene and she brought forth a man child no matter what that obstacle is in your life a state of rest will convert it into a miracle take your rest and you won't miss your destiny in christ look at this the liberal soul shall be made fat and he that watereth shall be watered also himself proverbs 11 verse 25 that is the giving man shall be made fat the soul of the slow God desires and has nothing, but the soul of the delivered shall be made fat. Proverbs 13 verse 4. The working man will also be fat. He that put his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. Proverbs 28 verse 25. The trusting man will likewise be made fat. All these three go together to guarantee your prosperity. Abundance is impossible without trust. They are all all in one package when there is no empty vessel there's nothing for god to fill it takes trust to empty your vessel if you don't trust him you can't be a good and cheerful giver if you're not a cheerful giver your labor will be wearisome it's so sweet to trust in jesus please trust him the one who has successfully managed the entire universe till now without any failure Can and not mismanage your little life. God will bless them that trust him. So if you trust him, you're a candidate for his blessings. Chapter 18. Waiting. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Hebrews 6 verse 13 to 15 this is the eagle's secret god swore to abraham yet he needed patience to obtain that promise the bible said after he had patiently endured not after he had subjected himself to rigorous senseless fasting not after he had struggled and sweated it out but after he had patiently endured abraham needed to have endured indeed every man every Every eagle Christian requires a degree of covenant patience. The covenant of prosperity is not a magic wand. It's an adventure of faith after he had patiently endured. Not after he had wept aloud. We are not called to weep but to wait. In Habakkuk 2 verse 3, God said, Every vision is for an appointed time. So though it tarries, wait for it. Did he say wait for it? Did he say run around for it? No, wait, wait. Wait for it. It will surely come. It shall not tarry. The reason we are wasting is because we don't like to wait. In 1981, God spoke to me saying, The hour has come to liberate the world from all oppressions of the devil through the preaching of the word of faith. That was a revelation for a worldwide ministry. But the mandate to go into Africa never came until 1994 can you see the waiting period but at the end it shall speak when you run with it it will speak at the end very many people miss that end so it looks as if the vision or revelation is not true please understand this 
quick prosperity will always end in grievous austerity because it lacks the required foundation for lasting results. Why wait? Your lifting with God is for appointed times and due seasons, and He's the only one who knows when your due season has come. If you strive to lay hold on something before your due, you'll be doomed. And let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Galatians 6 verse 9. Don't be tired in your covenant work because there is a due season. If you're on your feet, when that season comes, you will reap your harvest. But if you faint, you fail. If it will work, it ought to have worked by now. That's murmuring. When you murmur, you destroy your seed sown, and then you will have to begin all over again. God runs a due season calendar on each one of us. When you are due, he will not deny you. But if you faint, before you are due, you lose it all. It's better to wait or you waste. Abraham heard from God directly, yet he needed patience to obtain the promise. If you will not be patient, you may as well end up a patient in the hospital. I caught the revelation that I cannot be poor in 1981, but that was not equal to automatic prosperity. But because I knew what it takes. I never had occasion to beg, nor was I ever tempted to borrow, but that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Luke 8 verse 15. Though the seed fell on a good heart and good ground, it could only bring forth fruit with patience. In a society that's ever in a hurry as we live in today, we need an understanding of God that will keep us above the system. God said, I know you're honest, but you need patience. The day you are due, I will not deny you. Wait, 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 the day you are due, you will see me at work. Wait, God cannot deny himself. Haven't you heard what he said in Psalm 89 verse 34? My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. So we can count on him in the morning. We can count on him in the afternoon. And we can count on him in the in the night, everyone in this covenant has a future, but that future is continually being contested by the enemy. It takes covenant intelligence to beat him hollow. Waiting without staggering is the secret of all high-flying Christians. Concerning Abraham, the Bible said he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Romans 4 verse 20. Waiting without staggering and undaunted by negative circumstances very important. There's a change coming your way, but that change requires waiting without staggering like Abraham did. Job said, if a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Job 14 verse 14. Your change is guaranteed. If only you will wait. There is no shame to them that wait for him. Waiting is your access to great heights in life. That is, despising negative circumstances and holding on tightly to the word to a point that everybody thinks you are a fool. You need to wait for every change before you change. If you change before the change comes, you may be charged. Adjust your taste to mark your level per time. God knows knows your size. You don't need to impress him. For evil doers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Psalm 37 verse 9. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Psalm 37 verse 34. Friend, it doesn't come overnight. It comes in phases. Wait for it. Live the anxiety-free life. Don't be ruled and guided by material possessions. 
possessions, rather be guided by the principle of life that have been delivered to you and you will live well. It takes a lot of discipline to wait, but God is never late. When you miss God, you miss good. Or when you start counting on God, things start to open up for you. It is the blessings of God, not the blessings of merchandise that make rich and add no sorrow to it. Don't look for shortcuts. Wait, be contented and be excited with whatever level you are in for time. Your change is coming. The one who brought changes into my life is the same God. You too will encounter positive and amazing changes in your life. Only wait. God will prove you before he places you. He won't let you see his work until he has found you worthy to retain it and hold it in trust. There is no shame to them that wait for him. Please wait. God is never late. Whatever time he comes is the best time. Chapter 19 Talking For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10 verse 10 God prospers us through our giving, working, thinking, trusting, waiting, and then talking. Talking is the sixth pillar of kingdom prosperity. Whatever you are not able to say, you have not believed. We haven't the same spirit of faith. According as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13 When God was introducing Joshua to his access to prosperity, he said to him, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Joshua 1 verse 8 There are many great doers, but very few doers are talkers. So in spite of their great doings, they remain small. In the world of the spirit, your mouth is what gives expression to your choice. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Mark 11 verse 23 that is, whatsoever he doeth notwithstanding, he shall have only whatsoever he saith. So God sees what you say as the conclusion of your expectation. He said to Joshua, This book of the law must not depart from your mouth, because it is in your heart. Observe to do whatsoever it says, then will you make your way prosperous and have good success. Success. Your mouth is a key factor into the realm of prosperity. Remember when the children of Israel were about to enter the land flowing with the milk and honey, and they said, We be not able. And God said to them, Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Numbers 14 verse 28 you can't enter into the land flowing with milk and honey by talking poverty. No matter your level of commitment to labor, the quality of your giving, your thinking, your trusting, and your waiting. If you miss it at the talking stage, you wipe off everything. James said concerning the tongue. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. James 3 verse 5 to 6 Do you know that your mouth 
house can burn off in one day everything you spent your whole life to heap up no matter how many people are angry i'll never talk poverty i didn't when poverty was my next door neighbor so i want much more now that it has ceased to be my companion that would be most unwise until you talk prosperity you will never prosper that's the word of god you must talk prosperity everywhere both in your privacy and in the public prosperity only answers to those who talk it you make your way prosperous by giving which is what provokes divine blessings by working provides the channel for the blessing to flow by thinking enhances greater results by trusting without which your results will not be delivered into your hand by waiting because you need patience to bring forth fruits and then prosperity comes into your house by talking i talked prosperity until poverty gave up on me because god is committed to the words of his servant and the thoughts and counsel of his messengers isaiah 44 verse 26 until you talk it you can't take it i command your tongue to be sanctified right now so it will not stop your access into the land that is flowing with milk and honey don't look for and expect riches god weighs actions too if you exhibit actions of poverty you are only expressing poverty let your appearance and language express abundance don't try to impress but let it be something on the inside that cannot be seen on the outside you speak out of the abundance of your inside you don't get drunk with wine to the point of misbehaving by just a few sips an established drunkard needs about eight bottles of beer to lose balance friend talk prosperity until you talk it you can't take it until you talk it you really don't believe it until you believe it it cannot be performed in your life luke 1 verse 45 prosperity is produced on the ticket of faith and faith is given expression through your mouth for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation romans 10 verse 10 many give many work many are thinkers or very few are talking particularly when they're among sinners they are not talking probably because that light is not in them yet the reason you can't say it with your mouth is because it's not in your heart yet if it's in your heart your mouth can't keep it for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speak it i came out and declared i cannot be poor nobody taught me and i had never read it in a book nor had i heard it said by anyone or when that light became abundant in my heart my mouth just spoke it out i couldn't keep it do you think drunkards plan what they say no it is out of the abundance of the wine they're filled with that their mouth speaks friend go ahead and talk it a man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth and the recompense of a man's hands shall be rendered unto him proverbs 12 verse 14 that means what you do and what you talk weighs the same do you want to see good things like prosperity in your life it will come by the fruits of your lips what you say determines the good you will experience a man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth proverbs 13 verse 2 all those negative poverty talks you engage in in your privacy is the reason for the equally private sufferings you're experiencing there are certain things you must never say i have never talked need with my wife since we got married not one day have we had any private discussion about trouble death and life are in the heart of the tongue so your mouth is the trigger for the blessings 
things you are looking for until you talk it you can't take it it is one major lesson in the school of prosperity let me quickly say that when you're not doing it but you are talking it it's an empty talk or when you're on course and you're giving it expression with your mouth you're ready for your manifestation those who talk what they shouldn't talk will eat violence they will never cease from having troubles note that whether you speak it to someone or to yourself it weighs the same just as the prodigal son talked himself back home many people talk themselves away from home somebody says this prosperity they have been talking about i think the whole thing is a matter of luck because for the past how many years i've been given but you see it is that way you've been talking that won't let your given produce you are talking that way because you are thinking that way prosperity is not by confessing it it is by reality doing what it takes to make it happen i always tell people until you do what i do you never see what i see the children of israel had come a long way they had traveled 40 years or when it remained just a few more days to enter the promised land their mouth did not allow them a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled proverbs 18 verse 20 stop sharing trials as what you talk is what you possess rather start talking testimonies don't kill that business don't destroy that enterprise don't bury your destiny through ignorance it's time to come online with god's covenant demands for kingdom blessings no one enters the land flowing with the milk and honey until he talks it anybody else is free to stay in the desert but you have a destiny with god that guarantees you a dwelling place in the land flowing with the milk and honey if you're doing what he demands go ahead and talk it so as to enhance your speed of accomplishment i'm not telling you to go about bragging no what i mean is you giving expression to your stand in god making it a lifestyle i talk my way out of the midst of mockers who are still paupers and beggars today ask god for the grace to talk your way into the land flowing with the milk and honey ask god to touch your tongue with a coal of fire so that it will not stop you from entering your land and flowing with the milk and honey let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause yeah let them say continually let the lord be magnified which has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant psalm 35 verse 27 let them say continually he said to joshua this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success but it can't get to your mouth until it is full in your heart let them say continually not in church only but continually no one succeeds by accident what you say matters to your destiny and the realization of your redemptive rights in god the way you look and talk determines what awaits you in life the tongue is a world of evil when you don't know how to put it to work it has cost many their lives because death and life are in the power of the tongue what man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see it keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile psalm 34 verse 12 to 13 keep your tongue from speaking the things you don't believe in you want to see good speak good say with me lord teach me how to speak because i know that prosperity is tied to the tongue what you've been doing with your hands notwithstanding it is your mouth that ultimately determines your results why should you allow your tongue to destroy your destiny if you fail the mouth test then you have failed indeed because everything answers to what you say chapter 20 thinking 
And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yeah, I have cursed them already, because ye do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed, and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your swollen faces and one shall take you away with it malachi 2 verse 1 to 3 thanking is the seventh unshakable strategy for unlimited prosperity the prophet of prosperity began in malachi chapter 1 with give quality seed in chapter 2 it was give glory and in chapter 3 he said the whole world will know the difference between you and others giving glory to god is your final step into the realm of unlimited prosperity hearken to me ye that follow after righteousness ye that seek the lord look unto the rock whence ye have healed and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged look unto abraham your father and unto sarah that bear you for i called him alone and blessed him and increased him isaiah 51 verse 1 to 2 god is saying look at abraham watch and follow in his footsteps then i will convert your wilderness into a garden of eden still talking about abraham let's look at romans 4 verse 18 to 20 who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken so shall thy seed be and being not weak in faith he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old neither yet the deadness of sarah's womb he staggered not at the promise of god through unbelief but was strong in faith giving glory to god it was his giving glory that opened him up for his miracle nothing had happened but he kept on giving glory to god he considered not the deadness of his situation friend your either thanking and giving glory to god or you are murmuring against him the cheapest way out of murmuring is to be thankful there's no way you will not murmur if you're not thankful abraham did not stagger at the promise of god he was strong in faith giving glory to god he was thankful to god even before he saw what he was believing god for he was able to do so by refusing to consider any contrary thing other than god who is faithful to be thankful is to be fruitful and to be thankless is to be fruitless until you become thankful you don't become fruitful let the people praise thee o god let all the people praise thee then shall the earth yield her increase and god even our own god shall bless us god shall bless us and all the ends of the earth shall fear him psalm 67 verse 5 to 7 we don't praise after the increase has come but before it is the praise that provokes the increase abraham gave glory to god and then god responded every time you sit in the corner of your room wondering if god is still there if his word can still be relied upon whether he is who he says he is or whether the preachers are just playing smart on you you remain on the same spot every time you're cast down you can't go up those who look up to the sun don't see the shadows they looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed psalm 34 verse 5 i will lift up mine eyes unto the hill from whence cometh my help my help cometh from the lord which made heaven and earth he will not suffer thy foot to be moved he that keepeth thee will not slumber psalm 121 verse 1 to 3 my help is alive my help is alert awake thou that sleepest all these stylish murmuring grumblings and grudges are the reason your life is not shining you are never fruitful until you're thankful you don't give thanks after the fruit because 
You don't see fruits without thanks. Thanking comes before the fruits and continues after it. Until you give thanks, nothing multiplies. Jesus gave thanks over the five loaves and two fishes and they multiplied and fed five thousand people with twelve baskets left over there was no multiplication until jesus gave thanks you have complained enough about that business of yours give him thanks watering your seed soon i have planted apollos watered but god gave the increase i regard giving working thinking trusting and waiting as seed planting while i consider talking and thinking as watering paul planted and apollos watered so we do both the planting and the watering first then and only then can god give the increase until we have have planted and watered god is not committed to bring increases away when you put a mirror before your mouth and you speak and sing what do you see moist on the mirror so when you're talking or singing we produce moist a form of watering so many have planted but very few have successfully watered so there's no increase talking and thinking is the watering dimension in the school of prosperity a man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth and the recompense of a man's hand shall be rendered unto him proverbs 12 verse 14 the fruits come out of his son's seed as he speaks don't walk with the murmurers it's contagious don't sell your birthright to unproductive friendship don't be where your spirit cannot be relaxed when they say how are things with you say fantastic praise god and they will leave you alone you know giving is serving god and he said and ye shall serve the lord your god and he shall bless thy bread and thy water and i will take sickness away from the midst of thee exodus 23 verse 25 you've been giving your best that's why god is giving you these strategies so you can bring home your harvest there will be no more wasted in your life again none of your seeds will be wasted anymore grace to live a life of thanksgiving and to remain thankful no matter what receive it now in jesus Jesus name take hold of opportunities every opportunity holds a fortune for the opportuned may god help you to grab with your two hands every opportunity that comes your way one of my sons in the ministry wrote his book making the most of opportunity success is not closer to you than failure is they are both equally close you just choose the one you want what you receive is not what makes you what you give is what makes you it is the gift of a man that makes room for him and brings him before great men it is your giving that establishes a throne for you not what you receive but i rejoiced in the lord greatly that now at the last your care of me has flourished again wherein ye were also careful for ye lacked opportunity philippians 4 verse 10 several god ordained opportunities will keep coming your way there are also men created and prophets proclaimed opportunities all these are opportunities clamoring for your lifting it is opportunity that be gets dignity many don't see it when it comes by but the ones that see it fly with it may god help you to see opportunity when it's passing your way every opportunity for sacrifice always results in outstanding liftings and guarantees the turning of captivity as we have therefore opportunity let us do good unto all men especially unto them who are of the household of faith 
Galatians 6 verse 10. Giving therefore takes advantage of opportunities. Those who can see it enter into financial dignity and all the blessings that follow it. One day, many years ago, I had 700 naira with which I wanted to buy a motorbike. But a need was announced in a fellowship I attended and I believed God was creating an opportunity for me. So I dived in and I didn't need to buy a motorbike again. I have at present given over 20 cars out to people. Don't dodge opportunities as it may turn out to become a lifetime regret for you. Dive into any opportunity that comes your way and God will make sure you live by it. Every opportunity holds a fortune. Let's respond to them. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our song with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalm 126 verse 1 to 6. Every acceptable sacrifice to God turns the captivity of men. There's a difference between giving and sacrifice. A sacrifice must cost you something. Second Samuel 24 verse 24. It is that cost that eventually determines your worth. This testimony would bless you. In August last year, during the Breakthrough Seminar, the bishop quoting from Psalm 50 verse 5 said, Gather all my sins together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. He also quoted from Psalm 126 verse 5, which it says, He that soweth in tears shall reap in joy. He then told us to give the most precious thing we had, that anyone that obeyed would be gloriously exempted from the horrors that would visit the earth. Right there, I heard your TV. I said, my wife would not allow this. It was a 21-inch color TV. If you come into my living room, you will see it standing very beautifully there. So when the voice came again, do you want to be exempted between your TV and eating fine and having all the things you desire? Which do you choose? I was afraid because I didn't know how to convince my wife. Everybody in the house loved the TV. They were always there watching it. They even forgot their food to watch it. On getting home that night, I asked my wife what she had in mind for us to sow a seed to the kingdom. She was talking about a wristwatch and the likes. But I said, no, that TV is going. By the time we were ready for the service the following day, my household was gathered in the living room. Watching the TV, I told my house girl, who also loved the TV, to go and put it off. Without talking to anyone, I packed it back into its case and carried it out. I waved down a taxi and with my wife, I came to church. By the time offering was being collected, an usher helped me to carry it forward. On returning to my seat, I saw tears in my wife's eyes. I told her that she was embarrassing me, but she said, No, my tears is because the Lord has accepted our offering. Deep inside me, I too was weeping. But when I remembered the bishop saying, There is no reward for what you don't do willingly, I said, This weeping might rob me of my blessings. But I remembered verse 6 of Psalm 126. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. I said, Lord, my weeping is tears of joy, not that I am not willing. And between January and now, I have 
not only replaced that TV set with another beautiful one, I've also paid a six-figure amount as tight. I used to pay a four-figure amount last year as my Ajib subscription, but this year I increased it to a five-figure amount and I've paid till april i've acquired a vehicle worth half a million naira a house i abandoned in my hometown since 1989 has been roofed and is all completed now things are just growing on their own accord for me Oguelu K. the same man a few months later sacrificed a mercedes benz when an offering for foreign mission was raised in church his captivity was was turned and all the witches sitting on his destiny were destroyed all by the mystery of sacrifice when a call for sacrifice is made don't say i don't have the cloth on your body can be given as a sacrifice if you let the opportunity pass you by you may end up in the pit every opportunity is god's design for the turning of your captivity don't let it pass you by remember that god is not in need he's only presenting you with opportunities for the turning of your own captivity if you don't mind opportunities you're sure to lose dignity when you offer something that cost you something certain plagues stop in your life no matter who puts it there noah built an altar and it became the place of his destiny once when there was a need in the church my family gave and gave until milk and egg disappeared from our house but see how they come in now i sacrificed my way to the heights i'm living in now everything that accomplished the covenant of giving becomes your portion from this moment your business will never go down you will never be trapped in borrowing again for every work you have done you will be paid no devil will cheat you of your labors anymore this day marks the end of your struggles enter into your problem free season in life in jesus mighty name part 5 the hidden covenants chapter 21 your responsibility to your parents children honor thy father and mother which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth ephesians 6 verse 1 to 3 a son honoreth his father if then i be a father where is mine honor malachi 1 verse 6 man's placement is a function of the secrets made available to him as you utilize these secrets they will enhance your position there are many christians today that it is not well with it is neither well with their business nor with their families if things are not well with you this might as well be the reason honor thy father and mother this is the first commandment talking to the post pentecostal church of jesus christ God has a place for our parents. We have an undeniable responsibility towards them. The way you relate with them tells on your well-being. You are eating so well out there, enjoying yourself, while your parents are somewhere else, suffering hunger and deprivation. Watch it. It may be well with you for a season, but not for all seasons. There are too many people who are paying tight and giving offerings, but it is not well with them because this major covenant is out of place. They eat everything they get. They don't remember they have a father and a mother. It is your job to honor your father and your mother. Let me tell you something. You can't change your father. It is too late. Nor can you stop honoring them 
God says, I will dishonor you. You can't be eating turkey, beef, chicken, fish, salad, and all kinds of stuff like that while your parents are out there virtually starving. God said it won't be well with you. You say, but I give my tithe. Yes, but the scriptures cannot be broken. It is the one you are breaking that is breaking you. There must be a change. You must respond to the demands of the covenant. We remember the same Ephesians 6 verse 3 says, And thou mayest live long on the earth. This is an assurance, a guarantee that accidents can't claim your life, nor can witches and wizards because you are on a covenant wavelength with God. Many of you, your parents have never seen your one naira or one cent if you are an American. No wonder you are struggling and sweating. There is something in parental blessings. You better go and look for it. There was a man called Isaac who when he was about to die called his son Esau and said to him, Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison and make me sovereign meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless thee before I die. Genesis 27 verse 3 to 4. Parental blessings are important to our lives. They are as important as the blessings of God. We must add this to our Christian conscience. It is part of the covenant that connects you and I to divine providence. It is your covenant responsibility to honor your parents according to the level to which God has blessed you. You don't have the fattest calf in your flock and carry the blind and lame to them. You don't take friends to five-star hotels to feast and then send some miserable amounts of money to your parents as though they are beggars. You owe them a covenant responsibility. It's not an admonition it's a command you can't have parents who don't have food to eat and you're wasting food in your home proverbs 20 verse 20 to 22 warns whoso cursed his father or his mother his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness and inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning but the end thereof shall not be blessed. Say not thou, I will recompense evil, for wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. I know many of our parents must have done certain unforgettable things. Forget that. Do what God tells you to do. He says, Say not thou, I will recompense evil. Even if those your parents have done you any hurt, that does not give you a license to dishonor them. No matter what they did against you you are not permitted to retaliate the covenant forbids it you are forbidden to revenge this is essentially remarkable for those from polygamous setups especially those whose mothers have polluted their minds against their fathers now you are a new creation all things are passed away and all things are become new your light will not be put out in Jesus name. I so loved my grandmother who taught me the ways of God even though she could not read. It was from her I learned the importance of tithing in practical terms. I always watched her talk away some amount of money all the time. When her asked her about it she made me to understand that tithe was the tenth of anything you have which is God's own portion and that it is the way to to keep the enemy off the work of your hands. The first money I earned in my life, I used it to buy two chairs and a center table for her. She asked me how I was going to feed, and I told her the Lord will provide. Then she blessed me saying, 
you shall be great. There is so much in parental blessings. Esau wept and wept when he lost his parental blessings to Jacob. Genesis 27 verse 38. But there was no room for repentance. But thank God there is a place for repentance for you right now. You have forgotten them long enough. Write them now and tell them you are sorry. And put a seed of repentance inside. From then, include them in your covenant relationship with God. And watch what will happen. Until you start doing what he commands, the struggle continues. It is time to honor your parents on a regular viable budget. Something must always go out in love from you to them with an understanding of God's secrets. Then their soul begins to bless you. After Isaac ate the venison, his heart went out to Jacob and poured him out a blessing, such that at the time Esau came, he said his soul was now empty of any more blessings. As he blessed Jacob, you could see something leaping from his inside. It is time for something to start leaping from your parents inside towards you whether they say it or not the covenant keeping god will watch over his word to establish it the covenant is so strong i found this secret long ago i was so religiously committed to doing it like i do to titan there was a level at which i started before i got to where i am now stop eating everything or you will eventually eat up your destiny. There is something in their hearts that you need to draw out before they depart this earth. Whether they are rich or poor is irrelevant. Is God poor? Is God in need? The offerings you give to God, did he complain to you that he has problem? Why are you giving and giving? Your parents don't have to be in problem before you fulfill your responsibility towards them. It is a covenant demand. I don't care how much you are earning. You have a duty towards your parents. Let there be a new beginning. If you are still financially dependent on any of your parents as an adult, it is a curse. It is not scriptural. There is nothing you do to them that your children will not do to you. Watch it. Don't ignore your parents in the deceits of civilization. Make your parents understand your Christianity and see how they will storm into the kingdom. As you show them practical Christianity, Christianity, they will embrace your Savior and enter heaven with you. As you walk in this covenant, as it was with Jacob after Isaac had blessed him. Genesis 27 verse 25 to 29. Your smell will begin to change. You become uncursable. You are not only uncursable, but everyone that attempts to curse you is already cursed. I am blessed from heaven and I am blessed from human beings because I am walking in this covenant with full understanding. Words of blessings that come my way, even when I am not there, won't let anybody kill me because I am honoring my father and mother. God has promise that I will live long. I know no one can kill me. You must not close your eyes to the needs of your people. If you let your parents enjoy you, you also will enjoy your children and your children's children because whatsoever a man sows that he shall reap. Your children will build houses fully furnished and hand over the keys to you because you sowed that seed before. It's time to start sowing those seeds start from somewhere what you don't start does not grow a child that is not born does not grow into a man start from where you are presently if your parents are still alive write them and let them know you love them at the slightest opportunity be on your way to see them with a blessing in your hand to collect blessings from them the word of god says you will live 
live long you shall be full of health and vitality success and victory if you honor your father and mother it also says it shall be well with you that is god will make sure it is well with your business your family your career and your ministry you won't lose anything to the devil anymore we minister to our parents as we minister to the lord it is a command not an admonition isaac said give me the venison such as i love that my soul may bless thee every time you respond to your parents you are giving them the venison that they love and their soul will bless you the blessing that isaac placed on jacob made it impossible for a curse to work against him he was not a candidate for success at all even from his name he should have been a failure but he was the one who brought the venison yes he was the one that got the blessing anyone who brings the venison is the one who gets the blessing while esau was still taking his time jacob went through with the venison and every blessing in the heart of isaac was poured out on him by the time esau came there was nothing left nobody must take your blessing if you want it to be well with you your business career and family you must not curse your father or your mother or your light will be put out in obscure darkness you must not live as if you are dead to them somebody met me and said both his father and mother are dead and he knows he did not do what he should have done when they were alive he was thus asking what he should now do i said to him whatever they should have been doing if they were alive be doing it on their behalf i think it's time for a change chapter 22 your responsibility to your family likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge giving honor unto the wife has unto the weaker vessel and has been hers together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered first peter 3 verse 7 any house that is leaking is not worthy for harvest tension within the family system disqualifies it from divine blessings husband give honor to your wife to be wiser than god is a risk deal with your wife according to knowledge that your prayers be not hindered that is that your connection with god be not disconnected deal with her according to knowledge otherwise your heaven will be closed you see every time you give you are asking by action the bible is here saying that every time you don't deal with your wife according to knowledge your prayers are hindered no response will come from heaven you are under a leaking roof it is not worthy of a harvest if you have a leaking store do you keep things in it if your family life is leaking your home is not conducive for a harvest disallow any leakage in your home or the heavens will withhold their rain of blessings deal with your wife according to knowledge what is this knowledge ephesians 5 verse 25 says husbands love your wives even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that is the knowledge that will check leakage in your family and help you to experience harvest you must not open up your home to malice you must not allow discord to enter into your home you must not give the devil a place or your access to god's blessings will be blocked giving honor unto the wife that's against the african mentality let me ask you if a car is involved in an accident who do you question the passenger or the driver who should you blame when the eden car had an accident who was god looking for genesis 3 verse 9 says and the lord god called unto adam and said unto him where art thou i don't care what your theology is if there 
there is any problem in your home, you, the man, are the number one suspect. That is the truth. Your knowledge of family life is inadequate. That is what has led to that eruption in your home. You can avoid problems. You can subdue them. You can overcome them. You can prevail over them. Let every man understand this today. Deal with your wife according to knowledge. Give honor to your wife and shut the devil out in the dark. You will begin to have fantastic experiences in your home and in your relationship with your wife. Ephesians 5 verse 21 says, Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. When you want it your own way all the time, that is the spirit of Pharaoh, not the spirit of God. The moment your wife can't talk as your wife, your husband can't talk. That is the spirit of the devil. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. If the spirit of God dwells in your house, there must be liberty in your relationship with each other. For by the time you enter, like the lion of the tribe of your house, and everybody is hiding under the bed, certainly the spirit of the Lord is not there. The way you are living your life, that nobody can talk to you, is the shortest cut to destruction. Your greatest help is your wife. Anything that makes you feel otherwise is the devil. Husband, you are commanded to love your wife as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. You are to do the washing, the cleansing, and the sanctification. Any leakage you allow in your family is the reason God will not allow any harvest to come in there. God hates waste. After the feeding of the 5,000 men, he instructed them to gather the remnants. You must block every leakage in your home. I see God giving you wisdom. Provide for your household. Paul the Apostle came by a very strong revelation in 1 Timothy 5 verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. The responsibility of providing for the home is the man's job. Otherwise, he will live a life worse than the sinner's life. When the earth is burning like an oven, he will also be burnt. Man, it is your covenant responsibility to provide for your household. When you stop looking after your own children, you come under a curse. No matter how much you give to God, it is written off. No matter the tithes and offerings you give, the Bible says you have denied the faith. That is, you will suffer what the unbelievers suffer. When you embrace the word of God, your destiny is established. To provide for your family is your duty as a man. It is your job. It is not to be shared with your wife or anybody else. It must be joyfully accepted and excitedly executed. You will not disappoint God. You must be concerned about your wife and your children's welfare. You must be concerned. It must be seen as your responsibility. You must embrace it. You must be concerned about the clothes your wife wears. It's your job so you are not disconnected from eternal life. That your family has not eaten and you're going about town is a curse. Return home and make things right. Otherwise, there is no prayer you pray that God will hear. The Bible says, if any man provide not. Not if any man and his wife provide not. No, if you are violating this covenant, you need to tell your wife you are sorry and ask her for forgiveness. How can you be a man and not be bothered what food your children are eating or what clothes they're wearing. What kind of Christianity is that? 
That is not right. It's satanic. You have no right to put on a tie except your children are dressed. This is why all your tithes and offering and kingdom investments are not yielding anything. It is because you are of course. Man, your family is your covenant responsibility, not a cultural or social responsibility. You should be glad to ask in your home. I hope you have all eaten. God did not give you those children by force. You asked for them. Get to work therefore. It's time to walk in the light so there will be no more occasion for stumbling. You are not permitted to go about the market pricing tomatoes, crayfish, pepper, etc. just because you don't trust your wife to handle money. No, that's not your job. I see it as as an act of distrust. There will be no more leakage in your family, in your home, no more leakage in your finances too. That out of the little money you earn, you can still map out some amount for each of your children and it goes into a particular account for them and it is there and available whenever it is needed what a joy what a father the word of god says a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children proverbs 13 verse 22 now that you have not even died and they are not enjoying you when will they enjoy you you have not died and they can not see anything coming from you you might as well write your will instructing that when you die they should open your stomach and put all your money and possessions in there so you can go with it I practice some strange things in my family all my children pay tight i am initiating them into the covenant work you know when one is a witch for example he makes a witch out of his son and making saints out of my children they pay tight they make kingdom investments every offering and blessings people give them goes into a bag that is their own i don't rely on that to take care of them i have a monthly allocation for each of them everybody living in my house as an inheritance that is why i can't go down i'm too mindful of covenant details i deliver this to you today please go and walk in this light life can be very fulfilling when you walk in the light if a husband and his wife are hiding things from each other such a home is a dangerous place if you enter into a home and the place is hot won't you know you start apologizing for coming and you speedily find your way out even so when an angel comes with blessings and enters such a home and senses such tension and hostility he will retreat with the blessings because angels only embrace hospitality and in a hostile environment you cannot be hospitable may your home be open to angels you won't lose your blessings anymore i see a new change coming i see you accept your covenant responsibility and flying to untold heights by it i see you looking at your children with excitement not with a burden i see you paying their school fees without frowning i see you buying them clothes with excitement excitement it is a new day for you wives submit yourselves wives submit yourself unto your own husband in the first home instituted by god in the garden of eden adam was the head of the government and god presented eve to him to be under his government this is god's divine order in the home any wife that despises it has no access to covenant blessings adam allowed eve to do whatever she liked hence she walked freely and carelessly about and got trapped into a conversation with the devil which eventually led to their downfall many problems in the home today are largely caused by wives over whom their husbands have no control they buy whatever they like 
at any time they like according to their whims and caprices they dress anyhow and go all over the places as if they don't have a head they keep any kind of friends like they like in god's family government the man is the head while the woman is the subject woman you must wake up to your responsibility your role is to be a helpmate for your husband you are not to lord it over over him in any way you are meant to help him carry out his god-given commission on us hear this god is not the author of confusion he will not give the man a commission to go to new zealand and ask the wife to go to the united states a woman who supposedly has a vision which is miles apart from that of her husband has not seen well a wife's vision should complement that of her husband if not directly subject to it the wife is to be subject to her husband in all things even as the church is subject to christ Total submission is the word. Take a look at the church in relation to Christ. With Jesus as head, there is neither argument nor debate. He gives the orders. He is the head and rules the church in love. What the church does is to obey. We are also just subject to Christ. So also the wife is subject to her husband. The only way to a fruitful marriage is total submission on the part part of the wife until this is in place every other thing she tries to do will be out of place submission cuts across all spheres of life a woman who refuses to submit to her husband is disobeying god as a woman you might even be a minister of the gospel and your husband is not the word of god still says you submit yourself to him you might be earning more money than he does but that does not not in any way make the word of god of no effect submit to him in action in word in looks etc peter puts it this way likewise ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands. 1 Peter 3 verse 1 The wife is subject to her husband. Note, however, that subjection without meekness is fake. It takes meekness to be submissive. Sarah is a perfect example of a woman whose submission to her husband was total. When he told her to tell inquirers that she was his sister, she readily complied. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, took her in. She was in danger. But she stuck to her husband's command. God was moved. He came down and intervened. Genesis 12, verse 10 to 20. God can only intervene in your affairs when his instructions are being heard, heard to. A woman should be submissive to her husband in all things, and not only when he is good to her. A submissive woman is precious in the sight of her husband. My wife respects me and believes in everything I do. She never raises an eyebrow about any decision I take. This is the reason she's enjoying the rewards of total submission today. She does not need to ask for anything before she gets it from me. I give her all the honor and love due to her. This is the secret of marital bliss and success in every endeavor of life. Obedience to covenant demands will always establish covenant blessings. Chapter 23 Keep your eyes on the plow. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of god luke 9 verse 62 unfortunately many christians have become lot's wife in business they look backwards all the time those who look backwards remain backward only those who look forward go forward jesus in the scripture above says that anyone that puts his hand on the plow and looks back there is nothing the kingdom has to offer that will be available to him those 
who do know their God, they shall be strong and they shall do exploits. Exploits in the kingdom, therefore, has its root in the knowledge of God. Daniel 11 verse 32. Those who know their God, not those who cry or weep, not those who run around. There was famine in the land, yet Isaac prospered. There was famine in the days of Abraham, yet he went forward. There was famine in the days of Jacob, yet he could afford to import fruit from a foreign land. Those who do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Your problem is not in the environment. It is in the mind. It is not the happenings around. It is the happenings within. The environment is not harsh. Many are having the best of time while many are having the hardest of time. Don't say it is because I know God. That is why things are like this for me. Those who know their God don't go down. The knowledge of God does not not bring a man down it lifts a man up don't say it is because i'm a christian if i was still there like i was before and doing the things we used to do beware otherwise you will become a pillar of salt those who look back don't see the front neither do they get to the front it is not possible for life outside christ to be comparable to life in christ no to say that the former days are better than now is to act like a fool it cannot be sweeter anywhere else than with jesus nor can it be better anywhere else there is nothing that has value outside god nothing i would like to show you what it is like outside christ in 1923 there was a company of people about seven of them who met in chicago they were the world's greatest financiers among them was the president of the largest private steel industry the president of bank international settlement a member of the president's cabinet etc these seven men controlled more wealth than the wealth of the united states of america's treasury but all that was outside christ Three of these seven world's greatest financiers ended up committing suicide. One of them became insane. Another ended up in prison. The president of the world's largest private steel company died penniless after living on borrowed money for five years. This is the bitter end of possession outside salvation. But... For the believer, better is the end of a sin than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8 Life outside Christ is worthless. It doesn't matter what you think you're worth. If it is outside Christ, it is deception. God's ways might be slow, but they are sure. If the facts are in place, your destiny is certain. God is more than enough. In spite of whatever economic constraints and pressures you find yourself in, you can walk by his principles and still thrive and make great progress in life. It is also important to mention that you are by destiny a fruitful person because you belong to the household of Israel. According to Isaiah 5 verse 1, all you need is to apply yourself to the things you are hearing. There is no dry land. There are only dry men. You can stand out and stand right, overcome, win, and flourish. After the black man was set free politically from slave trade, he re-entered it personally. Just like in the days of Joseph in Egypt, when there was heat in the land and people offered themselves for sale by us, they cried out. Africans in search of solutions re-entered situations and established more problems for themselves. 
But thank God the prison gates are lifted. You will not be enslaved anymore. There is nothing wrong with any land. There are only things wrong with the people. There is a ministry in a certain country that wrote us desperately desiring financial assistance. But in that same country, there is another ministry that has built a university. They call the man the oral robots of that country. Whatever is wrong with you, God will correct it. There was no food in Egypt. Egyptians were dying, yet God was blessing Israel. The Egyptians were offering themselves for sale and Israel was increasing on the other side. In the same Egypt, Genesis 47 verse 27, what was the reason for the difference covenant push the covenant nothing compares in value with the covenant the other man is pushing drugs you push the truth that other man is using charms you use god let's see which is greater god or charms the problem with people is that they don't want to face the roots of their problems they would rather look for how to explain other people's success there is nothing you need that is not provided for in the bible therefore go for it from the word of God, we have seen that even if money fails, you still have room to succeed. Is it not you, God told that you will be a succorer to the hungry? He said, I was hungry. You didn't give me food. Matthew 25 verse 42. That is because he knows you have food to give. You will not beg. You belong to that royal company. You can't keep living like a slave. It has nothing to do with the government in power in your country. The government of heaven, of which you are a citizen, is still intact and in power. It is your attitude that must change. Jesus is still the King of kings and Lord of lords. That means you are not controlled by the policies of your nation. You are controlled by the covenant of God with his chosen people. You cannot run your business like the heathen in your country or you will feel as they feel. You cannot beg from under like they do or you will keep crawling on the ground. You cannot be given money from behind or you will stay behind for life. Any business that will not let you walk with God is a business that will walk you down to hell. Get out of it into something else. We have heard diverse testimonies that show that Jesus is more than sufficient to make a star out of anybody who will stick with him. He said in Hebrews 10 verse 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. You belong to the order of the choicest vine. Hence, you must mind the little, little things that make it difficult for you to be fruitful and successful. Mind them and then be able to free yourself from them. All I am saying is to help you know that where you are facing is the right way to face and what you have been told to do is the right thing to do. If you follow it that way, you are on your way to the top. Chapter 24 The Little Things to Mind when you embrace the word of God, your destiny is established. These hidden covenants of blessings you now know about are the minutest details that may not appeal to charismatic Yankees. Yet, they are details you cannot neglect. These are all hidden covenant mysteries that make your seeds to bring forth in hundred folds now in this life and in the world to come they are what make give and it shall be given unto you effective thank god for all that you have given to the kingdom thank god for all your tithes 
thank God for all your offerings. These are other covenant responsibilities that make those ones produce. They are all hidden issues that make life buoyant. You know why God is showing you all these? He's eager to reward you. He sees your faithfulness, commitment, dedication, and zeal. Hence, he has to open these seals to you that will help your rewards to reach you. You are too dedicated and committed to fill. These little, little foxes must be taken off. You know how? how it is that a cocoa plantation needs to be fumigated to kill certain insects that won't let the cocoa tree stay healthy. They are the things that want to kill your cocoa trees and make them unproductive. You are killing them so they don't destroy the labor of your hands. Your labor will not be destroyed anymore. Oh, what a blessing to know where to place these things in the covenant. It's time to allow for a change that will reflect in the work you are doing. You display things in your shop and nobody is buying them. Can't you find out what is happening? The covenant is power. Discover it. Make it a lifestyle. See yourself as a responsible Christian walking in the covenant by giving the right place to every instruction. Instructions are the ways of wisdom them telling you how to do things to get your desired results proverbs 24 verse 14 says so shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul when thou hast found it then there shall be a reward and that expectation shall not be cut off these little things will help you out no matter how tough the situation will not go down anymore in jesus precious name forgive therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which will take account of his servants and when he had begun to reckon one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents but for as much as he had not to pay the lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him saying lord have patience with me and i will pay thee all then the lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt for the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him an hundred pence and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying pay me that thou owest and his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him saying have patience with me and i will pay thee all and he would not but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt so when his fellow servants saw what was done they were very sorry and came and told unto their lord all that was done then the lord after that he had called him said unto him o thou wicked servant i forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant even as i had pity on thee and his lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him so likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Matthew 18 verse 23 to 35. If anybody is owing you and you know he is not in a position to pay, just say, I forgive you. God has more for you than any man is owing you. Forgive the person. Then what to see whether God is more than that or not. Don't bind your brother or sister because he or she is owing you. Don't make them live under tension. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear has torments. 
don't torment your business anymore. Now tell me, if that money was taken by your son and he is not able to pay you, do you disown him? Jesus said, so shall the Lord do to every one of you. If you will not from your heart forgive your brother, where the person is not in a position to pay you, don't become possessed with the situation. Every form of hatred has torments. Today, that brother or sister needs help, but tomorrow he can become a source of help to you. God is faithful. You can let go today. Obey your master. There is another powerful covenant in Ephesians chapter 6, which forbids servants undoing their master. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Ephesians 6 verse 5 And again, 1 Peter 2 verse 18 says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Ephesians 6 verse 6 to 8. Many servants get into undoing their masters in a bid to rise. Every step you take against your master robs you of your promotion. Every step you take against the source of blessing that God has placed around you goes on to undo your destiny. Proverbs 27 verse 18 assures you that Whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof. So he that waiteth on his master shall be honored. When you wish your master evil, you have invited evil upon upon yourself. No matter what you have sown as seed, it dies and curse replaces blessings. Every time you begin to undo the place where you are working, you are undoing your destiny. If you don't have goodwill for where you are working, you will not enjoy goodwill. For whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall reap. Please take note of this because the enemy has trapped many in this curse. You must not allow God to touch you for evil. Honor whosoever he has honored and bless whosoever he has blessed. You must ensure that you keep a clean heart and allow goodwill to ooze from you all day long towards your master, the place where you walk then your destiny is guaranteed. The only way to be honored is when you recognize the position of people that are placed over you. You are not to worship them, but to hold them in honor and not allow your heart to curse them. When you wait on your master, his kind of heart is transmitted to you. As in water, face answered to water, so the heart of a man to man. Proverbs 27 verse 19. You also reflect the dignity and honor he carries. Please lay hold on this secret. In 1 Samuel 24 verse 5 to 6, we see a man, David, who waited on his master, even to the point of taking his own life in his own hands. For if Saul had woken up, David would have been a dead man. Saul did not wake up, yet David did not kill him. He dared not touch God's anointed. He kept the covenant, and the covenant kept him. In First Chronicles 29 verse 28, it was said of him that he died in a good old age, full of days, riches, and honor. And Solomon, his son, reigned in his stead. Because he did not destroy the throne of Saul, his throne was not destroyed. He saw his son to the thrones. God protected his throne for an everlasting covenant. 
covenant because he protected Saul's throne. Friend, nobody needs to die for you to rise. The one who needs to die for you to rise has already done so. His name is Jesus. Leave the curses alone and go for the blessings. If you see a man who has no regard for his master, run away from him. Run for your life. This is the secret behind your welfare and long life. Your level of giving is amazing. Please let your level of reward received be equally amazing. A great spirit is the only way to go without curses. Be sure from today that you keep a good heart. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters in the flesh. I don't care where you are working, be obedient to your master with fear and singleness of heart as unto Christ. Do service as to the Lord and not to men. Many businesses have been destroyed today by the people who are working there, either with their mouth or with insincerity in their dealings. It is not enough to pay tithes and give offering and invest in the kingdom it is also important to represent jesus where you are working concerning joseph in genesis 39 verse 2 to 6 and the lord was with joseph and he was a prosperous man and he was in the house of his master the egyptian and his master saw that the lord was with him and that the lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand and joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had he put into his hand and it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had that the lord blessed the egyptian's house for joseph's sake and the blessing of the lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field and he left all that he had in joseph's hand and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat and joseph was a godly person and well favored that establishment that business where you are working should not die if you are standing right with god as long as you don't desire the rise of the place where you are working neither will you rise yourself you are not faithful in the thing which is another man's no one will give you that which is your own luke 16 verse 12 let every clerk know that if he doesn't want to die a clerk it is time to be faithful and do his service as unto the Lord. Joseph was a houseboy and God blessed the house of his master for his sake. Consequently, he enjoyed favor and promotion until he ended up as prime minister in a land where he was a stranger. Many people have been paying tithes and giving offerings diligently yet nothing is forthcoming as harvest something is wrong it is the little foxes that spoil the vine a car doesn't need to have a major problem before it is grounded just a faulty plug is enough god is showing you these things so you can escape servants let your heart bless your bosses if you want honor wait on those whom god has placed as leaders over you you will in turn enjoy the shields over their lives curse them and you are cursed that is the covenant pay your workers well for the laborer is worthy of his hire luke 10 verse 7 if you are in a business where you hire laborers people who work for you and you are living in splendor without considering them you are a fraud your business will not flourish that is the word of god the scriptures cannot be broken so put a secretary on seat to work from morning to late at night and all you pay her is 1200 naira that's wickedness you don't need a secretary carry a pen and paper and be writing the things down yourself 
I'm glad to tell you that God pays his people. He is a rewarder of those who diligently serve him. If you are not in a position to pay your workers, let them know and give them a chance to choose either to go or to stay. May you allow people under you to grow. Pay your workmen or do your work yourself. You go to five-star hotels to squander money, pissing friends and so-called business associates, and you pay your workmen 1,000 naira a month. You are a wicked fellow. Mind you, a maid or slave today is not going to be one tomorrow. Don't look at him as a slave. Remember Joseph? Remember your father in heaven is a loving father. You will eat all the fruit of your labor. From today, you shall be reckoned with by all around you as very great. There will be no more leakage in your home and in your family. There will be no more leakage in your finances too. Let's invite the harvest. Give your job all it takes. Black has nothing to do with the color of your skin. Slothfulness and lack of commitment to your job, your business, or your responsibilities are what make you black. Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyard, but my own vineyard have I not kept. Songs of Solomon 1 verse 6 God has delivered you. Don't put yourself back in chains. There is enough to do in your own country that will bring you lifting. May you find it. Never mind the retirement age of the government. At 75, Abraham was still a worker. At 92, he led an army out to war. He was a cattle rarer. He became very rich in silver and in gold. Listen to me. If they retire you at 50, it is for a new chapter to open in your life. If you go to sit down at 50, you will decay before you are 60. If Abraham was strong at 100, by the time you are 100, you will have the strength of a 40-year-old. Caleb said, 40 years ago, I came out here and 40 years later, my strength is still intact. Joshua 14 verse 11. That shall be your testimony. Put in your best where you are working. Even though they don't know it now, they will know it later. The covenant will locate you and your lifting will come and your future secured. Give it all you have got. Solomon said, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10 Be known with your job. There should be no more trial and error. There is enough time to be the best God has created you to be. Have joy in the work you are doing. Be excited about the labor of your hands. There is a future in it. Never catch yourself doing nothing for one whole hour. This end time, the church is getting back to her position. We are taking our position back as a pace-setting community. It shall be so in your own private life. In your business, they will know you very shortly as the one in charge. In your career too, from now on, your hand will be strong to labor. Part 6 Conclusion Chapter 25 When is my due season? And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Galatians 6 verse 9 This series on prosperity will not be complete without this subject being treated. When you have an idea of when your due season is, it becomes easy for you to stand strong in faith, not wavering. When am I due for blessings? You may be asking. God says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. 
if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Malachi 3 verse 10 When will these windows open? Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 1 We're in a scientific age. I need to know what many days means, you may be asking. Give a portion to seven and also to eight. For thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 2 Every time you give, your are laying a foundation for the time to come. So when is my due season? When your cloud is full. If the cloud be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 3 You are not due until when your cloud is full, until you have cast enough off there, laying off the treasure for yourself in heaven. Your rain of blessings will not fall upon you here on earth. How do I fill up my clouds? You fill up your clouds by casting your bread upon the waters. And when it is due, it will rain down blessings upon you. Every opportunity to give a sacrifice brings you closer to your due season because it helps to fill up your cloud faster than regular impute. That's why with every acceptable sacrifice, there's a forceful turnaround of destiny. The cloud suddenly becomes full and the rain begins to fall. Each man plays a principal role in determining his due season. Some have been regular Christians for 20 years. Others have been around for just five years and they have filled their clouds again and again and the rain just keeps falling time and again for them. It is evaporation that leads to raination. If nothing is going up from you, nothing will come down for you. Every rainy season is a time of refreshing and refreshing answers when your cloud is full. When evaporation is taking place, the earth gets drier and drier. But suddenly, when the water evaporated has condensed and the clouds can no longer contain its weight, the windows of heaven open and it comes back to the earth as rain. Your due season does not answer to prayer. It only after the cloud of your given is full that they empty themselves upon the earth as blessings. Your programmed efforts should be towards filling up the cloud again and again by giving and giving till the cloud is full. The rain will fall for every man who fills up his cloud. Every opportunity for sacrifice is to expedite your rainfall. It comes down with speed because suddenly the cloud is full. I love the scripture. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. 1 Timothy 6 verse 17 There is a responsibility that will help to keep you under heaven's refreshing, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. 1 Timothy 6 verse 18 to 19 God is not against you having pleasures. The Bible says that in his presence is fullness of joy and pleasures 
forevermore at his right hand he believes in it hence the streets of heaven are paved with gold but doing good is the only way to keep your enjoyment and pleasures on people may keep greeting you well done for your giving but until your cloud is full the rain will not fall in due season you shall reap if you faint not many faint before their due season god is not a man that he should lie you can't be due and be denied job 34 verse 10 says therefore hearken unto me ye men of understanding far be it from god that he should do wickedness and from the almighty that he should commit iniquity when you are due the rain will fall but until you are due you can pray for as long as you like but nothing will happen for you why is there no rain in the desert there is no evaporation there so there is no way they can have rainfall as what becomes rain takes off from the earth as vapor if nothing is going off from you you can have a desert like destiny with nothing coming down for you god is not mocked says the book of galatians whatsoever a man sows that also he shall reap friend stay on course until your heaven is full every giving we do answers in heaven and when it's due god who cannot lie and cannot deny himself who will never break his covenant makes it answer to you as blessings every opportunity for sacrifice accelerates the filling of your cloud particularly kingdom building opportunities god takes pleasure in it he is glorified by it haggai 1 verse 3 to 11 when am i due for harvest jesus gave a parable and he said so is the kingdom of god as if a man should cast it into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up he knoweth not how for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself first the blade then the ear after that the full corn in the ear but when the fruit is brought forth immediately he put it in the sickle because the harvest is come mark 4 verse 26 to 29 the subject of when is the due season for harvest has for long remained a mystery among christians people think due season is when god thinks you're due no your due season is not when you have a need either your due season is when you are due your due season is determined by your rigorous investments how much you lay up there in heaven determines when it comes down where the tree falleth there it shall be ecclesiastes 11 verse 3 whether you are living in the south or in the north in the village or in the city no matter where if your cloud is full your rain will surely fall solomon filled up his cloud in one day when he sacrificed a thousand burnt offerings unto the lord god smelled a good savour and came down by himself that same night first kings 3 verse 4 to 5 noah built an altar and sacrifice of every clean beast and every clean fowl and the lord smelt a good savour and responded noah's rain fell the same day genesis 8 verse 20 to 22 abraham laid isaac on the altar on mount moriah and the voice of god sounded forth from heaven and abraham's rain fell the same day genesis 22 verse 1 to 19 every kingdom opportunity for a sacrifice accelerates the feeling of your cloud and the outpouring of your rain note that he that observeth the wind shall not sow and he that regardeth the cloud shall not reap ecclesiastes 11 verse 4 can i do it 
should I do it? And all manner of considerations can rob you of your blessings. You don't wait for due season. You program your due season. You do so by a deliberate fast feeling of of your cloud. Let me sound a note of warning here. Never go ahead of your due season. If you do, you'll be doomed. For instance, if your neighbor or your friend starts building a house and just because you have a piece of land somewhere, you begin to consider and say to yourself, by next week, I'll have to start building my own house. Probably his due season has come and yours is still on the way. Please don't go ahead of your due season. It can take you out of the faith. If you impatiently go and uproot your natural seed in the ground in search of a harvest, what you have is just roots. It is the same thing with your financial seed. Leave that seed to mature. The due season is very close. Why God appoints a due season? There is one nature of God that is not often taught but which exists. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Deuteronomy 8 verse 2. He wants to know what is in your heart, whether it is God or money. That's why he appoints a season for your harvest. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. Verse 3. So when you see food, you will recognize and appreciate the source. Why does God appoint due season? So he can be satisfied that you are worthy of the blessings he is bringing your way. To prove you to know what is in your heart. There's no point blessing you when he's not sure of what you do with the blessing. Having then proved you, he giveth the power to get wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth the power to get wealth, and he may establish his covenant which he swore unto thy fathers as it is this day. Deuteronomy 8.18 God proves you first, so that the wealth will not become your wreck. The power to get wealth is released after you pass the test. This is why waiting is a compulsory curse in the school of prosperity. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. 1 Timothy 3 verse 10 when you are a committed and kingdom addicted christian you can easily get god committed to whatever concerns you but when he sees that you're a lover of money a lover of possession a lover of status he keeps them from you so they don't destroy you listen to this admonition in james 1 verse 3 to 4 knowing this that the trying of your faith it walk at patience. But well, let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. It takes patience to walk into the realm of no lack, Job said. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job 23 verse 10. You will pass the test. Your tomorrow is great. It's amazing and enjoyable. Friend, God is never late. Any time he comes is the best time. He is always right on time. So wait. Chapter 26. Blessings of the Giving Covenant and ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. Exodus 23 verse 25 to 26 our givings don't only bring in material blessings, they also bring in other covenant blessings that money cannot buy. Many have always thought that prosperity means just to acquire 
fire and stack of money. No, prosperity means enjoying a state of well-being and money is only one of the many things that make for well-being. Now, ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4 verse 15 to 19. The giving covenant, the covenant of prosperity covers all your needs. You are not just to enjoy financial blessings, but you're covered in all areas of life. However, it's one thing to be in the giving covenant. It's another thing to know what the package offers you. As far as your eyes can see, it shall be given unto you. Genesis 13 verse 14. Many people see only money, but there is more to the giving covenant than money. There is sickness free life, barrenness free life, miscarriage free life, death of children free life. You also freely have longevity and defense, so much more than money can buy. Let's look at them one by one. Strong, sickness, free, and fit. And I will take sickness from the midst of thee. Exodus 23 verse 25. And strengthen thee out of Zion. Psalm 20 verse 2. Covenant people are not weaklings. Abraham went to battle at Obed. Over 80 years of age, Jacob traveled on horseback to Egypt at the age of 130. Listen to Caleb. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. As is said these 40 and 5 years, even since the Lord spoke this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day 40 score and 5 years old. And yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then. Even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Joshua 14 verse 10 to 11. Covenant people are energetic people. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeared before God. Psalm 84 verse 7. The giving covenant brings you into encounters with unique strength all the days of your life. When you're in the giving covenant, sickness is not permitted to torment you. The doctor's report notwithstanding, the Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou will make all his bed in his sickness. Psalm 41 verse 3. When God spreads your bed, sickness will disappear appear from there. That means God will tell you, get up. I want to make your bed. Let me see the sickness that will come and lie on it. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. And it may bring forth more fruits. John 15 verse 2. How do you bear fruits? By sowing seeds. When you are a seed sowing Christian, God prunes you and takes off the parasites that won't let you be healthy. He applies insecticides to destroy the parasites that won't let you bear fruit to full capacity and makes you fit. The covenant of prosperity makes fit. Sorrow free. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and he added no sorrow with it. Proverbs 10 verse 22. Sorrow free blessings 
have only one source god it's not any bank not america not europe not struggling and sweating no all the sorrows in your life must end this are curse free noah's acceptable sacrifice in genesis 8 verse 20 to 22 caused god to lift the curse he had earlier placed upon the ground when adam sinned and noah built on an altar unto the lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar and the lord smelled a sweet savour and the lord said in his heart i will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth neither will i again smite any more everything living as i have done genesis 8 verse 20 to 21 something moved god to lift the curse it was noah's sacrifice in response to any sacrifice you offer to god every curse upon your life is lifted forever when you offer a good order offering to god he breaks every curse upon your life no matter who might have placed the curse it returns to him or her how shall i curse whom god has not cursed or how shall i defy whom the lord has not defiled numbers 23 verse 8 no demonic cult anywhere can reverse a blessing from god when god has blessed he has blessed defense then satan answered the lord and said does joe fear god for not has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he had on every side thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land job 1 verse 9 to 10 giving creates a hedge around you the giving life of job provoked a hedge to be built around him and his house and all that he had on every side when you enter the giving covenant you enter into the stronghold of life god builds a hedge of fire around you your house and all that you have money can't buy this that's why it is called the true riches of god when you enter into the covenant of giving and receiving you don't only receive money all your needs are also covered by it yeah the almighty shall be thy defense job 22 verse 25 when god becomes your defense no armed robber can break through to attack you they call him jehovah the man of war he doesn't shoot arrows to win in battles he slays his enemy with the breath of his nostrils that's what you enjoy in the giving covenant it takes you to a point in your life where anybody that touches you touches him and god will arise and fight your battles for you god becomes your defense so that if they break through the wall they'll find god there ready for battle that's why he never sleeps nor slumbers he's always there can money buy that psalm 20 verse 1 to 3 says the lord hear thee in the day of trouble the name of the god of jacob defend thee send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of zion remember all thy offerings and accept thy bond sacrifice when you're in this covenant you are on god's hotline thou shalt also decree a sin and it shall be established job 22 verse 28 the covenant of giving puts you on god's hotline in the times of trouble in other words it gives you a prayer advantage with god when satan came to take one of our children i looked at her and prayed a less than two minutes prayer and every devil in hell would no longer come near thou shalt make thy prayer unto him and he shall hear thee and 
and thou shalt pay thy vows. Job 22 verse 27 and Psalm 20 verse 2 says, Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Finances is not the only area where you need help. Long life and pleasures. The number of thy days I will fulfill. Exodus 23 verse 26. God is committed to your longevity. One million which is can't take your life if you're in the giving covenant. At the age of 130, Jacob still rode on horseback to Egypt. Friend, there's a rejuvenating power in the covenant that makes you younger by the day. When you give, you overcome troubles and you have longevity. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Genesis 24 verse 1. And Job 36 verse 11 says, If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. I have never had a sleepless night over this ministry. That's pleasure. I have never had a problem that required discussion with anyone or at a board meeting. That's pleasure. You won't know problem any longer from today. Problem is not your heritage. You're a child of promise, not a problem child. It is well with you. Say to the righteous that it shall be well with him. Isaiah 3 verse 10. When you're in the covenant of giving, it becomes well with you. Tracing the giving ordinance from chapter 1 of the book of Malachi to chapter 3 verse 18. Where God said, Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked. We see that giving is righteousness. Those who are not doing it are not righteous, but the ones doing it are the righteous. For such, God said, it shall be well with him. When you are in the giving covenant, God makes it well with you. He takes you out of the realm of begging and stealing because you have a God that is more than enough on your side. Giving is serving God. He has promised in Exodus 20. 23 verse 25 that when you serve him he will bless your bread and your water he will take sickness away from you and much more all these guarantee your total well-being no barrenness they shall nothing cast their young nor be barren in thy land exodus 23 verse 26 you are not permitted to be barren when you are in the covenant of prosperity no you don't need Need prayers for that. You just need a violent stand for it. When you're in the giving covenant, also, you are not permitted to suffer miscarriages or to bury your children. Paul was saying to the Philistine church, No church communicated to me concerning giving and receiving but you. Therefore, my God shall supply all your need. Is finance your only need? No, all your needs. Your need for help, your need for mental soundness, your need for understanding, your need for strength, for peace at home, peace at work, peace on the road, all your needs. That's the mystery behind the covenant of prosperity. It brings you into the realm of all your needs being supplied. Friend, the covenant of prosperity guarantees your all-round well-being. So you must enter into it today. Now, chapter 27. Make a choice for change. But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 
2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. The essence of God's word is to effect changes. Just a word from God can change the entire course of your world. Change is a choice. It is your reaction against the present that creates our future. Judas heard the word just as much as all the other disciples did, but it did not produce a change in him because he did not choose to change. Having heard all that he said in this book, anyone who ends it all with, it's just lucky. I have been working all my life. I mean, I don't know exactly what they're talking about. It's resistance to change. Therefore, he remains in chains. When you don't respond, positively to the word of God you remain in captivity whereas the word is meant to set you free John 8 verse 32 says and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free Judas heard the most direct message in the world from the word himself but he didn't give room for a change he stayed on in chains until he arrived in hell that won't be your case in Jesus name change is our choice what information does is to provide opportunity for a change but your response to the information is what determines your choice for either change or change for instance olympics star james owens outstanding feats in athletics was as a result of the success keys his coach gave him while in school he was probably not the only one that heard the information information that came from the coach on the four things needed for one to be an athletic star determination dedication discipline and attitude but it was the only one perhaps that responded to them at the end of the day he became a world record breaker a legend in athletics whose long job record will not be broken 22 years later all because he chose to change 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 is our choice it is never forced on anyone it is a choice that you have to personally make when God called me into ministry, I saw what it was like to be in ministry then, that everybody had to lean on somebody to walk the work of God. But I chose to come in and establish another way of doing it. My choice is speaking today. Change is a choice. I would like you to determine for a quality choice because if at the end of all you've read from this book and you you do not make any quality decision then your frustrations will continue you make your choice and your choice makes you on 4th october 1981 i made my choice against borrowing i said if it meant wearing a pair of shoes for four years we will never borrow i have never borrowed since then if it means not having food to eat for days we will never be I have never begged. If you enjoy borrowing, that means you really need to work hard on yourself, particularly borrowing to eat. That means your stomach has become a god to be worshipped. I made my choice for prosperity. I made my choice for health. I cannot be sick. Jesus said, My father walked hitherto and I work. That's why I'm tireless. You make your choice for such things. There's nothing called luck. In Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, God said, I lay before thee life and death, good and evil. Choose life. What becomes of you tomorrow is your choice today. We're all hearing the same things. But because we're not making the same choices, we get different results. Your choice makes you. Every change is a choice. And every choice effects a change. I choose not to be like Judas Iscariot, who had every opportunity but banged it. I'm going to stay on and enjoy the choices of my life 
I as those choice continue to make me. Prosperity is taught. Everywhere it is taught, it is anchored on the word because the word of God is the gateway to the wealth of life. You can't be tired of the word because when you are tired of the word of God, you're tired of the wealth of life. You have encountered the word of God on kingdom prosperity now. Make a choice for change. Prosperity is a state of well-being. That's not just financial well-being, but a state of general well-being. A state of rest roundabout. Please enter into it. We now have the best opportunity. Having been taught the rudiments and ordinances of divine prosperity, you know now just swim in them by a deliberately programming yourself into it. The time to favor you has finally come. Remember what I said in the course of the teachings. Your destiny is not in the hand of any man. It's not in your uncle's hand. It's not in the hand of that company where you are employed. Neither is it in your profession or your career. Your destiny destiny is in God and wrapped up in the covenant. You can stand strong in the covenant and see your destiny established for you. Say with me, this is my time for prosperity. I can understand the ways and plans of God now. I'm excited. Every ungodly dealings that might have tied your business down, I command your deliverance through a genuine repentance right now in the name of Jesus. You shall not be trapped by any force of the devil anymore. This time, God will visit you. From this day, no one will ever identify you with poverty anymore. I decree the flow of life that is in the vine throughout your lifetime in the name of Jesus. Whatever is not lacking in the vine will no longer be lacking in your life. Whatever is obtainable in the vine will forever be obtainable in your life. Your season of flourishing has come. God has blessed you. No devil can curse you. Enter into your prosperity now. You will not be stagnated anymore in your life forever. Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you your own inheritance among them which are sanctified in Jesus' precious name. Amen.